court refusing to apply conditions, it is that he breached them. In relation to her wider point, of course, every single one of these cases is a tragedy. She will know, because we've worked on a cross-party basis in the past, how much time and attention we dedicate to this at the Home Office. But I will sim simply say this. We now have domestic abuse training that has been rolled out to over 80 per cent of forces. The Home Secretary and I are working very, very closely with the nine outstanding ones. They are on a timetable for delivery. I want to reassure her of that. And we now, this month, have specialist trained uh, rape uh, specialists in every single police force in England and Wales. Tim Law. Number three, sir. Minister. Thank you. Uh, look, I thank my right honourable friend enormously for raising this question. Let me be quite clear that the hostile activity we have seen from Chinese authorities and state affiliated groups poses a serious threat to the security and well being of the British people and to our partners and allies across the world. The Deputy Prime Minister came to this chamber last month to speak about the pattern of malign activity, including the targeting of our parliamentarians and two malicious cyber campaigns by, cy by Chinese state affiliated actors. We must never be afraid to stand up for ourselves and to call out this kind of activity that has targeted both him and me. Jim uh, Mr Speaker, can I add my personal condolences for your father's losses as, as well? Uh, can I say to my um, right honourable friend that, of course, we had the scandal about the hacking of MPs' uh, email accounts uh, back in March. We subsequently learned that the FBI had informed our government about this instance two years ago, as well as other foreign governments who had legislators uh, who were also affected. Why has it taken two years for us to be told about a serious security uh, breach? And will he now, with his colleagues in Cabinet, make sure that China is absolutely treated as and labelled as a threat and not just an epoch-defining systemic challenge, and everything is done urgently to put China in the enhanced tier of the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme. Yeah, yeah. Minister. My right honourable friend, who has given this House and our country uh, exceptional service over many years and, and will sadly be standing down in the next election, has made, again, some very, very strong uh, points. The first of which is that he knows the language that I use and he has heard the words that I have said. The reality is that we face threats from around the world and many of them, sadly, are emerging out of Beijing today. We know this, we have seen it, and many of us in this House feel it. So this is not something that we are shying away from. The reality, however, is that there are many different ways of answering it. Now, he has raised a very important aspect on FERS, and that is something that, of course, is being looked at. But he will have heard the words of the Deputy Prime Minister in this chamber only a few weeks ago, and how clearly he made himself heard. Yeah. Chris Bryant. I'm sorry, sorry, but I'm not convinced by the government's attitude on this. When the Deputy Prime Minister came to see us a few weeks ago, he didn't say anything new. He announced things about events that had happened two years ago. But the member himself knows of attempts by the Chinese government to undermine the work of the Foreign Affairs Committee of this House. Um, why, why are we only ever told about things that happened years ago? If we're surely to take these issues seriously, we have to have an up-to-date and present account of the, uh, the activities of the Chinese state. Minister. The right honourable member will know very well that when there is a reason to act quickly and to draw it to the attention of the House, we do, as is the case of Christine Lee, which you will remember involved the payment of money to a certain uh, member of this House. And the reason why we took that action was because, of course, we needed to expose it fast. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner said last year that our policing and security services were technologically vulnerable because of their use of Chinese-made equipment, including CCTV drones and body cameras. So, can the Minister say whether the digital asbestos of Chinese-made technology is still used in our policing and security infrastructure? Yes or no? Minister. My honourable friend will know very well that uh, the work of Mr Fraser last, when, before he retired last year or ended his mandate last year has been absolutely fantastically important to many of us in making sure, and I approve the term digital asbestos, uh, is got out of our institutions. This is something that is ongoing, so it has got out of the most secure sites already, but there are other areas where there is work to do, because, of course, 
There were an awful lot of sites, I'm afraid, which bought technology which would now be problematic. Of course, it's not just static sites. There is, of course, the potential that some uh, electric vehicles could be easily turned into mobile intelligence gathering platforms by hostile states. And so it's not simply about looking at the past, but also at the future. Question for sir. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, in 2023 we delivered a strong removal performance with overall returns back to pre-COVID levels. In total, 26,000 were returned, an increase of 74 per cent at an average of 500 removed every week last year. I'm grateful to the Minister's response. Uh, can he uh, update uh, the House on how his department is prioritising the return of foreign national offenders to their home countries uh, to keep the streets and communities of the United Kingdom safe. Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, may I firstly pay tribute to my honourable friend and the work that goes on in his constituency, uh, because as he knows, I visited Gatwick recently and saw for myself uh, the good work of the, the Border Force work team were doing there, and he'll be pleased to know that removals of foreign national offenders were up last year by 27 per cent and that we are committed to the removal of foreign criminals and those with no right to be in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On that point, I sadly see many asylum seekers in Newport who are stuck in limbo due to this Government's incompetence. However, can I draw the Minister's attention to the case of a man in Newport who lied about his name and country of origin, is a convicted sex offender who has breached the terms of his licence and the courts want him returned home. He wants to return home and will even pay for his flight, but for some unfathomable reason. Um, the Home Office seem incapable of allowing or authorising or allowing this, and it's been three years. Why? Well, in, in, the removals were increased last year. It's interesting to note that those on the, of the party opposite have campaigned to ensure that they are preventing the deportation of foreign criminals, including the leader of the Labour Party. Those on this side of the House are determined to see foreign criminals removed, and there was an increase in removal of 74 per cent last year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Under successive Conservative governments since 2010, returns of failed asylum seekers have collapsed by 44% yeah. and returns of foreign national offenders have fallen by almost 30% over the same period. And for all the government's tough talk, only 2% of those arriving on small boats since 2018 have been returned anywhere, yet ministers are still resisting Labour's plan for a new returns and enforcement unit to ensure the swift removal of those with no right to be here. Meanwhile, more people crossed the Channel in small boats over the weekend than will be covered in the entire first year of the failing Rwanda scheme. So will the minister stop the headline-chasing gimmicks and instead commit to setting out what his plan is for the 99% of people who are currently stuck in the asylum system who will never be sent to Rwanda. Well, well, Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is that nearly 18,000 foreign national offenders were returned between January 2019 and December 2023. The fact of the matter is members of the party opposite, including the leader of the Labour Party, have campaigned to prevent the deportation of foreign criminals, while those on this side of the House welcome an increase of 74 per cent, an average of 500 people being removed every single week. Andrew Weston. Question five, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm very happy to uh, remind the House that we now have record, uh, we reached record numbers of police officers last year, in excess of 149,000, over 3,000 more than the previous peak under the last Labour government. And in terms of local policing, we achieved 67,785 as of March last year. I think the Minister might want to group them. Mr Speaker, you're, I always forget that. You're quite right. 8, 15, 16 and 18, with your permission. Okay. Andrew West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Under this Government, 10,000 neighbourhood police officers have disappeared since 2015 and are yet to be replaced on the front line. Given this Government's pro proclivity for lifting Labour's policies, could I gently encourage the Minister to adopt Labour's plan to recruit 13,000 new neighbourhood police officers, allowing for a named 
contactable officer in every ward in the country. Yeah. Well, the honourable member is using figures uh, which go up to 2019. Uh, the reason he's using figures, of course, that are five years out of date, is the numbers have gone up since then. And if you take neighbourhood policing as a whole, it's gone up from 61,083 in 2015. That's the year he mentioned. It's gone up 61,000 up to 67,000. 785. That's an increase of 6,000, and I'm surprised he's not joining me in welcoming it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Antisocial behaviour has been a big problem in Holyhead. Almost £700,000 of UK government Safer Streets funding has been used for CCTV, improved lighting, self-defence training for local women and girls, delivering crime prevention packs and outreach work. Would the Minister join me in thanking Chief Inspector Robert Rands, PC Lisa Thomas and many others who work so hard to improve the lives of people who live and work in Holyhead? Well, I would certainly like to join her in thanking those officers and countless thousands of others around the country who do such good work. But on ASB, in addition to the Safer Streets money the Honourable Friend mentioned, we are, uh, from the beginning of this month, funding an extra £66 million pounds, uh, to do antisocial behaviour hotspot patrolling. Every single one of England and Wales's police forces will get that, and that will make an enormous difference to combating the scourge of ASB. Paul Howell. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that getting extra officers out in our communities should be the top of the list for any PCC? Unfortunately, in Durham, we see the Labour PCC more interested in increasing a back office staff and overseeing a declining standard with the latest Peel report showing two, hour, two areas requiring improvement for the first time ever in Durham. Would he agree with me that the sooner we get an ex-beat cop like the Conservative candidate Rob Potts in place, the sooner Durham will return to being an outstanding police force? Well, I completely agree with my honourable friend. Uh, spending money on things like flower beds and diversity staff instead of frontline police officers is the wrong priority. And I know that former frontline officers like Rob Potts running for PCC in Durham will do a good job of getting priorities straight. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kosama Akhtar, who is from Oldham, was murdered by her estranged husband on a busy Bradford street in the middle of the day in front of their baby son. Research has repeatedly shown that regular foot patrols, especially in crime hotspots, leads to reduced offending and increased public confidence, particularly if combined with community-based prevention. Greater Manchester Police and West Yorkshire Police want to learn lessons from this tragic murder. What lessons has the Home Secretary learned about reducing neighbourhood policing and the prevalence of appalling crimes like this? Well, this is obviously a, a tragic case, and we'll obviously study any findings by the IOPC very, very carefully uh, indeed. She mentioned hotspot patrolling, and I mentioned in my last answer that the government is providing £66 million this financial year on top of the regular police funding settlement to fund hotspot patrolling, which I think may help in situations like these. Um, but just to repeat the point I made previously uh, about the local policing, local policing numbers since 2015 have gone up by about 6,500, and, and, and selectively quoting figures that are five years old does nothing to help public debate. James Boris. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Hales Owen Police Station is under threat of closure from decisions taken by the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner for the West Midlands. And Tom Byrne, the Conservative candidate for PCC, has says that he will stop that closure programme. So would the Minister agree with me and Tom Byrne that keeping Hales Owen Police Station open is critical for community confidence and for the effectiveness of neighbourhood policing? Minister. Yes, I would agree very strongly. Uh, the Labour PCC's police station closure plans in the West Midlands are shocking. I note that West Midlands Police this year are getting an extra £50 million. That is a 6.8% increase, well above the rate of inflation. And I think uh, Tom Byrne would do an excellent job making sure that maintains frontline services, which is exactly how that money should be spent. Mary Glendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Northumbria Force has lost 1,100 
officers and £148 million from its budget since 2010, and even after the uplift, Northumbria remains 427 officers short when com compared to 2010 levels. Will the Minister support the call by Northumbria's PCC, Kim McGuinness, for further investigation into police resources, as clearly not all areas of the country have benefited equally from the uplift programme? Minister. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to tell the House that the Northumbria Force, uh, this financial year, the year that started just a couple of weeks ago, their funding is going up by £28 uh, million. Pounds. That is a 7.6% increase, uh, over double the rate of inflation. So the resources are there. Using those resources wisely is a matter for police and crime commissioners. And, Mr Speaker, it tends to be Conservative police and crime commissioners who spend those resources most wisely. Ruth Cabley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, sorry, question seven, Mr. Speaker. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, violence and abuse towards shop workers is not and will never be acceptable. Last October, the police published a retail crime action plan. The government has embraced that and enhanced it. Last week, we launched the Fighting Retail Crime uh, Action. Amongst other measures, it includes a commitment to create a new offence of assaulting a retail worker, something the sector has been calling for. Ruth Cadbury. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, I met a shopkeeper in Hounslow who has been repeatedly targeted by shoplifters. The family who own the the, 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 the family who own the shop can't afford security guards or to lose a large amount of stock, unlike the big chains. It's welcome the government has finally backed Labour's 10-year campaign, along with Usdor and other campaigners, to introduce a standalone offence of assault against a shop worker. But will the minister go further? and scrap the unfair £200 limit, which leaves offenders getting away with impunity. Uh, Mr Speaker, it is still a criminal offence, irrespective of the uh, financial value of what uh, is, uh, is taken. Uh, we have made it clear of our commitment to ensure that shopkeepers uh, are protected and that the retail environment is safe. That is why we have put funding in place, which has put more police officers on the streets. That's why, as my right honourable friend has just mentioned, uh, neighbourhood policing numbers are up. That's why we have committed to pursue uh, that we have sorry committed the police to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. And that is why I'm very proud that we have put in place a specific criminal offence for assault against a retail worker. For our high streets to thrive, people need to perceive them as safe places to be. But there is real concern that the Mayor of London is failing to get the Met to take retail crime seriously enough. So does he agree that we need a new Mayor for London, Susan Hall, to ensure we have more effective policing in our high streets? Uh, quite, quite frankly, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Mayor of London has been a massive disappointment when it has come to the policing uh, of, uh, of London. Uh, it is the only police force in the country which is seeing its police numbers uh, reducing. It has failed to meet its recruitment uh, targets, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, Londoners deserve better. As the uh, chair of the All Party Group on Retail Crime, can I welcome the announcements, as I'm sure shop workers will everywhere? When will we be operationalised, and what is the monitoring process so that we can all judge it is not just words, but action? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, Honourable Gentleman makes an important point. We are putting it through as amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill. Uh, the quicker that that makes its passage through the House, the quicker we can put these specific changes in place. But we are not waiting for that. We have had conversations with police forces to make sure that there is visible policing on our high streets, that they respond to every reasonable uh, line of inquiry so that they send the signal to the retailers and also to potential criminals that we take this incredibly seriously and that they will respond to this important crime type. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I realise the Home Secretary may be sick of hearing from me about assaults on retail workers, but I welcome the huge uh, and comprehensive package announced last week and well, by last week to support these people. Um, and, I, and I would like to thank well, will my right honourable friend implement these as quickly as possible so as to benefit retail workers across Stockton South and the rest of the country? 
Yeah. Home Secretary. Mr Speaker, can I pay tribute to my honourable friend who has campaigned vigorously on this yeah, yeah, yeah. and has met with me on a number of occasions to go through the specifics of these uh, proposals, working closely with my right honourable friend, uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Justice, to make sure that both the policing response and, of course, the criminal uh, response uh, send a very clear deterrent message to those people who might be tempted to assault retail workers. It is not acceptable, and we will take action. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in January, the government voted down our last, our latest attempt to introduce a standalone offence tackling violence against retail workers. This continued a pattern of years of failing to address this issue while such violence reached epidemic proportions. And last week, surprise, surprise, they U-turned on this, and and, an offence is now to follow. When are the government going to follow this up by stealing uh, the other ideas they keep denying, a restoration of neighbourhood policing, and actually not the response officers they have been talking about, proper neighbourhood policing, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is down between 2015 and 2023, yeah. and getting rid of the £200 limit? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, those people in the House should recognise that uh, just because a clause might have a similar sounding name does not mean it is the same. The simple truth of the matter, the simple truth of the matter is the clause that the opposition uh, put forward was deficient in many ways. The clause that we have put forward into the Criminal Justice Bill will address the issue. And when it comes to local poli- when it comes to local policing, she should recognise that there has been a six thousand uplift in local policing. Question number nine, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last year we launched the Antisocial Behaviour Action Plan, backed by £160 million worth of funding. Over 100,000 hours of police and other uniform patrols undertaken, targeting ASB hotspots, extended to every single uh, police force in England and Wales. We banned nitrous oxide, increased the fines for fly tipping, littering and graffiti, and we are strengthening powers to tackle, to tackle antisocial behaviour through the Criminal Justice Bill making its way through the House. Justin Mather. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the aspects of antisocial behaviour that really uh, annoys my constituents is persistent cannabis smoking from people inside their own homes, particularly in blocks of flats, but not exclusively. However, when I raise this with the police, they tell me that they're not going to go into people's homes and deal with it. I don't think that's good enough, does the Home Secretary? Mr Mr. Speaker, the police... And I've had this conversation with police uh, leaders from around the country. The police should take action where there is a credible uh, uh, um, uh, reporting of criminal uh, behaviour. Uh, and, uh, and that is a conversation we will continue to have with police. People need to be safe, but also feel safe in their communities and in their homes. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you, sir. Uh, Protesters who recently created an obnoxious stunt outside the home of the Leader of the Opposition belong in jail, as do the trust fund vandals who caused tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage outside the Ministry of Defence last week. The truth is that frontline politicians of any political hue and our military personnel are prepared to put themselves forward to serve and protect this country, a concept the vandals, of course, would know nothing about. So when it comes to this type of antisocial behaviour, will my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, look at increasing visibility at high-profile locations like those I've discussed? Home Secretary. Uh, my right honourable friend raises uh, a couple of points there. Firstly, uh, it is completely unacceptable to try and intimidate parliamentarians of whatever political hue, and I and I know that um, that, that I. Will stand sh- I will stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with parliamentarians of whichever political party in defending parliamentarians' right to do and say what they believe to be in the best interests of their countries and their communities without fear of intimidation. That is an absolute red line, and it will be enforced. These, um, uh, these petulant 
These petulant acts of vandalism in the name of protests are unacceptable. When criminal damage occurs, that will be pursued. And indeed, in the Criminal Justice Bill, we're making specific actions to take away this veneer of defence that somehow it is justified criminal behaviour in, in, uh, uh, because people aren't getting their way at the ballot box. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Too many residents in Nottingham South tell me that antisocial behaviour is making their lives a misery. They never see uh, a Bobby walk in the streets, and under the law-breaking Tory Police and Crime Commissioner, yeah, yeah. Nottinghamshire Police has been placed in special measures, with HMIC saying yeah, right. that the force is letting victims down. My constituents tell me they will be voting for Labour's Gary Godden on the 2nd of May to rebuild neighbourhood policing and adopt a zero-tolerance approach to antisocial behaviour. They are right, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they would be very wrong if they voted Labour, expecting that would increase uh, a policing presence. Across, uh, the, across the country, we have seen over and over again that the best performing police areas are most typically in control of Conservative police and crime. Uh, commissioners. Uh, I know the situation uh, in Nottinghamshire very well. I've spoken uh, directly uh, with the Police and Crime uh, Commissioner, who has a clear plan of action to ensure that she continues to put police officers uh, on the front line. Something in Labour run regions uh, in the area, police forces in the area, have been sadly lacking. Jonathan Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Due to an increase in antisocial behaviour in the town of Tunstall, I was proud to work with local residents, over 500 of them, in order to gain the support for new CCTV, new alley gates, and better street lighting through the Safer Streets funding. However, the Labour leader of Stoke on Trent City Council told me there would be no money for Tunstall when I met with her, and to make matters worse, has dumped some undesirables in the Sneed Arms Hotel in the town centre has led to further criminal activity that's blighting high street stores up and down our community. Doesn't the Home Secretary agree with me that, thank God, Ben Adams, Staffordshire's Police Fire Crime Commissioner, was listening, and he did indeed make sure that we got that safer street funding, and our community is going to make, uh, feel safer, and people should vote for Ben on the 2nd of May. Yeah. Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can hardly, I can hardly put it uh, better myself. I recently visited uh, the, wonderful, uh, the wonderful town of Stoke, seeing the passion of the people, and this is a classic example of where local leadership in the hands of the Labour Party have failed people and local leadership in the hands of Conservatives have actually defended local people. Patrick Brady. Mr Speaker, number 10. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're all concerned about the plight of those living in Gaza. Currently, we're not considering establishing a separate route for Palestinians. In any humanitarian situation, the UK must consider its resettlement approach in the round rather than on a crisis by crisis basis. Patrick Reddy. Mr. Speaker, I mean, it's not surprising that the Upper Tribunal found the decision uh, to require biometric data for people from Gaza uh, to be irrational and unreasonable, because I think most of us find that to apply to most decisions made by the Home Office. Is it not also irrational and unreasonable for the United Kingdom to offer humanitarian visas for people caught up in the conflict in Ukraine, in Syria and in Afghanistan, but to not offer humanitarian visas for people fleeing the conflict in Gaza? Minister. Well, I'm not going to give a running commentary on what is ongoing litigation, but what I can say, of course, is that we are supporting individuals, British um, nationals with dependents in Gaza, to get those individuals out of um, Gaza safely, working in collaboration with Foreign Office colleagues. There are also marked differences at play here. Of course, um, the right of return is fundamental as part of um, efforts towards a two-state solution, as well as other factors that are at play in relation to the Ukrainian response. For example, the dynamic is very different, and that affects directly the relationship we have with the Ukrainian government, particularly about being able to carry out checks on individuals. Some peace post person, yeah, yeah. Gaza Families United's petition for a Palestinian family visa scheme has garnered now 100,000 yeah, yeah. signatures, and I hope will soon be debated in Parliament. Because Gazans are stuck in a cruel and irrational catch-22 situation. They can't cross the border to Egypt because they don't have a visa, because they can't get biometrics registered, but they can't get biometrics registered because they can't get to a visa application centre in Egypt. The government has the power to waive the requirement for these bi biometrics to be registered. It is in his hands to do so. Why won't he? She will appreciate that the security of the system is of 
imperative importance. We must act in accordance with those requirements. We do put that front and centre. I'm not going to comment on what is ongoing litigation, but what I can say is that we will continue to work with Foreign Office colleagues in the way that we've described. The elements of the peace process are at play in relation to these issues as well, but we will keep our response to this crisis under review as matters develop. Sir Desmond Swade. Eleven, sir. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I'd like to group questions 11 and 12. The Home Office has been clear that use of hotels is a temporary and short-term measure to ensure we meet our statutory obligation to accommodate destitute asylum seekers. We have made significant progress in closing over 100 asylum hotels up till the end of March. Our actions mean there are now over 20,000 fewer asylum seekers in hotels today compared to six months ago. So Desmond Swift. Does his ambition extend to closing them all? Minister. Well, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right that the government's ambition is to close these hotels. We have closed 100 at the end of March. We are working towards closing 150 by May. Of course, the objective is to alter the way in which people are accommodated to those more cost-effective and appropriate approaches, but fundamentally to also reduce the flow of people coming to this country illegally, which is the very best way of alleviating those pressures. Sir David Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I welcome all the efforts my honourable friend is making to deal with and to speed up the asylum process. However, can he outline what measures he is considering when deciding which hotels to close in each tranche going forward? My um, right honourable friend will recognise that value for money is obviously a very um, critical consideration that informs hotel closure decisions, but also operational deliverability, the notice periods on contracts, but also recognising the needs in particular locations and some of the challenges that these sites present. We've got a plan, we are closing hotels, and we're going to continue to deliver on precisely what we promised. David Perkins. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The Sunpiper Hotel in Chesterfield has for almost two years now been being used uh, as a uh, hotel in, in this uh, way. Uh, when I've spoken to Derbyshire Refugee Support Group, they tell me not a single one of the people who stayed there has been, uh, has been asked to uh, go back to their country, and in fact the vast majority of them have been approved, uh, which undermines the government's own sense that actually all of these uh, asylum seekers aren't entitled to be here. Actually, the government are improving the vast majority of them. So what a waste of money uh, it is. Uh, why does the government continue to fail in this way? And for the minister to come there and now sort of celebrate the extraordinary usage just because it's diminishing slightly is hopeless. When will we get the sandpiper back in public use? Well, I thought it was um, interesting that a Labour insider said to the Times newspaper last week in commentary, quote, we need a viable answer to what we do differently other than just smash the gangs. We can't currently say how we're going to tackle the demand side of the issue. They're absolutely right. I suspect we'll be waiting a very long time for the answer that goes right to the heart of the point that he raises. The honourable gentleman is saying we ought to be closing hotels, but it's only this government that has a credible plan to do just that. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I also, on behalf of myself and my party, pass on our, our, our condolences to you uh, on the death of your father? We, we know you loved your father, and we know your father loved you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I would like to ask the Minister a question, if I can. When it comes to uh, 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 the reducing the number of asylum seekers, one of the options that I would suggest to the Minister is one that we could do, certainly in Strangford, we could do it anyway, that, that those people that are in hotels. We have companies in my constituency who wish to employ them. We have com companies who wish to give them accommodation at the same time. So if you want to help the asylum seekers in the hotels in my constituency and in my adjoining constituency, then let, me get the, let them get the jobs and let them get the accommodation. Well, I'm always very willing to engage with the um, honourable gentleman. He will appreciate the difficulty that we have in respect of that approach is the pull factor that that would present, encouraging people to potentially make dangerous journeys via small boats to get to the UK. We do not want to do anything that plays into the business model of the evil criminal gangs responsible for that miserable trade. What we want to do is put them out of business. But on the wider accommodation point, I'm very happy to engage with him. Mr. Simon Clark. Mr. Speaker. 
In 2016, Middlesbrough had the highest ratio of asylum seekers per head of population of anywhere in England. And I welcome the closure of hotels, but I worry about reports in today's Daily Mail that the Home Office is now buying up large amounts of property in some of the poorer areas of England, which risks uh, taking us back to the situation we saw uh, in 2016. Will the Minister reassure me that this isn't the case, because my constituents are clear that this place is an unacceptable strain on the community and indeed an unhappy strain on community cohesion? Minister. My um, right honourable friend is a strong supporter of the work that the government is doing to get a better grip on the flow of people coming across to our country who inevitably need accommodating whilst they are here. We have a mixture of accommodation to meet those needs. Getting the numbers down is critical to be able to reduce that dependence. What I am able to say, however, is that we are not actively pursuing procurement in the three local authorities cited in the article that he references, and that includes Middlesbrough. Mike Ainsworth. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and sincere condolences. Um, the government promised some considerable time ago that a hotel used in my constituency would no longer be used in my constituency to house those seeking asylum. It's not the case. It's almost become de facto permanent. Could the Minister speak to me, not necessarily on the floor of the House, but separately, and give me assurance that there will be a, a managed closure of that facility? Minister. What I can't do on the floor of the House is to make commitments about specific hotels, but I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss this. What he could do to help me with this particular challenge is to get behind the work that the government is doing to help reduce the flow of people coming to the UK that fundamentally and crucially would help us to be able to close hotels such as the one in his constituency. We now come to topicals. Sir John Whittingdale. Number one, sir. Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have uh, increased the volume of asylum processing uh, cases. We have successfully met a ministerial commitment to close over 50 asylum-seeking hotels uh, in, by January 2024, and we have closed over 100 by the end of March. Last year, I brought forward measures to make legal migration fairer and radically reduce uh, the numbers. 300,000 people who came to the UK last year would not be now eligible to do so. Anyone who wants to bring a family from abroad must be able to support them uh, comfortably uh, financially. And in the budget, we, uh, the government put forward £75 million to roll out violence reduction units and hotspot policing across the UK, sorry, across England and Wales and £230 million for technology that will save the police time and money and make sure that police officers are on the front line doing the job they were recruited to do. Sir John. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I have my own condolences? Um, my wrong friend will be aware that police numbers in Essex are now at record levels and that overall crime is down. Yeah, yeah. However, there has been a rise in vehicle theft. Will my right of friend therefore welcome the efforts of our excellent police fire and crime commissioner Roger Hurst in establishing a stolen vehicles intelligence unit which has so far recovered £14 million worth of vehicles and will he look at what further support can be given to him to tackle this uh, crime? Uh, my right of friend is, um, is right to highlight the fantastic work of uh, Roger Hurst and the uh, stolen vehicle uh, intelligence uh, unit. There have been a number of large-scale uh, seizures of vehicles being uh, attempted to be uh, exported. Uh, this government has reduced vehicle-related crime by 39 per cent since 2010. Uh, through the Criminal Justice Bill, we seek to go further. But innovative approaches, like the one put forward by Roger Hurst, is exactly what we want to see more of. And that is why I am very proud to campaign alongside him uh, because he has done fantastic work protecting the people of Essex. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper. Mr Speaker, I remember the, fa the kindness your father showed me in our long discussions on rugby league and add my condolences to. And 35 years ago to the hour was the Hillsborough tragedy. And we remember the 97 who were lost and support the family's campaign for a Hillsborough law. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we strongly condemn the attack by Isra Iran on Israel this weekend and we must do everything we can to prevent further escalation in the Middle East. But there are also domestic security issues over Iran. The Iran international journalist Puria Zarati was attacked on the streets of London a few weeks ago. 
following repeated Iran-related security threats on British soil, including threats to kidnap and to kill. Does the Home Secretary believe it is now time to prescribe the IRGC in the UK? Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable uh, Lady will know that we keep our uh, response to Iran consistently under review, and of course we have done so in the light of the attacks uh, in Wimbledon. Um, but she will also know that we do not uh, speculate about future designations or uh, sanctions, but she will also know the IRGC is sanctioned it's in, in its entirety. A number of members of the IRGC are sanctioned as individuals. As she knows, we will keep this constantly under review. Beck Cooper. The Home Secretary will know we have raised this uh, many times. and I understand the complexity of the issue. The prescribing legislation was drawn up over 20 years ago to address then-terrorist threats like al-Qaeda rather than state-sponsored threats where there might be both domestic and international security objectives. But our bottom line must be keeping this country safe. and That is why Labour has proposed new security legislation to allow the government to put appropriately targeted targeted prescription-style restrictions on the operations of state-linked organisations like the IRGC. The Government previously resisted this, but will he look at this again in the light of recent events and work with us on any legislation needed to keep this country safe? Yeah, yeah. Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have the National uh, Security Act and we have a range of tools at our uh, disposal. Uh, our defence against state threats is a priority. It's one of the priorities of uh, the Department, and my right hon. Friend, uh, the Security Minister, uh, leads on the practical implementation of that. I can reassure her and the House that we constantly review the range of options at our disposal. We deploy those that are the most appropriate. The protection of the UK and the people living and working within it against state threats will always be a priority of this government. Philip Alderbell. Will my right honourable friend, the Minister for Crime and Policing, support the excellent initiative of a number of Conservative Police and Crime Commissioners to include filling in potholes as part of the Community Payback Initiative for convicted offenders? And will he apply pressure on the Ministry of Justice to get this up and running as soon as possible? <laughs> Well, I think my hon. Friend, the Member for Kettering, uh, has raised an excellent idea. It has my enthusiastic support, and I will most certainly do exactly as he asks straight away. Sir Odai. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you. Uh, the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration recently produced a report that stated 275 certificates of sponsorship were granted to a company that used forged documents purporting to be a real care home. Clearly, failures like this from the Home Office leave people at risk of exploitation and modern slavery. So what steps is the Minister taking to make the system more robust and to protect vulnerable people who come here to work in our care system? Minister. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for that question, and we um, responded within the eight-week deadline to that um, ICIBI report. We accepted the recommendations that were posed to us in it. We are working through those recommendations, but there was already work in train, particularly working in collaboration with the Care Quality Commission to have better accreditation practices around um, care providers when we're matching people to those visas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Outdated laws are allowing child sexual predators uh, and offenders to enter or leave our country whilst in possession of illegal material on their digital devices because the border force did not have the power to access them. Would my right honourable friend work with his colleagues in the Ministry of Justice to consider the merits of a new offence of wilful obstruction under which an individual could be prosecuted if they fail to unlock their devices so, if, so they can be properly searched? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her work in this area. The issues she raises are of direct importance to intelligence gathering and child protection. My officials have been working closely with Border Force to ensure that their powers keep pace with the digital age. When the next legislative opportunity arises, if not before, we will carefully consider Border Force powers to compel individuals to submit to searches of their devices if they are suspected of holding child sexual abuse material. Dobby Perkins. 
Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The murder of Gracie Spinks uh, in Chesterfield sent shockwaves through the town and the report into Derbyshire Police's, the Derbyshire Police's handling of that uh, was uh, a very salutary uh, and, and desperately unhappy situation. Uh, there is still far too much inconsistency into how stalking and violence uh, against women uh, is handled. So will the Home Secretary uh, back Labour's plan to bring in mandatory national standards uh, and mandatory training on violence against women so that we see consistency on stalking and policing right across the country? Uh, Mr Speaker, I can reassure the Honourable Gentleman and the House uh, that under my leadership the Home Office and policing across the UK will maintain its focus on preventing violence against women and girls. Uh, we do have a rollout of guidance and training for the policing of women and girls. I will take his uh, proposals, I will listen carefully to the proposals he's put forward because we want to make sure that women and girls in the country feel safe. champions fantastic animal welfare standards. Yeah. My constituents would like to see alternatives to animal testing wherever possible and would be keen to hear a vital update from the department. Yeah. Minister. Well, given the interest will be about to switch in this House to uh, a different matter, I'll be very brief and promise to write to her, but she should know that this Government has already doubled the spending on finding alternatives to annual testing and will continue to make sure that the inspection regime is as strict as possible to make sure that when animals need to be used, the conditions are as humane as possible. Mr Maddows. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Home Secretary tell us the level of auditing that will take place in relation to the hundreds of millions of pounds being spent to, sent to Rwanda? In particular, can he guarantee that no UK taxpayers' cash will either directly or indirectly be used to fund the M23 militia in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Uh, Mr Speaker, all our overseas expenditure, whether it is through official development assistance or whether it is uh, through contractual relationships that we have, like the ones with Rwanda, are always robustly pleased to ensure that they are spent exclusively on the issues that they are uh, designed to do. Um, uh, we have a very, very strong uh, and good working relationship with the Government of Rwanda, who are absolutely committed to be the exporter of solutions to global <laughs> problems rather than the exporter of problems. Andrew Rosenberg. Uh, Mr Speaker, sir, the, the people of Romford are angry. They are not getting the police cover from the Mayor of London that we pay for. We have seen a crime wave across Romford in Gidea Park, a stabbing in the town centre. We have had enough. Will the Minister please ensure that there is reform so that Essex towns like Romford actually get the service that Roger Hurst gives to the people of the historic county? Well, he is quite right to draw the contrast between the excellent work done by Roger Hurst in Essex with the appalling job being done by Sadiq Khan in London. Sadiq, Sadiq Khan is the only one of the 43 police and crime commissioners to have missed his recruitment targets and tragically tragically police officer numbers in london are falling by contrast to the rest of the country londoners will have a chance to cast their vote on may the 2nd and i hope they kick him out thank you mr speaker um, my constituent mysara is a british citizen and his parents live in gaza his parents successfully applied for visas to visit him in autumn last year but they were unable to travel after october the 7th and their visas expired I contacted the Home Office on my Sarah's behalf to ask if these visas could be extended and I was told they would have to make new applications. There are, however, of course, no functioning visa application centres in Gaza, so can the Minister explain what exactly my constituents' parents should do? Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am more than happy to look at the details of the case. Of course, he has to understand that just as uh, the circumstances on the ground changed dramatically after Hamas's brutal mass murder rampage on the 7th of October. Our posture and our security posture for that reason has got understandably to be enhanced. This is not me making any implications about his constituents' family, but he and the House will understand that we must be careful in everything we do when it comes to accepting uh, uh, people who are leaving Gaza in these circumstances. That completes some office questions. We now come to the statement. I now call the Prime Minister. Yeah.
Mr Speaker, before I start, I'd like to express my deepest sympathy, and I'm sure that of the whole House, on the death of your father. He, he was a true giant, not just of this House, but of the other place too. I also want to express my solidarity with our Australian friends after the horrific and senseless attacks in Sydney in recent days. Our thoughts are with all those affected. Mr Speaker, on Saturday evening, Iran sought to plunge the Middle East into a new crisis. They launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones over Iraq and Jordan and towards Israel. The scale of the attack and the fact that it was targeted directly at Israel are without precedent. It was a reckless and dangerous escalation. If it had succeeded, the fallout for regional security and the toll on Israeli citizens would have been catastrophic. But, Mr Speaker, it did not succeed. In support of Israel's own defensive action, the United Kingdom joined a US-led international effort, along with France and partners in the region, which intercepted almost all of the missiles, saving lives in Israel and its neighbours. We sent additional RAF typhoons to the region as part of our existing operations against Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm our forces destroyed a number of Iranian drones. We also provided important intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance support for our partners. Mr Speaker, our pilots put themselves in harm's way to protect the innocent and preserve peace and stability. I spoke to the RAF earlier today. They are the best of the best, and I know the whole House will join me in expressing our gratitude. Mr Speaker, with this attack, Iran has once again shown its true colours. They are intent on sowing chaos in their own backyard, on further destabilising the Middle East. Our aim is to support stability and security, because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Yesterday, I spoke to my fellow G7 leaders. We are united in our condemnation of this attack. We discussed further potential diplomatic measures, which we will be working together to coordinate in the coming days. I will also shortly be speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu to express our solidarity with Israel in the face of this attack and to discuss how we can prevent further escalation. All sides must show restraint. Mr Speaker, our action reflects our wider strategy in the Middle East, which I have set out in this House previously. I believe there are three vital steps to put the region onto a better path. First, we must uphold regional security against hostile actors, including in the Red Sea, and we must ensure Israel's security. That is non-negotiable. It is a fundamental condition for peace in the region. In the face of threats like we saw this weekend, Israel has our full support. Second, we must invest more deeply in the two-state solution. That is what we have been doing over the past six months, including working closely with the Palestinian Authority, so that when the time comes, they can provide more effective governance for Gaza and the West Bank. Mr Speaker, it is significant that other regional partners actually helped to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend. It reminds us how important the attempts to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours really are, and it holds out precious hope for the region. Third, Mr Speaker, the conflict in Gaza must end. Hamas, which is backed by Iran, started this war. They wanted not just to kill and murder, but to destabilise the whole region. This weekend, they rejected the latest hostage deal, which offered a road to a ceasefire. It is Israel's right, and indeed its duty, to defeat the threat from Hamas terrorists and defend its security. And I want to be clear, nothing that has happened over the last 48 hours affects our position on Gaza. The appalling toll on civilians continues to grow. The hunger, the desperation, the loss of life on an awful scale. The whole country wants to see an end to the bloodshed. 
and to see more humanitarian support going in. The, re the recent increase in aid flows is positive, but it is still not enough. We need to see new crossings open for longer to get in vital supplies. And, Mr Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the three British aid workers who were killed in Gaza, John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson. They were heroes. The children of Gaza, who they were risking their lives to feed, need a humanitarian pause immediately, leading to a long-term sustainable ceasefire. That is the fastest way to get hostages out and aid in, and to stop the fighting. Israelis and Palestinians alike deserve to live in peace, dignity and security, and so do people across the entire region. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, Saturday's attack was the act not of a people, but of a despotic regime. And it is emblematic of the dangers that we face today. The links between such regimes are growing. Tel Aviv was not the only target of Iranian drones on Saturday. Putin was also launching them at Kyiv and Kharkiv. And who was the sole voice speaking up for Iran yesterday, seeking to justify their actions? Russia. The threats to stability are growing, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere. And we are meeting those threats time after time, with British forces at the forefront. It's why our pilots were in action this weekend. It's why they have been policing the skies above Iraq and Syria for a decade. It's why our sailors are defending the freedom of navigation in the Red Sea against the reckless attacks of the Iran-backed Houthi militia. It's why our soldiers are on the ground in Kosovo, Estonia, Poland and more. And it's why we have led the way in backing Ukraine and will continue to back them for as long as it takes. When adversaries like Russia or Iran threaten peace and prosperity, we will always stand in their way, ready to defend our values and our interests, shoulder to shoulder with our friends and our allies. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance copy of his statement and for the regular briefings on the developing situation in the Middle East. I also thank the Prime Minister for his warm tribute to your father, Mr Speaker, Doug Hoyle, a great servant of our party, respected by all who knew him. Yeah. I also join the Prime Minister in offering our solidarity with the victims of the horrific attack in Sydney and in recognising the heroism of the three British aid workers killed in Gaza while working for World Kitchen. Turning to the events of this weekend, we support the defensive action taken by the UK over the weekend alongside our international allies against the Iranian attacks on Israel, and we welcome the Prime Minister's call for restraint. Once again, we all salute the professionalism and bravery of our armed forces. We also support the RAF planes being sent to the region to bolster Operation Shader. Their efforts are vital for a safer world. Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place it targeted innocent civilians with a clear intent to destabilise the region. It must be wholly condemned by all. But, Mr Speaker, let us also be clear. A full-scale conflict in the Middle East is in no one's interest. It is a path that can only lead to more bloodshed, more instability and the unleashing of forces that are beyond the ability of anyone to control. Mr Speaker, the combined defensive action this weekend was a success, and because of that, lives were saved. As a result, escalation is not inevitable. In repelling the attack, Israel showed strength and courage. It must now show the same strength and courage to de-escalate. That has to be the primary objective. And Mr Speaker, that is the responsibility of all sides and every partner. We must be resolute and united 
in our support for the collective security of Israel, Jordan and other partners in the region. But tensions remain very high. We must proceed calmly, carefully and with restraint. Because if diplomacy takes centre stage, and it must, then we also need to be clear diplomatic premises should not be targeted and attacked. That is a point of principle. But as the condemnation from our G7 allies rightly notes, Iran's response this weekend was unprecedented, a further step towards the destabilisation of the region and the risk of escalation. And nobody in this House should be or is under any illusion. This is a regime that sponsors terror across the Middle East and beyond, that murders and represses its own people and supports Putin's war efforts in Ukraine. So can the Prime Minister update the House on any new steps he's taking with our international partners to pursue sanctions against the regime? And can he clarify what steps he's taking to limit the power of the Revolutionary Guard to glorify terrorism here in the UK? Mr Speaker, whilst there is no justification for Iran's actions, we cannot be naive to the fact that one of the drivers of tension in the region is the ongoing war in Gaza. Six months on from the horrific Hamas terror attack, hostages remain separated from their families. Thousands of innocent Palestinians have been killed. And now more than a million people face the imminent threat of famine. So I urge the government again to use every ounce of diplomatic leverage that we have to make sure aid to Gaza is unimpeded and drastically scaled up. Alongside that, we reiterate our call for an immediate ceasefire, for Hamas to release hostages, and for a return to a diplomatic process that can rekindle the hope of a two-state solution. Mr Speaker, it is right that we condemn Iran's action. It is right that we work with others to defend the security of our allies. And it is right that we seek the end of conflict in Gaza. But this is a moment for restraint, because escalation will only lead to further destruction. And for the sake of all those still caught in the horror and violence, that must be avoided. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his support of the Government's actions. Uh, with regard to what might happen going forward, ultimately Israel has a right to self-defence, as any state does. And The G7 leader spoke yesterday and unequivocally condemned Iran's attack and expressed full solidarity and support to Israel and its people. Uh, but as the Foreign Secretary said this morning, this is a time to be smart as well as tough. Uh, Iran, Israel has successfully repelled, incredibly successfully repelled the Iranian attack, and Iran is even more isolated on the world stage. And as have, others have said, we would urge them to take the win at this point. We want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed. He's right that it would be deeply destabilising for the region and risks more lives, and all our diplomatics at this point will be geared towards that goal in partnership with our allies. Uh, next, just turning to Iran, um, as it, the behaviour of the Iranian regime, as I've said previously, in, including the actions of the IRGC, poses a significant threat to the safety and security of the UK and our allies. And yesterday at the G7, we agreed to work together on further measures to counter the Iranian regime and its proxies. Uh, it was agreed that we should coordinate those actions and that work is now underway and obviously at the appropriate time either I or ministers will update the House. We have already sanctioned, as he will know, over 400 Iranian individuals, including the IRGC in its entirety. We have a new sanctions regime to enable us to, or well, gives us more extensive powers to designate uh, sanctions uh, that we put in place at the end of last year. And of course, the National Security Act, it creates new offences for espionage and foreign interference and means that our security services have the powers that they need to deter, disrupt and uh, detect threats of a more modern nature from states like Iran. Uh, and lastly, uh, with regard to diplomacy for Israel and the region, 
We are absolutely committed to a two-state solution and working very hard uh, using all our efforts to bring that about, particularly over the last few months, building up the capability, as I said, of the Palestinian Authority so that they have the technical and administrative capability that is necessary uh, when the moment comes for them to provide effective governments, uh, governance in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. It is absolutely, absolutely my view and the government's view that Israelis and Palestinians should have the opportunity to live side by side in peace, with security, dignity and opportunity, and I'm proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing. Yeah, yeah. Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My condolences on the loss of your father. This remains a very dangerous moment, and yet over the weekend we saw a demonstration of unity and purpose. We saw the depth of will for normalisation and for a secure future for all peoples of the Middle East. Restraint is vital if we want to build on the momentum, to get hostages home to their families, to get improvements to continue on aid. But to better protect our people, will my right honourable friend commit to launch a new consensus on Iran with our allies and a new effort with a combined diplomatic, military and wider experts areas to limit the extent of the atrocities of Iran? We need to end the compartmentalisation of the threats when we deal with them. We must deal with them as one, whether it be nuclear ambitions, the arming of the militia, femicide or transnational repression. But only with a new consensus will we see that progress. So will he please commit to leading that internationally? Uh, speaker, I, uh, I can give the Honourable Lady that uh, commitment, and that is exactly the subject of our discussions <laughs> yesterday uh, amongst G7 leaders. And she mentioned nuclear. Iran's nuclear programme has never been more advanced than it is today and threatens international peace and security. Uh, and there is no, absolutely no justification uh, for the, uh, at a civilian level for the enrichment that we are seeing that the IAEA has reported in Iran. And I want to reassure her that we are considering next steps on the nuclear file with our international partners, and we are committed to using all diplomatic tools available to ensure that Iran never develops a nuclear weapon, uh, including using the snapback mechanism if necessary. SNP spokesperson Murray Black. I want to echo the Prime Minister and not only passing on our thoughts to you, Mr Speaker, but also to the families of those aid workers who have been killed in Gaza. Now, I want to begin by condemning the acts of violence by the Iranian regime. These acts are no more than a cynical attempt to exploit the suffering, the pain and the turmoil being experienced by those people in Palestine right now. And whilst we rightly condemn the violent acts of Iran, so too must we condemn the violent acts of Israel. Listening to the interviews that he's been given, the Foreign Secretary is correct in his attempt to uphold the principle of proportionality. But if 100 missiles in retaliation to an isolated attack on an embassy is correctly constitutes as disproportionate, then so too must Israel's 192 days bombardment of Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Now, we yeah, know yeah. that the agenda in Tehran is to bring about as much instability as possible. We all have a responsibility to ensure that that does not happen. There is not going to be a military solution to the conflict in the Middle East. There must be a political and diplomatic solution. So what is required now is the same as what was required six months ago. We need de-escalating and the causes of conflict in the region to be reviewed. Now, the biggest continuing cause of conflict is the siege of Gaza, hence the need for a ceasefire. So can the Prime Minister outline what he is doing to ensure that the UN Security Council mandated ceasefire becomes a reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I think, first of all, it's important not to try and draw any equivalence yes. between yeah. Israel's, Israel's absolute right and duty to provide security for its citizens in the face of an appalling terrorist atrocity uh, and, indeed, what happened over the, the weekend. Uh, these things are just not, uh, not remotely the same. So, uh, and we will more broadly, though, as I've said repeatedly from this dispatch box, urge Israel to abide by international humanitarian law. It's been, we've been very clear that too many civilians have been killed and we're deeply concerned about the impact on the civilian population 
uh, in Gaza, and our diplomatic efforts are geared towards alleviating that suffering. And I'll continue to raise these points with Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, when I speak to him. Uh, but as I said, drawing equivalence between these two things is absolutely the not right thing to do. Absolutely. Of the Defence Select Committee, Jeremy. Uh, notwithstanding the sheer scale of the Iranian attack, multi-layered air defence proved effective. Are we ensuring that any learnings we picked up we're passing on to Ukraine for the use of their own defence? And in a more hostile and dangerous world, and with the ever-increasing proliferation of missile and drone technology, are we reviewing our own air defence assets and capabilities to support our allies and, indeed, closer to home if ever required? Uh, well, Mr. Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for an excellent question. He is right about the importance of air defence, which is why it has repeatedly been one of the key capabilities that we have sought to provide to Ukraine, uh, something that we have led on uh, for some time, and ditto uh, with some of the new contracts that we have placed most recently this year to replenish UK stockpiles, also um, cover air defence missiles. Uh, he's more broadly right that we need to ensure that our industrial production here in the UK is geared to produce the capabilities that we need, whether it's for our own use or for Ukraine's use. And I'm pleased to say the Defence Secretary is working with the industry to ensure that supply chain is there to meet those needs. Ed David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I send you and your family our deepest condolences on the loss of your father? And can I associate myself and my colleagues with the comments of others about the appalling murder, murders in Sydney and the death of the aid workers in Gaza? Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement? The Liberal Democrats join him in condemning Iran's attack on Israel. This is an alarming escalation in a conflict that has already seen far too many deaths and suffering. So we support the action taken by the RAF to intercept Iranian drones as we stand up for Israel's security. Mr Speaker, we also worry about what Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government will do next. The Prime Minister rightly says we must prevent further escalation. So does he agree that the best way to achieve that is to press all sides to agree to an immediate bilateral ceasefire in Gaza to get the hostages home, to get the aid in, and put us on the path to a lasting peace for a two-state solution. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we have repeatedly called for an immediate humanitarian <laughs> pause so that we can get the hostages out and more aid in and use that as the foundation to build a more lasting and sustainable ceasefire. But it is worth pointing out, which hasn't been mentioned by colleagues so far, that Hamas have yet again rejected another offer to release hostages, and it's important that we don't lose sight of that. We must have the hostages released as part of any of those conversations, and it was Hamas yet again over the weekend who have rejected the latest round of those talks. Salim Fox. Mr Speaker, can I thank my right hon. Friend for the leadership he's shown on this issue and echo his call for the need to avoid a spiral of escalation. But we've seen a, a military attack by Iran on a nation which its regime believes should not exist yeah, yeah. at all. Iran has directly or indirectly engineered a war in Gaza with yeah. the aim of thwarting better relations between Arab states right. and Israel, right. especially yeah. Saudi Arabia. We now have death and destruction in Gaza in a conflict that no one can win and where the only beneficiaries are Iran, its proxies and its allies. We have seen an Iranian journalist uh, attacked on British soil, and we've seen a, a vessel, an international vessel, being pirated by the IRGC in international waters. Another vile example of hostage taking. So I ask my right honourable friend again: Why are Iranians still operating out of Heathrow? Why are Iranian banks still operating in the city of London? When will the snapback mechanism be invoked? And what can be done to stop the export of Iranian oil to Russia and other countries, which is now keeping the regime afloat? Yeah. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his leadership on this issue over a consistent period of time, and he's right to highlight the threats that Iran poses to us. I want to reassure him that on all the areas that he mentioned, active work has been undertaken by the government. As I mentioned in my statement, we discussed yesterday on the G7 call the need and benefit of coordinating 
further measures, perhaps including some of the things that he talked about, amongst allies in order to have maximum impact both on the regime and uh, on the ultimate designations of any future sanctions. I am pleased that our new sanctions regime that we implemented at the end of last year gives us extensive new powers. I am keen to make sure we use them to good effect, but where we can coordinate those with allies, I know he would agree with me that that would be preferable, and I can reassure him that that work is happening at pace. Sir George Howard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I too pass on my condolences for the loss of your dad, Doug? Uh, I was one of those who, on many occasions, benefited from his wise advice. The, there is no, as the Prime Minister said, there is no moral equivalence between two sides in this, what's happening in Gaza and what happened um, in the attacks from by Iran on Israel. He, it is the case, though, that um, Israel has made mistakes in the past and should be held to account for them. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that, as things move on, the importance of neighbouring states, particularly, uh, for example, Jordan, is going to be vital, not just in resolving the current difficulties, but also uh, in resolving a long-term future which brings about a two-state solution. In a, in a word, yes, I pay tribute to uh, the King of Jordan for the leadership role that he has played over the past several months. Uh, we are fortunate to enjoy a strong working relationship with the Jordanians, which was on display yet again over this weekend, and I commend him and his country for what they've done. Suella Bratham. Mr Speaker, and please accept my condolences on the loss of your father. Yeah. Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, I was in Israel at the northern border with Lebanon. And of course, we've all seen what happened this weekend. But since October the 7th, Iran-backed Hezbollah has fired over 4,000 rockets into northern Israel, displacing over 150,000 Israeli civilians. I met some of those families. They're under siege. They've been uprooted. But they are brave and defiant in the face of terrorism and anti-Semitism. Mr Speaker, we have known for years that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is the world's chief sponsor of terrorism, here, here. funding and promoting terrorist plots, radicalisation and hostage-taking, both in the Middle East and at home. Mr Speaker, we have prescribed Hamas. We have prescribed Hezbollah. Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's... Why don't we put... Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's national security first by now prescribing the IRGC? Here. Uh, Mr Speaker, as the uh, Ronald lady knows that we don't comment on any potential prescription decisions, but of course we recognise the threat from Iran and have taken measures to counter it at home and around the world. I obviously refer her to my previous answer, but I'm confident the police, security services and courts all have the tools that they need to sanction, prosecute and mitigate the threats from Iran. We strengthened our sanctions regime recently and including sanctioning the IRGC in its entirety. Russia Nara Ali. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite the calls for a ceasefire here in our Parliament and across the international community, the war in Gaza has raged, costing 33,000 lives, as well as the 1,200 killed by Hamas attacks and a humanitarian catastrophe that is now turning to a famine. For months, many have raised the spectre of the concern around regional escalation. Can the Prime Minister say more about precisely what conversations he is having with the leading figures in the Israeli government, as well as um, through uh, various parties to influence the Iranian regime to de-escalate as quickly as possible, given the seriousness of the crisis? Um, well, both the Defence Secretary and Foreign Secretary have spoken uh, to their counterparts over the weekend, uh, including the Foreign Secretary has spoken to the Iranian Foreign Minister specifically to urge de-escalation and condemn what happened over the weekend. I'm speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, shortly, and I can reassure her and all members of the House that we will continue, together with our allies, to urge calm heads to prevail and de-escalation. And we think that's the right course forward. And as I said, across all levels of government, that's the message that we were taking to everyone. Yeah. Ben Wallace. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There is another country uh, that is under almost constant daily bombardment by Iranian-made 
drones. That country is Ukraine. Some three years ago, I asked the Israelis, I pleaded with the Israelis to help Ukraine against Russia, and they refused, even though Russia was spending half a billion dollars in the Iranian drone program. I know the Prime Minister is speaking to the Prime Minister of Israel later today. Now that RAF pilots have quite rightly gone to the defence of Israel, yeah. could he perhaps ask that Israel now decides that it is time to help Ukraine in their hour of need and we can see off both Russia and Iranian aggression? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, can I thank my honourable friend for the role he's played in ensuring UK security and that of our allies uh, over previous years? He's right, as my statement alluded to uh, as well. The Ukrainians are suffering from Iranian drones over the same weekend that this happened. And I'm also pleased not only will I take up his points of always with all our allies urging them to do more to support Ukraine. I know he will have welcomed the recent announcement a few weeks ago of more support from the, Ukraine, from the UK to Ukraine, specifically in the areas of uncrewed platforms on autonomous warfare to make sure that the Ukrainians both have the ability they need to protect themselves and conduct their operations. Uh, and the majority of the 10,000 new platforms that we are delivering to the Ukrainians uh, will also will have been developed in the UK which I know is something that he was keen to ensure that we saw the benefits of here at home. I'm glad that has been realised, supporting Ukraine and their security and bolstering the British defence industry yeah. here at home. John MacDonald. There's consensus across the House, rightfully so, to call for restraint on the Israeli government. But we've called for restraint before. We call for restraint with regard to the attack on Gaza, yet the indiscriminate bombing took place. We call for restraint on the settlements in the West Bank, and yet the settlements have expanded. We call for a restraint so that food could be gotten to the children of Gaza, and yet malnutrition is killing some of them. So what action will the government take if Israel does not show restraint, because we're in danger of the Middle East being set alight by the decisions taken by the right-wing factions within the Netanyahu cabinet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, I, I missed the part of the honourable gentleman's question where he condemned Iran and Hamas uh, for what they've done. Uh, but we will always encourage de-escalation in the region, and I'm proud of the role the UK is playing to bring that about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kit Speaker, the Prime Minister was quite right to authorise the defence of Israel and, the, um, I guess, the avoidance of violence and death. But violence has also erupted in the West Bank, as he will know, over the last few days. What concrete steps could we take to protect those civilians too? Mr Speaker, the issue of settler violence in the West Bank is something that I have personally repeatedly raised with Prime Minister Netanyahu, as indeed have my colleagues, including the Deputy Foreign Minister. And we have joined with allies in sanctioning activity of particular individuals uh, where we, it has been brought to our attention and we will continue to ensure that the Israeli government does everything it can to reduce tensions in the West Bank. We don't think it's conducive to long-term peace in the region and that's why I said we've taken action where we can as well as being very explicit about our concerns with the Israeli government. George Galloway. Mr. Speaker, I knew your father well for a very long time. He was a fine man and I am sincerely sorry for your loss. There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth, and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. <laughs> Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles 
from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the honourable gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or indeed the actions of Hamas in the region. There is no equivalence between these things whatsoever, and to suggest otherwise is simply wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Holford. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend for his strong support for the State of Israel. Um, last year, as Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to strike a transformational agreement, Iran backed Hamas carried out its massacre on October the 7th with the aim of torpedoing the chance of peace between Israel and the Arab nations. And last Saturday's drone attack by Iran, being thwarted by Israel and her allies, including Jordan, demonstrated that Arab countries can work alongside Israel after this new period of contention. So does my right honourable friend agree that this represents a new opportunity for Israel and the Arab nations to rebuild relations in the aftermath of October 7th and bring the hostages home? Thank you. Mr Speaker, I agree uh, with my honourable friend. It is significant that other regional partners actually help to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend, and it reminds us how important attempts are to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours. It holds out precious hope for the region. It's exactly that hope that Iran and its proxies are trying to snuff out, and we should work very hard to combat that. John Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you and your family, Mr Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, I condemn Iran and Hamas. Let me start there. But we must not lose focus on the situation in Gaza, where there is a humanitarian crisis, uh, famine, and, and it's just destruction that people are seeing in front of their eyes. But if we want to, if we want to ensure that the hostages come home, like the hostage that's been adopted in Brent, Noah Argumenti, we must argue for a ceasefire and not a pause. Will the Prime Minister clearly state that we should be calling for an immediate ceasefire on all sides. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's wrong to suggest in any way that we have lost sight of what is happening in Gaza. And indeed, the G7, G7 statement yesterday referenced specifically at our desire to cooperate to end the crisis in Gaza, working, to, working towards an immediate humanitarian pause where hostages can be released, aid can go in and build the conditions for a sustainable ceasefire, and crucially deliver more humanitarian assistance into the region. It is welcome that we have seen an increase in that flow over the past few days and weeks, but far more aid has to get in, and that is the pressure that we will continue to put on all partners concerned. Sir Ian Duncan. Mr Speaker, my condolences. Can I commend my right honourable friend's statement? Uh, it's quite clear, as has been said already, that all roads lead back to Tehran when it comes to the terrible violence and the wars that take place uh, in the Middle East. And every country, not just Israel, but other Arab countries, fear what Tehran is doing in their countries as well, the thing we forget about. Can I therefore know that if we know that they are committing murder at home, they've, com they've executed thousands of protesters whilst uh, this war in Hamas has been taking place. So with all of that known, could I please ask my right honourable friend, when he sits down with our international colleagues and looks for other things to take place with regards to restricting Iran, please, please, could he now consider prescribing the Iranian uh, uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and to do it in a way that makes sure they can no longer ferment extremism here in the United Kingdom as well. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his question. Uh, I, as I said to him, or I said in the statement, we are urgently working with our allies to see what steps we can take together in a coordinated fashion uh, to deter and condemn what Iran is doing. Uh, with regard to destabilising activity here in the UK, you know, he'll know that the Charities Commission very recently have opened an investigation to a particular organisation, uh, and we will continue to use all the powers at our disposal to make sure that people aren't fermenting hate and undermining British values here at home from abroad. Sarah Sultan. Mr Speaker, I have notified the Office of the Member for Rutland and Melton that I would be referencing her in my question. 
It was recently revealed that the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee told a private fundraising event, and I quote, the Foreign Office has re received official legal advice that Israel has broken international humanitarian law, but the government has not announced it. So I have a very simple question for the Prime Minister, and if he can't answer that, if he dodges and if he deflects, our constituents will know that he is hiding the truth. Was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee telling the truth, yes or no? Yeah. 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 Well. Mr Speaker, I'm happy to address this very clearly. We have one of the mo most robust arms export licensing control regimes in the entire world. We have previously assessed that Israel is committed and capable of complying with IHL, but we regularly review our assessment, as she would expect. As the Foreign Secretary confirmed last week, the UK position on export licences is unchanged and following the latest assessment oh. is in line with our legal advice. Oh. We will keep that position under review and act in accordance with advice. And I would also point out to her that actually most like-minded countries have not suspended right. their existing right. arms export licences right. to Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I too uh, welcome the Prime Minister's uh, leadership in this area. Will he add his thanks uh, in addition to the thanks for the RAF who have uh, undertaken exemplary action this weekend, also those US service personnel who are based here in the United Kingdom, including many in my West Suffolk constituency, who were prepared to act at a moment's notice in order to defend the, uh, the attack on Israel, uh, which has been roundly condemned. Well, I'm happy to join my honourable friend in paying tribute to our colleagues, not just in America, but from partners uh, around the region who participated in a joint international effort. Uh, this was all uh, in support of Israel's own actions, and also their armed forces deserve enormous praise for the success in which they repelled this awful attack. Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pass my condolences to you and your family for the sad loss of your father, Doug? We live in deeply unsettling times, and the Prime Minister is right, along with her allies, to call for a de-escalation. When the Prime Minister has these discussions with Prime Minister Netanyahu this afternoon, can he convey to him that now is the time to step back? There must be no further escalation in the Middle East. And, Mr Speaker, now is the time to recognise that both Israelis and Palestinians must live in peace. And in order to do that, we need that two-state solution. But as the former Prime Minister David Cameron said in 2014, when we had an outbreak of violence in Gaza, he then unequivocally called for a ceasefire. We must now, today, put an end to the conflict and the killing in that region for the benefit of both these countries. And finally, if I may say so, I welcome the comments of the Prime Minister on the situation in Ukraine. But we're all aware of the reports of the build-up of Russian activity. And I ask the Prime Minister, with our allies, that we must do more today to protect our friends in Iran, to give them the tools that they need to be able to defend themselves and to be able to make sure that Russia is defeated. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to say to our honourable uh, gentleman that we remain steadfast in our support for Ukraine yeah. and we will not allow Putin to achieve his aim of eradicating freedom and democracy in that country. We have announced significant support. It was the first trip that I made at the beginning of this year and have encouraged allies to do the same. And We are committed to supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes, for not only for them to win the war, but also to emerge as a strong, sovereign and free country. Yeah. Be Manchester. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My thoughts and condolences are with your family. The United Kingdom stands for an international rules-based system respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity of other nations. And that is one of our key objectives with regards to Ukraine. Of course, I condemn in the fullest Iran's attack on Israel. And I have previously condemned Iran's malign behaviour in the region. The question that is on people's mind is this. What information or intelligence does the Prime Minister have with regards to what was going on in Iran's consulate in Damascus, which led to that attack by Iran? Because the international community and people around the world want to see the United Kingdom applying international law consistently across the board. 
Mr Speaker, whatever happened in that situation has not been uh, confirmed, and regardless, there can never be any justification for launching, as I said, over 300 drones and missiles towards Israel from another sovereign country, and it was right that we took action with allies to repel that attack. Richard Burke. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you on the loss of your father. He will have been very, very proud of you. This is a very dangerous moment. The UN Secretary General rightly told the Security Council last night, now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Ordinary people in both Israel and Iran, across the whole region, indeed wider world, will pay the price if it escalates. The Secretary General also rightly reiterated the call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, as the Security Council voted for, given the huge loss of life there. This is the first opportunity we've had to question the Prime Minister since the recent killing of British nationals in Gaza. So is the Prime Minister planning to appoint an independent adviser to scrutinise the Israeli inquiry into those deaths of British nationals uh, in a similar way to the way Australia has done? Uh, Mr Speaker, I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu after that incident to express our very strong concerns about what had happened. We are carefully reviewing the initial findings of Israel's investigations into the killing of the aid workers and welcome the suspension of two officers as a first step. These findings must be published and followed up with an independent review to ensure the utmost transparency and accountability. Right can I congratulate the Prime Minister for his strength defending Israel and wider peace in the Middle East? His strength in this area is world leading. Now, our friend, this country's friend Saudi Arabia, has now said in an official statement that Iran, quote, engineered the war in Gaza, end quote, in order to destroy the progress the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was making in normalising relations with Israel. Now, that very important statement yesterday also said that Iran is a country that sponsors terrorism and it should have been stopped a long time ago. That's the Saudis saying that. So is my right honourable friend as hopeful as I am that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel, both allies of this country, will normalise their relations as soon as possible, as it looks like they were on track to do before the pogrom of the 7th of October? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a very constructive meeting uh, in Saudi uh, Arabia um, with MBS at the end of last year, and I know how important it is to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours. And it's clear from this weekend, and indeed the comments that the Honourable Gentleman just made, that there is momentum and a desire to see that happen. And it holds out, I believe, precious hope for the region. Thank you. Can I also pass our condolences from my party on to you and the loss of your dad? The UK should not either dictate or demand from Israel uh, restrictions in how it retaliates against the Iranian regime, which has shown it is prepared to take action to back up its threats to wipe Israel out. And indeed, the political and military support which we have given is very important. But can the Prime Minister tell us what direct action can we take here in the United Kingdom to disrupt the economic uh, interests of Iran, uh, which is, uh, exists in our own country? Uh, we've already sanctioned more than 400 Iranian individuals, Mr. Speaker, uh, and as I said, discussing with our allies about what all we can do. Jason McCann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to the Royal Air Force personnel who were on operations yeah, 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 yeah. over the weekend? I also join him as well the importance of de escalating calling for maximum restraint, and when it comes to Gaza, working towards that sustainable ceasefire, seeing a flood of aid going into Gaza now to help the humanitarian efforts there, and also we all want to see an end to the bloodshed. But can I just echo the Chair of the Defence Select Committee in what we saw over the weekend, just showing the importance of investing in air defence systems to defend civilians from these hostile regimes? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, whether it's with Ukraine, where we've provided Amrans and Star Street missiles, or indeed here at home, where, as I said, we've placed new contracts at the beginning of this year uh, to improve our air defence capability, it's a key capability that we need to invest in, and ideally we need to produce more of it here at home. Absol Khan. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, 12 uh, year old Zain Arouk miraculously survived Israel's bombing that killed most of his family in Gaza three months ago, but was killed 
this weekend by an aid airdrop when he was searching for scraps of food because the parachute didn't open. Zayn and thousands of others would still be alive had allies like the UK and US pushed Israel to adhere to the UN resolution on ceasefire in Gaza, which would allow aid to reach starving children safely. So will the Prime Minister set out exactly what repercussions Israel will face for failing to abide by the UN Security Council motion? Mr. Speaker, I've been very clear that too many civilians have already lost their lives in Gaza. The UN Security Council resolution also called for the unconditional release of the hostages, which, as he'll know, Hamas rejected at the weekend. And it's important that we focus on that at the same time as getting more aid in. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's one thing right now that would do more than anything to help end the conflict in Gaza, and that's the release of all the Israeli hostages being held by (coughs) Hamas. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that no matter how well intentioned and no matter how much we all want the conflict to end as soon as possible, simply calling for an unconditional immediate ceasefire reduces the incentive on Hamas to do the hostage deal. So long as they feel like they're winning diplomatically, it reduces pressure on them to do the right thing. I agree with my honourable friend, and I've made the same argument from the dispatch box previously. It's absolutely crucial that as part of the immediate humanitarian pause that we are calling for, not only can we get considerably more aid into Gaza to alleviate suffering that people are experiencing, we must be able to release the hostages, and that's what we're focused on doing. Marcia de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst globally the the attention is rightly focused on Israel and Iran, and we are all in agreement that the next step has to be de-escalation, the situation in Gaza is worsening every day. More than 33,000 lives have been lost, and more than a million will now be facing an imminent famine. Now, the UK almost stands alone in not restoring funding to UNRWA. So can the Prime Minister tell us when he will set out a clear path for funding to resume? Mr Speaker, together with our allies, we're reviewing the interim findings uh, and are discussing appropriate next steps. Many partner countries have suspended funding to UNRWA after what happened, which was shocking. But in the meantime, we are considerably increasing our own aid into the region and welcome the commitments from Israel recently uh, to increase uh, the flow, opening new checkpoints, the port of Ashdod, the Jordan Land Corridor, Kerem Shalom. But now we want to see those commitments followed through. We all want to see more aid getting in, and that will be a focus of our conversations with Israel. Well, good. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just on behalf of myself and uh, your neighbours in Bolton North East, very sorry for the loss of your, your father. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 90% of Iranian oil exports go to China. Uh, China's increasing importance in the region now already trades four times the amount um, than compared to the United States, the GCC countries, along with Iran. What discussions is the Prime Minister planning on having with his counterpart Xi Jinping and the Foreign Secretary Wang Yi in terms of resolving an escalation in the conflict in Iran? The, the Foreign Secretary recently spoke to his counterpart at exactly that topic, and more broadly, we're discussing with G7 partners and allies what further measures we can take to uh, deal with the threat economically that Iran poses. Yes, Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, much has been referred to by the Prime Minister and members opposite about the uh, normalisation process between Saudi Arabia and Israel. The Saudi ambassador to this country on the 9th of, this, 9th of January told Radio 4 that that normalisation process was subject to a two-state solution and a fully recognised Palestine. And so, so I just wanted to put that on the record. And I want to remind the Prime Minister, support for any nation is not, not like the unconditional support that he has for his football team. When Iran acts like a rogue state in Syria, we call them out, rightfully so. When Israel taunts Iran by bombing their consulate building, knowing full well Iran will respond, risking further escalation, we must also call out Israel. What is the Prime Minister doing in his efforts to make sure that two-state solution, that two-state solution and the recognition of Palestine is being actively pursued? Further, the Honourable Lady to my statement, where I made clear my commitment to a two-state solution and our diplomatic efforts to help bring that about. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend has made it clear that it is right and lawful to defend yourself and right and lawful for your allies to help defend you. 
But would you agree that it's also important to say that self-defence can be both effective and restrained, and more than that, that self-defence can be more effective in the long run when restrained, because it helps to retain the broadest coalition of those who support your position, and because it enables you to retain the moral authority to act robustly against others when you need to. Well, I think my uh, honourable friend put it well. Ultimately, Israel does have a right to self-defence, as any state does, but they have successfully repelled the Iranian attack, and Iran is even more isolated on the world stage, which is why, as the Foreign Secretary said, we would urge them to take the win and avoid further escalation at this moment. So, Chris Bryan. Oh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister is right to say that we and our allies need to be very clear-sighted about the activities of Iran and Russia. But when you consider that there are British businesses like Avon still doing business in Russia and claiming that that is because it's absolutely vital and urgent, uh, when you consider that there is a massive shadow uh, fleet of tankers evading Russian oil mm -hmm. sanctions, and when you consider that many countries are importing, such as in Kazakhstan, so that they can then import into Russia, again to avoid sanctions. And when you consider that not a penny has yet gone from the sale of Abramovich's Chelsea to Ukraine, and we still haven't seized any of the multi-billion pounds of Russian state assets sitting in British banks, yes. isn't there further that we could go? Yes. Yes. Mr Speaker, we and our G7 partners have repeatedly underscored that Russia's obligations under international law are clear, and they must pay for the damage that they've caused to Ukraine. Uh, I believe we should be bold and pursue all routes through which immobilised Russian sovereign assets can be used to support Ukraine, in line, of course, with international law. This is something I've discussed with my G7 partners repeatedly. Uh, we've tasked finance ministers to that end, and they are reporting back ahead of the G7 summit in June, and I hope we can make further progress. Sir so Simon Clark. Mr. Speaker, and I uh, would add my voice to those across the House who call for the prescription of the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. Their tentacles are wherever trouble is to be found across the Middle East, and this is the latest uh, demonstration of their malign influence. Uh, can my right of friend clarify uh, that, with the threat of war growing in a way which I think bears grave risk to us here at home, that we need to set out a timetable to bring? Uh, our commitment to raise uh, the percentage of GDP that we spend on defence to 2.5% as quickly as possible, but we need specificity as to how we're going to do so. Well, I'm, I'm pleased, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in anticipation of the rising threat environment, we significantly increase defence spending by the largest amount since the end of the Cold War uh, just a couple of years ago, and subsequently to that by over £11 billion, pounds specifically to uh, deal with inflation, strengthen our nuclear enterprise and rebuild our stockpiles. But I can reassure the House and my honourable friend that we will always continue to invest in our armed forces to keep this country safe. Joanna Cherry. Uh, I hold no candle for the Iranian regime, and in fact, I recently co authored a report on their disgraceful oppression of women and girls, and we concluded it amounted to gender apartheid. However, just as Iran must be held to the standards of international law, so must Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the Prime Minister has paid tribute to the brave three British aid workers who were killed by the IDF. Will he condemn Israel for their wrongful killing? And will he also condemn, condemn Israel for the ongoing slaughter of innocent life in Gaza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll point the uh, Honourable Lady to my previous answers on both her questions. Thank you, Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Iranian drones have not only been fired towards Israel and Ukraine, there are also bi weekly shipments of Iranian drones arriving in Port Sudan to be used in that war, which as of today has now raged for a full year. So I'm very glad that the Prime Minister has made this statement today and is going to act first on financial sanctions and other measures. But does he agree that given that these Iranian weapons are now being used in wars in the Middle East, in Europe and in Africa, Partners not only in the West but also in the Global South should be deeply worried about how far the tentacles of terror from Tehran are now reaching. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, 
I agree with the uh, my honourable friend, and that's why yesterday I discussed with G7 leaders the coordinated effort amongst allies to take further measures to stem the flow of Iran's malign influence across the world, and, and hopefully we can coordinate that action to tackle the precise thing that she's just mentioned. Khalid Mahmood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I deplore the attack by the IDF on the consulate uh, in Iraq. I further totally deplore the massive attack by Iran by launching 301 drones and missiles uh, on Israel, knowing full well that this attack will deter from the great work that we need to do in Gaza, supporting those people who are starving, who are mal uh, suffering from malnutrition, young children, we need to support them to do that. Will the Prime Minister commit to the fact that he supports not, no escalation in, any, in, the, in the region by any of the countries that are involved at the moment, but has he said in his statement to concentrate on supporting young people and people that are dying in Gaza? Prime Minister. As I said very clearly, we've urged de-escalation and calm heads to prevail, and we continue to do everything we can to get more aid into Gaza. Francois. Thank you, ma'am. Again on air defence, I wholly commend our RAF pilots and their superb Typhoon aircraft. But we only have 137 typhoons. And because of budget pressures, next year the MOD plans to retire 30 of them and then sell them off, which would now be akin to selling Spitfires before the Battle of Britain. Will the Prime Minister, when he has a moment, go back to his office and place that ridiculous decision? under immediate review and, at the very least, put those typhoons in a war reserve in case one day we need them for ourselves. Well, I thank my honourable friend for his question. He will know that, obviously, individual uh, equipment and capability decisions will be made uh, by service chief in conjunction with ministers. I am uh, happy to look at the, the, the point that he raised, but I do know we are also increasing our purchases of F-35 aircraft uh, and collaborating with Japan and Italy on building the next generation of fighter aircraft, something that we are leading the world in, but also will be fantastic for British jobs here at home. Derek Twigg. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, I do hope, as the Prime Minister said, that we actually we can find a diplomatic solution, but I think we should plan for the worst. And I note that the Prime Minister, in his statement, said the threats to stability, is, the threats to stability are growing, not just in the Middle East, but he I mean, uses exact quotes everywhere. So, uh, can I ask the? Uh, uh, may I also add, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that our armed forces are running very hot at the moment. So, can I ask the Prime Minister why did he come here today to announce a significant, a significant uplift in defence spending to match the potential real and real, real and potential threats that we're now facing as, as, as our yeah, country yeah. is? And why isn't that going to add to insecurity for our country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I refer the gentleman to my previous answer about the existing increase uh, in our defence budget, not just over the last few years, but especially this year, in recognition of the increasing threats, and also just point out to him that we remain and have done over the past 10 years the second largest defence spender in NATO behind only the US. Yeah. Elias? I welcome the action taken by the Prime Minister and the Armed Services over the weekend. I regret to say this, but some of my constituents feel that UK support for Israel has weakened in mm. recent weeks. So, in the light of this horrific aggression from Iran, will the Prime Minister take the opportunity to confirm that there is no backsliding and that the UK stands shoulder to shoulder with Israel as it exercises its right to defend itself from a genocidal attack? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, as I was crystal clear, in my statement, we must ensure Israel's security. It's non-negotiable. It's a fundamental condition for peace in the region. And as we saw in the face of threats, like we saw this weekend, Israel will have always our full support. Yeah, yeah. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Like the whole House, I condemn the attack on Israel by the tyrannical Iranian regime, just as I deeply condemn the atrocities of Hamas. But I am also incredibly concerned that our Prime Minister has now pitched the UK into a perilous war and in support of an Israeli government presided over by Netanyahu, a man who chose to bomb an Iranian embassy because he's dependent on his hard-right provo provocateurs. 
This was itself a dangerous escalation by Israel and a further breach of international law. So if the Prime Minister's priority is indeed international law and de-escalation, then why isn't he calling now for an urgent bilateral ceasefire to get the hostages home and to get the region on the path to peace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, we have called for an immediate humanitarian pause to get the hostages out and aid in, and will continue to do so. Uh, and I'm completely comfortable that what we did over the weekend was the right thing, acting together with allies to make sure that we could act in defence of Israel in the face of an unprecedented attack on its territory and people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sir Alex Hurlbrook. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I um, congratulate my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for his um, holistic view to the situation taking place in um, Israel, Gaza, and of course Iran. And may I say how glad I am that he has categorically said that we will carry on supplying the arms that Israel needs to defend itself, which has been proven to be so vital just this weekend. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that in order to try and achieve a sustainable ceasefire? That we also that the Middle East has to um, confront the threat that Iran makes. Its um, its direct influence in Yemen is having an impact um, on shipping through the Red Sea. That's having an impact on the war which is in Sudan, and it's having an impact in the war in Gaza and the effect on Israel and surrounding countries such as Lebanon. So I ask my right honourable friend to, um, to do everything he can to make sure that the whole of the region recognises that Iran plays a large part in all of the suffering we're seeing in the area. My uh, honourable friend is right to point out Iran's support for the Houthi militia who have carried out a series of dangerous and destabilising attacks against shipping in the Red Sea, uh, and that's why the UK, together with our allies, stood up to take action against that and are currently engaged in the multinational Operation Prosperity Guardian to further deter uh, Houthi and Iranian aggression. Sir Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I welcome the support of the Prime Minister and the Government for the resolution on Gaza adopted recently by the United Nations Security Council. Israel is currently in breach of that resolution. How does that affect his view of the current actions of Israel in the Middle East? That resolution also calls for the release of the hostages which Hamas rejected just this weekend. Uh, David Jones. Deputy Speaker, further to the points made by my right honourable friend, the friends, the members for Fareham and Chingford and Woodford Green, uh, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is not only the principal uh, sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East, it is also active on the streets of the United Kingdom. Uh, indeed, the uh, Iranian journalist Puryea Zarati, who was almost fatally stabbed last month, was under threat from the IRGC. And it's uh, actually the case that IRGC officials can be seen dining out in restaurants in West London quite regularly. Whilst I fully understand that my right honourable friend will not flag up any such uh, action in advance, can he confirm that he will take into account what I believe to be the overwhelming feeling in this House, uh, which is that the IRGC should be proscribed as a terrorist organisation? Uh, I'll just refer the uh, honourable gentleman to my previous answers, but also remind him that the National Security Act uh, creates new offences which give us the powers to arrest and detain people suspected of involvement in state threats on our soil. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I share the hope for calm and de-escalation. Without it, the UN Secretary-General has said the Middle East faces a real danger of devastating full-scale conflict. Can the Prime Minister tell us what the parameters are of UK military involvement in the region and confirm it will remain defensive? So, well, if, Madam Speaker, I'm not going to speculate on future hypotheticals, um, but as I said, we have sent additional jets and air refuelling tankers to bolster our existing operation in the region and will obviously keep next steps under review. Dear Richards. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. Iran has smuggled arms into the Middle East, including the West Bank. They've equipped and funded and trained Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthis, as well as threatening British Iranians on British soil. And that doesn't even include what they have done to their own people, not least gassing Iranian schoolgirls. I thank the Prime Minister for the strong action over the weekend. Does he agree with me? We now must reconsider prescribing the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. 
Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight uh, the influence of Iran with missile shipments uh, in the seas around them, and that's why I'm pleased that the United Kingdom is playing its part to practically do something about that. HMS Diamond bolstering our maritime presence in the region as we speak, uh, but also the UK has previously interdicted the supply of Iranian missiles being smuggled to the Houthis and others both last year and the year before, and will continue to be vigilant in the area. Mr. Carmichael. Speaker. I hope that the Prime Minister has heard the very strong and broad consensus that there is in this House now on the need for stability and de-escalation. So when he speaks to Prime Minister Netanyahu, will he make it clear to him that if Israel were now to proceed with their much-anticipated attack on Rafah, then that would not only be a humanitarian catastrophe for the 1.5 million Palestinians who are sheltering there, would make the release of the hostages more difficult, but would also make that stability and de-escalation more difficult to achieve and, as a consequence, will not have the support of his government. Well, Mr Speaker, we repeatedly raised humanitarian concerns uh, with the Israeli government uh, and the Foreign Secretary set out uh, just the other week our views on the situation in Rafa. John Whittingdale. Um, it is two weeks since uh, the journalist working for Iran International was attacked on the streets of our own capital. and The journalists and families of those who work for the BBC Persia service live under constant threat. Right, yeah. The organisation responsible for those acts is the IRGC working for the Iranian regime and therefore can I ask my right friend that he will look to see what further measures can be taken which would, should include outlawing the IRGC. I'm happy to reassure my right honourable friend that we are actively in dialogue as we speak with our international partners following the G7 call yesterday to coordinate further diplomatic measures to contain the threat from Iran. Madam Deputy Speaker, the core issue now must be the de escalation and an immediate ceasefire on all sides, ending the devastating situation in Gaza and a political solution for the long term. UNRWA is arguably the biggest single multilateral tool to support a political solution and is unmatched in its administrative ability to deliver aid. The UK stands behind other countries in not renewing funding to UNRWA. So further to the previous question from my honourable friend, could the Prime Minister set out a clear path for funding to resume? I just refer the honourable lady to my previous answer. I don't think it's right to say uh, that we're behind other countries. We're in active dialogue with other countries on the approach to UNRWA. Recognise the role that they do play operationally and logistically on the ground, but also recognising the very shocking uh, concerns that all of us had about what happened previously. It's right that we take the time to get our future approach to UNRWA right. Philip Dunn. Uh, I welcome the Prime Minister's focus on calls for restraint and de-escalation, and I imagine that will be on his agenda this afternoon when he speaks to the Israeli Prime Minister. I also welcome his highlighting of the greater threats to this country. In light of that, could he, and recognising what he said earlier today about the future defence budget, could he undertake an immediate review of the resources and resilience of the British Armed Forces in the immediate term? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to tell my honourable friend that we do keep these things under constant review to make sure that we have the capabilities that we need to protect our country and stand up for our value and interests around the world. One thing that is clear is recent conflicts in Ukraine specifically have shown is how technology is changing warfare, which is why our increased focus on autonomous vehicles is so welcome and including building up our UK industrial supply chain. These are things that we need to focus on. I'm delighted the Defence Secretary has prioritised those areas. Hal Williams. Thank you, Speaker. Is there a danger that a, a further military attack on Iran would uh, serve to entrench the despotic regime in Tehran and strengthen its ability to oppress its own people, Iranian women, the Kurdish community, the Baha'is and many, many others? of its own citizens is appalling and we've repeatedly condemned them and called them out for that. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The last speaker 
I met with students at Woodbrook Vale School and Delisle College in Loughborough. Their question on this topic is now even more important than it was when they put it to me last week. What more can the United Kingdom do to help bring peace to this region? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I'd point my uh, honourable friend to the statement. I think, first and foremost, we have to be resolute in protecting regional security and standing up for Israel when situations like this happen. Secondly, we have to be committed to a two-state solution, which we are doing everything we can uh, to bring that about. And I think the regional cooperation uh, over the weekend demonstrated there's much to be hopeful for. And thirdly, we must see an immediate humanitarian pause in Gaza so we can get the hostages out and aid in. That's the British approach. It's the right approach, and we'll work very hard to bring it about. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk has warned that Europe is in a pre-war era because of the situation in Russia. The Prime Minister rightly said that these were not mutually exclusive conflicts but interlinked and therefore it is important that we coordinate. Just as we have seen there has been coordination at the United Nations, he will be aware of the very real concern that the UN sanctions regime on both Iran and Russia is being undermined. Now, the UN has combined together to support a ceasefire and to call for that. What more is he doing to make sure that the UN works for sanctions on both Russia and Iran? Does he recognise that waiting until June for the G7 to act may be too long in a situation where every single day counts to stop further military action? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what I was talking about with the G7 was regard to Russian assets, where obviously the G7 has an outsized economic role that it can play. So it's important that there is G7 coordination, first and foremost. Uh, when it comes to sanctions evasion, last year we funded the economic deterrence uh, regime that we have specifically to target sanctions evasion. She's right that it's a growing issue and one that I can reassure her we are tackling together with our allies. Uh, James Morris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Notwithstanding the drones and the missiles which were launched by Iran and quite rightly taken out by UK planes and, and, and our allies, they prefer to operate in the shadows through proxies and through an in increasingly sophisticated cyber operation. So would the Prime Minister agree with me that our priority should be working with international allies to go after where Iran is promoting illicit finance and weapons smuggling, as well as working with our international par um, partners to combat their cyber operations? Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I can reassure him we are working closely with international partners, uh, not least on cyber, but also on weapons smuggling. As I said, I'm pleased that the Royal Navy is playing a significant role in combating that with interdictions of illegal arms shipments both last year and the year before and contributing, as we speak, to Operation Prosperity Guardian. Uh, Andy MacDonald. Madam Deputy Speaker, I just point out to the uh, Prime Minister that a nation state having the capacity to observe international humanitarian law is quite different to actually doing so. But at this terrifying moment for the world, I think we're all mightily relieved that Iran, which must be condemned for what it did, um, failed in inflicting serious loss of life on people in the region. And the de-escalation call uh, is correct, as is the commitment not to engage in offensive action. But it was explicit in his statement that all people are entitled to security and peace. But sadly, for the people of Gaza, the calls for restraint have not worked. So what additional options is he considering? Because surely an immediate ceasefire, the funding of UNRWA, is the best way to secure uh, security for the region and also the release of all the hostages. Prime Minister. Well, it's important that the hostages are released, and that's what we continue to call for. And as the honourable gentleman knows, it was Hamas yet again this weekend that rejected the latest round of negotiations to get those hostages back to safety. I am anxious to be able to get everybody in, so I would um, plead for a uh, brevity in the questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Jack Lepresti. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I place on the record my condolences to the Speaker and his family? Could I commend the Prime Minister for his statement uh, and the leadership he has shown? But given this despicable attack on the civilian population of Israel by Iran, does he agree with me that the world cannot risk a nuclear armed Iran? And will he commit to the House today that he will support whatever it takes 
including not taking military action off the table to ensure that this nightmare never happens. Well, as I said, there's no credible civilian justification for the enrichment levels that we've seen that the IAEA has uh, reported are happening in Iran. We're committed to using all diplomatic tools uh, to ensure that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon, including using the snapback mechanism if necessary. Neil Handy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I oppose all acts of violence and uh, I welcome the Prime Minister's calls for de-escalation and restraint. But I can't be the only person who wonders where those calls for de-escalation and restraint were six months ago. And given those calls, does he share my concerns that the political fortunes of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in whose hands such a choice rests, are so heavily invested in the continuation of conflict? We have continued to call on the Israeli government to do everything it can to protect civilian life as it exercises its indeed right and duty to ensure security for its citizens, and I will continue to raise those points with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Of Blackman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Effectively over the weekend, Iran declared war on our friend and ally Israel. And clearly, when the Prime Minister talks to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he is going to have to be very careful about how he persuades him to exercise self restraint. So clearly a menu of options has to be what the British government and what are the British people are going to do in assisting Israel in resisting Iran. So the proscription of the IRGC, the removal of the embassy uh, here and, re and return of all those officials to Iran, our officials returning to the United Kingdom and the harshest possible sanctions against the regime in Iran are the fundamentals that are required. Yeah. Ms. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have already sanctioned over 400 different Iranian individuals and entities, including the IRGC in its entirety, and we continue to discuss with international partners how best we can coordinate future actions. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Everyone in this House is united in wanting to see the fighting in Gaza come to an end as soon as possible, with a sustainable ceasefire in place. As the Prime Minister quite rightly states, it was once again Hamas who had rejected a US broker deal which would see the fighting stop, hostages released, and allow far more aid to get into Gaza. So what pressure is the government applying to our allies in the region who provide support to Hamas to urge them to do all they can to make Hamas accept a deal? Uh, can I thank the Honourable Lady for her question and agree with her? We are doing everything we can, talking to allies in the region, to put pressure on Hamas to accept a deal and get the hostages released. That is the best and most important way we can move towards a sustainable ceasefire that we all want to see. Uh, Steve Double. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement and the clear leadership he's providing on this very important matter? As a beacon of liberal democracy in the region, uh, Israel's security is our security. And it's quite clear from the weekend that uh, serious loss of life was only avoided because of the effectiveness of Israeli defence mechanisms supported by the UK and others. Does, so, does the Prime Minister share my concern that those calling for an arms embargo against uh, Israel are not only misguided, but they risk weakening Israel's ability to defend itself and encouraging those who wish Israel harm. Prime Minister. Oh, uh Madam Deputy Speaker, as I said, we stand by Israel's right to defend itself. It is important that they continue to abide by international humanitarian law. That will always be important to us, and we continue to keep all arms exports under review, and we have one of the strictest regimes anywhere in the world. Adam Kaiser. Speaker, the events of the weekend mark a dangerous new chapter in the long history of conflict in the Middle East. Does the Prime Minister accept that proportionality is key and must include the conduct of all parties, including the 192 days of uninterrupted and constant bombardment of Gaza in response to what was, of course, a horrific attack by Hamas? He has now killed over 32,000 civilians in Gaza, a place where children and look to the sky, not knowing if aid or bombs are going to fall on them. Is that proportionate, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we continue to support Israel's right to defend itself and ensure security for its citizens. It must do that in accordance with international humanitarian law, and we will continue to make that point to the Israelis. Greg Smith. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, I join with others in thanking the Prime Minister for his leadership in ensuring that the United Kingdom Government stands shoulder to shoulder with our allies Israel in the face of yet another attack. But will he agree with me that the first and most pressing mission for Israel so that they can live in safety and security continues to be the necessity to defeat Hamas? And that will, the harsh reality is, that will regard, uh, require an operation in Rafah, whilst every step must be taken to protect civilian life. Will my right honourable friend agree with me that that is the path to peace in the Middle East? Sir. My honourable friend is right to highlight the threat that Hamas poses to the security and safety of the people of Israel. The Foreign Secretary set out in detail our view on the right approach to Rafah from this point forward just a couple of weeks ago. Andy Slaughter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister rightly calls for restraint and de-escalation in the Middle East. Isn't there more chance that his words will carry weight if they advocate a ceasefire by all sides, including the warring parties in Gaza? Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have called for an immediate humanitarian pause in Gaza so that hostages can be released, aid can go in, and for that to form the basis of a more lasting and sustainable ceasefire. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I thank the Prime Minister for his strong international leadership in this area and for his calls for restraint. The Prime Minister will agree that Iran is the dangerous and destabilising player in this region, whether by themselves directly or through their proxies. It's also a despotic medieval regime. There were 853 executions uh, last year, an eight-year high, including 22 women and young women. So as the Prime Minister works urgently with the G7, please would he confirm that no reasonable option should be off the table, including the possible prescription of the the IRGC. Minister. Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, Iran's human rights record remains completely unacceptable. Uh, we've sanctioned almost 100 entities and uh, individuals specifically for human rights violations. For example, we condemn its surging use of the death penalty. And at the 78th UN General Assembly, we co-sponsored the Iran Human Rights Resolution calling for Iran to issue a moratorium on executions. Uh, once again, can I say I am anxious to get everybody in, but I can only do that if the questions are brief. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 33,000 people have died in Gaza. More bombs have been dropped there than were bombed, dropped in the whole of the Iraq war. This weekend's horrific events uh, show just how dangerous it is that there's going to be an escalation into war across the whole region. Does the Prime Minister recognise that the central kernel to the whole issue across the region is the continued Israeli occupation of Palestine? What will he say about bringing about an end to that occupation and a permanent ceasefire? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, you know, of course we want to see and remain committed to a two-state solution and working hard to bring that about. Uh, but the biggest impact on regional instability is the pernicious influence of Iran and nobody else. Kieran Mullen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree that even those that want to link the conflict uh, with between Israel and Hamas and their conduct with this attack have to surely recognise that since its inception, for decades, Iran has sought the destruction not only of our way of life, but of Israel and its people, and that we should never hesitate to play our part in preventing that. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. I also echo the calls for restraint and de-escalation. I was interested in what the Prime Minister said about uh, the diplomatic efforts over the last six months with the Palestinian Authority looking towards a two-state solution. Given the issues are settlements, water, access between Gaza and the West Bank and Jerusalem, what window of opportunity does he think there is with the Netanyahu government to get all parties round the table? Prime Minister. Uh, well, it's something we've continually pushed for, and in the meantime, what we've also focused on is building up the technical administrative capability of the Palestinian Authority so they are in a position to provide effective and strong governance for West Bank uh, and Gaza when the moment arrives when that is possible, something we work very hard to bring about. Janet Davey. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, the United Nations Secretary said. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of devastating full-scale conflict, and now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Does the Prime Minister agree with the United Nations Secretary? And if so, what is the Government Secretary to achieve this as he works with our international allies? Prime Minister. 
Well, of course, we do want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed, which would be deeply destabilising for the region and risk more lives. And that's a message that all government ministers will be taking to their counterparts across the region. Harry Gardner. Iran sought to justify its unjustifiable attack on Israel on the basis that it was retaliating for Israel's attack on its consulate. I welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has said that in his telephone conversation with Prime Minister Netanyahu later today, he will be urging de-escalation. In that telephone conversation, will he set out the measures that the UK will take if, in fact, Israel seeks to retaliate further? So I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals, but we will, of course, calm heads to prevail everywhere across the region. Beth Winter. Uh, Dear Madam Deputy Speaker, at the Security Council last night, the UN General Secretary did warn of the danger of devastating full-scale conflict and called for de-escalation de and maximum restraint. And today, in response, the Foreign Secretary has said there could be, have been thousands of casualties and pressure for an ex escalation of this conflict. Does the Prime Minister agree with this? And does the Prime Minister also agree that the very real tens of thousands of deaths and casualties Israel's military attacks and imposed famine conditions have caused in Gaza are drivers of regional instability? Madam Deputy Speaker, we want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed, which would be deeply destabilising for the region and risk more lives, which is why we're calling on all uh, regional partners to focus on being calm and de-escalating the situation. Alison Toulis. My constituent Sama has been trying to get her mother, her father and her brother out of Gaza since this conflict began. They've been displaced multiple times. They are now in a tent in Rafa. They cannot apply. There is no scheme for them to come to safety in the UK. Uh, and the UK government has this in its hands. It could waive the need for biometrics if the government so decided to. Will the Prime Minister do this and let Samus Farmer come to safety? I, obviously, I'm not aware of the specifics of the Honourable Lady's case, but I'm sure if she writes to the Home Office, they'll be happy to look into it for her. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Four former UK Supreme Court judges and more than 600 lawyers, including over, 600, six, uh, over 60 cases, have warned the Prime Minister that the UK risks breaking international law over a plausible risk of genocide in Gaza if it does not stop its weapons export to Israel. But the Prime Minister is ignoring their warnings and hiding his own government's legal advice on this matter. Why, Prime Minister? No, that's not right, Madam Deputy Speaker. So we have a very uh, robust and rigorous export licensing regime. The Foreign Secretary confirmed last week that the UK's position on export licences is unchanged following the latest assessment and in line with the legal advice. We keep that position under review and always act in accordance with that advice. Abby Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Middle East um, has entered a very dangerous uh, new phase, uh, which can only be resolved by diplomatic and political solutions. So can I push the Prime Minister on what he uh, said earlier in terms of the sanctions that he is considering with international allies um, in relation to um, Iran, including the prescribing of uh, the IRGC? And will he also confirm um, that the UK will not be uh, taking part in any offensive action of Israel's? Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, no, we acted in a defensive uh, capacity and we're discussing with G7 allies further diplomatic measures that can be taken uh, in a coordinated fashion. Stephen Ferry. Thank you. Um, Iran's attack on Israel and the nature of the Iranian regime. The Prime Minister says he wants to see stability in the region, but surely there must be honesty and transparency that Israel itself is a threat to stability and has already systematically broken international humanitarian law. The government has no reluctance in rightly challenging Russia over Ukraine in that regard, but why the reluctance in, in relation to Israel and indeed to publish the associate legal advice? Minister. As I said, I, I don't think there's any equivalence between what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine and what Israel is doing to ensure the security of its citizens in the face of an appalling terrorist attack. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's been over 15 months since it was reported that prescription of the IRGC was imminent. Since then, Iran has continued to fund and supply Hamas, Iran has continued to fund and supply Hezbollah, and Iran has continued to fund and supply the Houthis. Following this continued funding for terror and destabilisation, what more does Iran have to do before the IRGC is prescribed? Prime Minister. Oh, I, as I said, the police, security services and courts all have 
the tools they need to sanction, prosecute and mitigate the threats from Iran. We strengthened our Iran sanctions regime recently and the IRGC is sanctioned in its entirety. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister said in his statement um, that it was important that aid gets into Gaza and then he said a few moments ago that the government was right to take its time to decide on the restoration of funding to UNRWA. Madam Deputy Speaker, the organisational infrastructure of UNRWA is unparalleled and it cannot be replicated. A further delay on the part of the UK Government will cost further lives in a context in which famine is taking hold. Can I urge the Prime Minister to think again and to set out a path today for the restoration of funding to UNRWA? Well, Madam Minister. Deputy Speaker, I know the whole House will have rightly been appalled by the allegations that UNRWA staff were involved in October 7th. We want UNRWA to give detailed undertakings about changes in personnel policy and procedures to ensure that nothing like that could ever happen again. We're working actively with allies to try and bring about this situation to a rapid conclusion. I'll just say we're expecting final reports from the UN and others into what happened by the end of April this month and then intend to clarify the UK's position on funding once we've reviewed those final reports. Israel has indicated that against the advice of the international community, including the UN and the United States, that it intends to respond to Iran's attack. Such a retaliation could tip the region into a catastrophic all-out war. So when persuading Prime Minister Netanyahu against further retaliation. And in terms of leverage, will he say to Israel that should they choose to escalate, there will be no further UK military support for Israel's endeavours in this conflict? Uh, I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman to also condemn Iran for what happened over the weekend, uh, but we will continue to urge de escalation and calm heads to prevail on all sides. Speaker, Iran is, of course, no ally of the UK, and its huge, unprecedented assault on Israel must be called out. But the UK government must now work hard to prevent further escalation of the crisis in an already volatile region. Now, it's a, uh, it, it is a matter of principle that diplomatic premises are not targeted. So, can the Prime Minister confirm what conversations he, had, he has had with the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, about the attack on the uh, Iranian consulate in Syria and whether he plans to discuss that with him? As I said, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will continue to urge de escalation and calm heads to prevail on all sides. Uh, and as Foreign Secretary said this morning, we would urge Israel in particular to recognise that it successfully repelled the Iranian attacks and Iran is ever more isolated on the world stage. Kerry McCarthy. Thank you. Jackie, the mother of the murdered aid worker, James Kirby, is my constituent, and I'm sure she'll agree with the Prime Minister's description of him as a hero. But there's a real danger, which I'm already seeing as events move on, that his death will end up just being chalked up as collateral damage in this conflict. So can I ask the Prime Minister to, to really show that he understands the, that the family need to see justice done? And can he keep up the pressure on Israel about this review? They want to know why he was killed and that someone will be held responsible. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, my condolences to Jackie and the families of all those uh, that were tragically killed as they were delivering aid. As I said, they were heroes and they absolutely deserve our admiration and our thoughts will be with all their families. Um, I'll refer her to my previous answer about what we've asked of the Israelis. And what's crystal clear, though, is there needs to be a considerable improvement in the deconfliction mechanisms between Israel and aid agencies. Uh, that's crystal clear. I've made that point already to Prime Minister Netanyahu and we expect to see that followed through. Christine Jardine. Madam Deputy Speaker, I join my right honourable friend from Kingston and Surbiton in unequivocally uh, condemning the action of the Iranian regime on Saturday and in supporting our RAF in their actions. But my constituents in Edinburgh West, like many others, are concerned that now attention will be taken away from the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza. So can the Prime Minister assure us that when he speaks to the Prime Minister of Israel later today, he impresses upon him not only the need for restraint to restabilise the region, but that he has a unique opportunity now to take steps towards peace by making a gesture with um, promoting a ceasefire and allowing aid into Gaza? 
Our, our position remains unchanged. We continue to want to see an immediate humanitarian pause. So hostages are released, aid goes in, and immediately uh, we want Israel to deliver on its commitments to significantly increase the amount of aid getting into Gaza on the various measures that they've set out. Toby Perkins. You, Madam Deputy Speaker, the question from the right honourable member from North Somerset exposed that there is much more that we could be doing uh, to undermine the murderous Iranian regime. Simultaneously, uh, the way that Israel continues to ignore the United Nations uh, resolution is deeply troubling. Is the Prime Minister worried that his approach risks failing both on Iran and on Israel at the moment? Yeah. No. Uh, no, Madam Deputy Speaker. As we've demonstrated this weekend, the UK is leading with allies, defending our values and our interests, standing together with our friends to bring about regional security. That's good for people in the region, and it's good for people here at home, too. Iran's reckless actions only add more fuel on an already raging fire. So, can I ask the Prime Minister? Uh, will he prescribe the IGC, IR, IRG? Sorry. <laughs> and what assessment has he made of whether bombing a consulate violates international law? What are we doing to uphold this principle in a war that's gone on six months and cost so many lives? I refer the Honourable Lady to any of my previous answers on both of those topics. Ella Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In response to my honourable friend, the Prime Minister said he would take the time to set future approach to UNRWA right. So, as the famine continues, I wonder, Prime Minister, how much time he actually needs before he makes up his mind to restore funding and get aid to the people who need it. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, what the honourable lady failed to mention was the shocking uh, allegations of people being involved in UNRWA, being involved in the, tra the massacre on October 7th. It is right that that is properly investigated and new procedures are put in place to ensure that that could never happen again. Those final reports which have been commissioned are due at the end of April. Once we review those and we're already in dialogue with our partners, we'll set out our future approach. But that's not to say we are not already doing an enormous amount to bring more aid into the region. We've tripled our commitment and right now are delivering aid by land, sea and air. We're taking a leading role and everyone in this House should be incredibly proud of what the UK is bringing to the table. Claudia Webb. Speaker, the action of the Royal Air Force in shooting down Iranian drones and cruise missiles heading to and over Israel over the weekend raises a very serious question. Since the UK is clearly capable of acting to prevent airstrikes in both the region and both the ICJ and the UN Special Rapporteur for Palestine and the occupied territories have implicated Israel in a genocide in Gaza, why isn't the government interested in fulfilling its obligations under international law by protecting Palestinian women and children from Israeli airstrikes, why isn't the government acting to prevent the killing of Palestinians? Uh, well, I just disagree with the Honourable uh, Lady. Whilst, of course, we respect the role and the independence of the ICJ, our view is that Israel's actions in Gaza can simply not be described as a genocide, and that uh, case is not helpful at all in achieving our goal of a sustainable and lasting ceasefire. Matt Weston. Thank you, Madam Speaker, the threat of uh, imminent famine uh, hangs over the people of Gaza. Aid urgently needs to get into the country and to be safely distributed. Uh, will the Prime Minister confirm, with the death of those three UK charity workers working for World Central Kitchen, has he received a written apology from the Prime Minister of Israel? I, I spoke explicitly to the Prime Minister of Israel, who did that when I spoke to him the very next day. We have made absolutely crystal clear our concerns about what has happened, and as I have previously pointed out, are looking now through the preliminary findings. Pleased to see the early dismissal of two or suspension of two officers involved, and now what we need is reform of Israel's deconfliction mechanism to ensure the future safety of aid workers. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In speaking to the Prime Minister of Israel this evening, in calling for restraint, will he put that into action? So, should the Prime Minister call, say that he will further assaults in, in Gaza or indeed impede aid? Will he action that restraint and call for immediate ceasefire? Prime Minister. We have already called for an immediate humanitarian pause so more aid can get in and hostages can be released. And We ourselves as I said, tripled our aid commitment and bringing aid in by air, land and sea together with our allies. Alan Brown. Madam Deputy Speaker, so there has been over 
53,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza, including 14,000 children, 76,000 uh, civilians injured or maimed, 700 health care and aid workers killed. Um, and given there is an ongoing famine, which the UK government, under his watch, is now trying to find ways around the Israeli blockade that is preventing aid going in, is it not in itself an admission that ongoing Israeli actions are disproportionate and should not be calling it out as such? Prime Minister. Uh, we have been consistently clear that we are concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, have called on the Israelis to open, out, uh, open up more aid corridors and have them open more often. They set out a series of steps just recently, and now we want to see them deliver on those. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Middle East is in a crisis, and myself and thousands of my um, Riverside constituents have been calling for a ceasefire to end the destruction in Gaza and prevent um, the widening conflict in the Middle East. The Prime Minister has talked about diplomatic action towards a two-state solution. Can he say what action he's taken against the far-right ministers in the Israeli government who are opposed to a two-state solution? Prime Minister. Well, we have been uh, very clear that our view is that we should have a two-state solution and we are making sure we do everything we can to contribute to that aim. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On the wider humanitarian crisis in Gaza, there is now a famine across the area. And in response to a number of questions from my hon. Friend, the Prime Minister said that I think he said that he's now received the interim report on UNRWA and that in due course he will receive the final report. Will he publish the interim report? And if not, why not? And with Canada, France, Finland, Australia, Sweden and the EU having now restored funding, why does the UK stand alone? Uh, when it comes to UNRWA, it's the UN uh, that is with publishing the expected final reports towards uh, the end of April, and after receiving those, we will clarify and set out the UK's position on future funding. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all thank the Prime Minister very much for his decisive action, his support for uh, Israel, and thank our world-class Royal Air Force for the preventing the further loss of life. Just last week, I had an opportunity to be in, 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 in Israel to, to visit the kibbutz where the people were murdered, innocent Jews, to go to the Nova Musical Festival where over a thousand Israelis were murdered and to speak to some of those families. So, in, in relation to Hamas and their sponsorship, the IRGC, does the Prime Minister agree that Hamas and IRGC can be likened to cancer and to save life uh, throughout the Middle East and retain stability that the cancer of Hamas and IRGC needs to be removed urgently by all means necessary. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is right to point out the destabilising impact of Iran across the region, including action through proxies like Hamas, the Houthis, and others, and we'll do everything we can to counter that threat. Uh, Richard Ford. Thank you. Uh, our constituents will always want us to think about second order consequences of British military action. When the government deployed the RAF to defend civilians in Libya, a full parliamentary debate was held afterwards and a vote was granted to members of this House. This was in line with the Convention that has been observed for most of the last 20 years. Will the government grant members a full debate and a vote on British military action, even after the action has happened? Uh, no, Madam Speaker, I don't believe that's necessary. I'm obviously here answering questions. It's my job to take action where I believe it is necessary, and it's just job of Parliament to hold me accountable for that. But it was right that we move quickly to respond to an immediate and dangerous threat. Publicising any action in advance would undermine the effectiveness of the operation. We acted in line with precedent, and we've also made very clear in public statements that we will not hesitate to protect our allies. I thank the Prime Minister for his uh, statement, and I suspect there will be a slight change of personnel before we, before we move to the state statement from the Secretary of State for Health. Victoria Atkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, with your permission, I would like to make a statement on the CAS review of gender identity services for children and young people. And may I say how pleased I am to be joined uh, by parents of children who have been affected by some of the issues raised in this review, and I hope all of us 
will bear the sensitivities of this debate in mind as we discuss it this afternoon. This review strikes hard and strikes sure at an area of public policy where fashionable cultural values have overtaken evidence, safety and biological reality. This must now stop. As recently as 2009, the NHS's sole gender identity development service at the Tavistock and Portman Trust received fewer than 60 referrals for children and young people and just 15 for adolescent girls. Since then, demand has surged. By 2016, over 1,700 children and young people a year were referred, a 34-fold increase. More than half were teenage girls. In 2022, more than 5,000 children and young people were referred to gender identity clinics, and almost three quarters were female. Madam Deputy Speaker, this exponential increase in demand is not a coincidence. It has been driven by a number of factors, which I will come on to later, but at its heart, it was driven by a myth. This myth was that for children and young people grappling with adolescents who were questioning their identity, their sexuality or their path in life, that the answer to their questions was inevitably to change gender, to solve their feelings of unease, discomfort or distress. And this near uniform prescription was imposed on children and young people with complex needs without full and thoughtful consideration of their wider needs, including, as is set out in the report, conditions such as neurodiversity, experiences such as childhood trauma, or experiences of mental health conditions, or indeed discovering who it is that they may one day fall in love with. Indeed, the response from some of the people who should have protected them, some of the clinicians in charge of their care at the Tavistock Clinic, was almost always to put them on an irreversible path, blocking puberty, then the prescription of cross-sex hormones, and onto surgery as an adult. In other words, such professionals were not asking the right questions of themselves or of their patients. That is why in 2020, with uh, the support of my predecessors, uh, my right honourable friends, the members for West Suffolk and for Bromsgrove, NHS England commissioned Dr Hilary Cass to examine the state of services for children questioning their gender. And I would like to start by thanking Dr Cass and her team for undertaking a considered, comprehensive and courageous review into an extremely contentious area of health care. Since NHS England commissioned the review in 2020, they have unpicked meticulously what went wrong, what the evidence actually shows, and they have recommended how to design a fundamentally different service that better see, serves the needs of children. But I must also thank those who raised the alarm and contributed to the review over the last four years the clinicians who spoke up against their peers to blow the whistle about what was happening at the Tavistock Clinic, even though it risked their careers, the journalists, academics and activists who listened to their stories and investigated further, even when they were derided as bigots and transphobes, the parents who were just trying their best to support their children but were so badly let down by a service that vilified them for questioning whether the interventions offered were the right ones for their children. And of course, the young people themselves who have shared their experiences, including those have, who have gone through the pain of detransitioning, only to find out that the so-called reversible treatments they were offered are not, in fact, reversible. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Cass Review makes for sober reading. It is extremely thorough, and so I will not attempt to cover all of its recommendations today, but I genuinely encourage all honourable and right honourable members to read the report in full. It should concern every single member of this House, 
that part of our public space, the NHS, was overtaken by a culture of secrecy and ideology that was allowed to trump evidence and safety. We say enough is enough. Our young people deserve better and we must do whatever it takes to protect them. Since the publication of Dr Cass's interim report in 2022, a series of important changes have been made, and I want to put on record my thanks to NHS England's Chief Executive Amanda Pritchard and all of those at NHS England who have worked hard with Dr Cass to implement these. On the 31st of March, the Tavistock Clinic finally closed, having stopped seeing patients, uh, new patients a year earlier. Two new regional hubs have been opened in partnership with the country's most prestigious children's hospitals to ensure that children are supported by specialist multidis multidisciplinary teams, and indeed another will follow in Bristol later this year. In the last few weeks, NHS England made the landmark decision to end the routine prescription to children of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria. On the day of publication of Dr Cass's final report, they announced that they are stopping children under 18 from being seen by adult gender services with immediate effect. And an urgent review on clinical policy for cross-sex hormones will now follow without delay. I also welcome NHS England's plans to bring forward their full review of adult services, including Dr Cass's recommendation for a follow-through service for young people up to the age of 25. I also share Dr Cass's concerns that clinicians who subscribe to gender ideology will try to use private providers to get around the rules. Let me give a very clear warning. Prescribing is a highly regulated activity, and the Care Quality Commission has not licensed any gender clinic to prescribe hormone blockers or cross-sex hormones to people under the age of 16. Any clinic that does may be committing extremely serious regulatory offences for which they can have their licence revoked and their clinicians can be struck off. My officials have been in contact with the CQC following the final report to ask that they look again at the age thresholds in their licensing conditions. The CQC has also reassured us that they will incorporate Dr Cass's recommendations into their safe care and treatment standards for all care providers. This means that all new providers will be asked if their practices respect the Cass review and all existing providers have to meet the same rigorous standards when they are reviewed by the CQC. My officials met the General Medical Council over the weekend and will do so again in the coming days to understand how uh, they will ensure every clinician on their register follows their code of practice and implements the wider findings of the CAS review. It is morally and medically reprehensible that some online providers not registered in the UK have stated their intention to continue to issue prescriptions to children in this country, and I am looking closely at closing what can be done to cur curtail any loopholes in prescribing practices, including legislative options. Nothing is off the table, and I will update the House in due course as we progress this work at pace. Dr Cass also found that there was a lack of robust data on what happened to the 9,000 children who were treated by gender identity services between 2009 and 2020. Many went on to continue their treatment at adult clinics, and the University of York had been due to research the long-term long consequences of treatment they received as children so that we can properly support them through their journey into adulthood. It was expected to provide important insights into the clinic's work, including how many patients detransitioned, how many were also diagnosed with a mental health condition or uh, an autism spectrum disorder. We took this government the unprecedented step of changing the law to make it possible for adult gender clinics to share medical data with the university. All bar one of the adult gender clinics refused to cooperate with this vital research. This is unacceptable, to quote Dr Cass. I'd go even further. I think it is deplorable. 
It is a dereliction of their professional duty. And so I am pleased to update the House that following the publication of Dr Cass's report, I have been informed that all seven clinical leads for the adult gender services now intend to fully participate in this important work. Dr Cass also concludes that a cultural shift alone does not adequately explain the huge growth in young women being referred to gender services. She paints an alarming picture of digitally engaged young women who are frequently exposed to pornography, involving violent, coercive, degrading and pain-inducing acts. Is it any wonder that more and more of them are looking for ways to opt out of becoming women? This is deeply troubling, and as Dr Cass makes clear, we have a duty to support these young women with considered evidence-based care. Madam Deputy Speaker, our children deserve health care that is compassionate, caring and careful. Their safety and uh, well-being must come above any other concern, and anyone who threatens it must be held to account. I will work with NHS England to root out the ideology that has caused so much unnecessary harm, to support those who have already received life-altering treatment, to give the next generation access to holistic care and to protect our children's futures. Anything less would be neglecting our duty to the next generation. This will not happen under this government, and it will not happen under my watch. I commend this statement to the House. Shadow Secretary of State, West Street. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I begin by thanking the Secretary of State for advance sight of her statement, and even more importantly, thanking Dr Hilary Cass and her team for the thoughtful and thorough way in which they have undertaken their work. She has navigated the complexities and sensitivities of this subject with academic rigour, providing an evidence-led framework for children to receive the best possible health care. I also want to pay tribute to journalists like Hannah Barnes and the whistleblowers who together helped shine a light on what was going on at the Tavistock Clinic. At the heart of the complexity around this issue, are two things which are true simultaneously. There are trans adults in this country who have followed a medical pathway and who say that for all the pain and difficulty that involved, it wasn't just life-affirming, it was life-saving. There are also people in this country who followed a medical pathway who say it was a disaster, that it ruined their lives irreversibly, and they ask how anyone could have let this happen. For the sake of all of those children, young people and now adults, but particularly those being referred into gender identity services today, we have a duty to get this right. What has emerged in the CAS review is a scandal. It is a scandal that children and young people are waiting far too long, often years, for care while their well-being deteriorates and their childhood slips away. It is scandalous that medical interventions have been made on the basis of shaky evidence. It is scandalous that, despite all this, some NHS providers refused to cooperate with Dr Cass's review. And perhaps the worst scandal of all is that the toxicity of this discussion means that people have felt silenced, and it required investigative journalism to prompt this review taking place. This is particularly This particularly vulnerable group of children and young people are at the wrong end of all of the statistics for mental ill health, suicide and self-harm. There is no doubt that they have been very badly let down. So we owe it to them to approach this discussion with the same care and sensitivity with which Dr Cass undertook her review. There are parts of this report which will sound familiar to anyone acquainted with the NHS today. Children and young people face unacceptably long waiting lists. They are unable to get the help, mental health support and assessments they require. The services face significant staff shortages, with a lack of workforce planning driving all of it. As with so many parts of the NHS today, this report paints a picture of a service unable to cope with demand. Dr Cass is clear that care must be personal and holistic. So can the Secretary of State set out how she plans to cut waiting times for assessments for mental health 
and neurodevelopmental conditions. Waiting lists are so bad in some cases that children are passing into adulthood before they have had their first appointment with gender identity services, leaving them facing a cliff edge. CAS recommends follow-through services up to the age of 25 to ensure continuity of care. Can the Secretary of State provide an indication of how long she thinks it will take to establish these services? Madam Deputy Speaker, Labour welcomed the decision taken by NHS England last month to stop the routine prescription of puberty blockers to under-18s. The loophole that now exists for private providers risks sparking a black market. The Secretary of State has said she expects private clinics to follow the recommendations in this report, indeed to follow the evidence. Can I underline our support for her expectations on compliance? And can she give an indication as to whether she thinks further regulation may be needed to ensure adequate enforcement of the recommendations? Madam Deputy Speaker, the refusal of adult gender services to share data of the long-term experience of patients is inexcusable, as the Secretary of State said, and I agree, it is deplorable. The data does not belong to them. It belongs to the NHS and, crucially, to patients. Of course, I welcome that they are now coming forward, but I also ask the Secretary of State how this was allowed to happen and what accountability she thinks would be appropriate. Madam Deputy Speaker, this report must provide a watershed moment for the NHS's gender identity services. Children's health care should always be led by evidence and in the best interests of children's welfare. Dr Cass's report has provided the basis on which to go forward. The report must also provide a watershed moment for the way in which our society and our politics discuss this issue. There are, there are there are children and young people in this country and adults, including trans children and young people and adults, who are desperately worried and frightened by the toxicity of this debate. There are healthcare professionals who are scared to do their job and make their views known. And Dr Cass has said, and I quote, toxic, ideological and polarised public debate has made the work of the review significantly harder and she says it will hamper the research that is essential to finding a way forward. So, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I say that in, even in this, a general election year, there is surely one issue on which we can down tools and work together, and that is in pursuit of the health care of vulnerable people. And, and can I also pay tribute to the right honourable member for Bromsgrove? We have many scraps across the dispatch box, but for his role in commissioning this review, he deserves our thanks and respect, and I hope that I can work constructively with the Health Secretary to put children's health and well-being above the political fray. Chief State. I welcome all of those who have changed their minds about this critical issue. Because in order to move forward and get on with the vital work that Dr Cass recommends, we need more people to face up to the truth no matter how uncomfortable that makes them feel. And so I say to the honourable gentleman opposite me, I hope he has the humility to understand that the ideology he and his colleagues espoused was part of the problem. He talks about the culture and the toxicity of the debate. Does he understand the hurt that he caused to people when he told uh, them to just get over it? Does he know that when his, he and his friends on the left spent the last decade crying culture wars where legitimate concerns were raised, an atmosphere was in, of intimidation was in, created and had the impact on the workforce that he has rightly described? They were scared or worried to go into it. And does he now have the good grace to apologise to those who have been maligned in public life, including his own female colleagues? Yeah and for the chilling effect that this has had on clinicians, journalists and campaigners who were trying to raise the alarm. I say this because I, you know, I want to believe the Honourable Gentleman when he says he has turned a corner on this. We now have to start with a new page for the sake not just 
of the um, children and young people that we are looking after, but also for the sakes of their families, many of whom will be watching this, living with the consequences of this ideology and this secrecy, wondering how on earth uh, the Honourable Gentleman is talking about general elections, when for them, every single day, every single minute that their children have to live with the treatment they have dealt with, uh, it will never, ever be reversed. Dame Jackie Doyle Price. That was fantastic. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, this report is clearly very welcome, but has frankly been a long time coming. But one of the issues I'd really like to put to my right honourable friend is really the whole failure of governance that this uh, shows. NHS England's specialist commissioning in particular require a challenge here, because what was initially commissioned, as she's explained, as a treatment course for a small amount of people, has been allowed to expand unchecked and without any, any consideration of the ethics of what was being done to children. So can she tell me what she's going to do to make sure that doesn't happen again? And secondly, the tabby stock clearly enjoyed the popularity that it was brought to that institution by being at the front end of what was seen as a cutting edge set of, of treatments. Uh, frankly, the governors allowed that to get in the way of what they should have been doing, which was patient safety. So could she also tell me what she prefers to do about that too? Uh, may I thank my honourable friend, who uh, in uh, her parliamentary career has done so much to shine a light on this sort of behaviour, but also the worries that she has espoused, uh, both publicly and privately, about the uh, children and the young people at the heart of this. Uh, so, in terms of what we are looking to the future, uh, the Tavistock Clinic has shut. It stopped, as I say, admitting patients a year ago. These new services that are already in place, the two new hubs, but of course the plans to expand further across the country, is about ensuring ensuring that we have a multidisciplinary approach to these young people so that exactly the um, experiences that Dr Cass sets out so starkly in her re report, all of those uh, con conditions are treated so that children are treated as human beings, as patients, not as siloed conditions. One of the main problems uh, that emerged uh, with the Tavistock behaviour and the, the way that it took place is that uh, gender, trans gender ideology was, or gender uh, um, questioning was siloed in a way that no other health or mental health condition was and we want to move back to a place where clinicians are no longer scared of looking after children and young people with these issues, that they see it as part of their general practice, their general work. That is how we are best going to address the very complex needs of many of these children and young people. SNP spokesperson Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful for advance sight of the statement. Madam Deputy Speaker, nobody's identity should be up for debate, nor should it be used as a political football. Indeed, Dr Cass said in her report, polarisation and stifling of debate do nothing to help the young people caught in the middle of a stormy social discourse, and in the long run will also hamper the research that is essential to finding the best way of supporting them to thrive. And that polarisation is the last thing needed by young people in accessing care, their families and the NHS staff working hard to care for them. I wonder if the Secretary of State agrees that we must all remain respectful at all times when discussing these important issues and that decisions on this and any other type of treatment should rightly be made by clinicians and not by politicians. Dr Cass explicitly makes the point that her report is not about questioning trans identities or rolling back access to healthcare for trans young people. Indeed, supporting and improving the gender identity healthcare system for all, including children and young people, is what we should be focused on. So I wonder if she can confirm today whether any additional funding will be made available to ensure that young trans people can access the quality healthcare that they need and deserve. And finally, on conversion practices, the Government Equalities Office said last month in an answer to a written question that the Government expects to deliver a draft bill that takes account of the independent cash review. So can she provide an update on what conversations she's had with Cabinet colleagues on how the cash review will influence the UK Government's legislative proposals on banning conversion practices and when these are expected to be published? Secretary of State. So, um, may I urge both the Scottish uh, National Party in Scotland and indeed Labour in uh, Wales, because of course health is devolved in uh, those countries, uh, may I encourage them to respond as quickly as possible to the findings of this review? She asked me whether it's barnetised. For these purposes, our work to ensure that these clinics meet the needs of uh, our uh, 
population in England is not additional money, but we are reprioritising within NHS budgets to ensure that um, these services are spread across the country. I would encourage the Scottish nationalists to uh, prioritise the needs of their children and young people in the same way. I would also gently make the point that when it comes to uh, the atmosphere of this debate, I do not believe it has been helped by the SNP's highly controversial Hate Crime and Public Order Act. Uh, and I note, for example, the um, Twitter t- uh, behaviour and engagement on Twitter of very, very high-profile people uh, within um, uh, Scotland and the impact that that has had, uh, where people have dared to name uh, activists in this arena. I would also ask the Labour Party and the uh, Scottish Labour Party to explain to us why it is that they helped the SNP pass that Act, because to me this is all about the atmosphere. Uh, Chair of the Equalities Committee, Caroline Notes. Madam Deputy Speaker, Dr Cass's observations around violent and degrading pornography are chilling, and we know the impact that is having not just on young girls, but actually on all our young people. But her recommendations specifically include significant references to expanded services and follow-through services for 17 to 25-year-olds. Can I ask my right honourable friend what concern she has regarding the capacity for that, and what impact that might have for other areas of healthcare. We know that the transition from children's services to adult services can be problematic in a wide range of services, not least for those suffering from body dysmorphia, those suffering from eating disorders. So can my right honourable friend explain whether there might be any crossover where we could see young people then accessing some sort of interim service before the age of 25? And is there going to be more funding committed so that we can see those services and so that we don't, as all of us will face in our constituencies, see the horror of young people not able to access CAM services before they turn 18 and then become reliant on adult (coughs) mental health care? Well, um, may I thank uh, my right honourable friend, and uh, she is absolutely right to identify uh, the cohort of young people between the ages of 17 and 25 as being of particular concern now that we have a clear path in relation to the treatment of uh, children uh, and young people under the age of um, 17, uh, I have now asked NHSE to focus primarily on that next cohort because, again, speaking to parents, uh, one can only get a very real sense of the concerns they have as to the, uh, the word cliff edge has been used by them uh, as to the, um, the cliff edge between children and young person services and adult services. For this very, very vulnerable group of uh, young people, I do not want uh, that to be the case. And so we will see over the coming um, months work developed by NHSE to help this cohort. But I think she has a sense of just how transformational not just this report with its evidence is, but also the challenges that that uh, means that for our health service in England and how we choose to respond to it. In terms of funding, NHS England has committed more than £17 million to the two new hubs uh, in this financial year. I hope and expect that our devolved administrations will uh, commit similar sums of money to look after the children and young people in their areas. Uh, Dame Nia Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, she speaks there of the need to have multi-site centres and the fact that two hubs have already been put in place. Could you tell us a little bit more about what plan she has to expand to make it multi-site and when that's likely to happen? Uh, Very much so. We have started, as I say, with the two sites. We hope to expand uh, to Bristol uh, later this year, and there will be a further three or four sites across uh, the uh, country of England. However, and this is a really important part of the report, this isn't just about specialist services. This is about giving clinicians the confidence to um, practice uh, with, you know, to, to look after children and young people who may well be presenting at their clinics or their surgeries with this as one of a number of uh, conditions. Uh, and we want to give them back that confidence and that comfort that they do not have to just go down this narrow pathway of specialist services. Of course, that will be appropriate for many, but we want to treat the whole of the child, not just this particular condition in the way that ha- has happened in the past. Dr Caroline Johnson. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And first, I must declare my interest as a practicing NHS consultant for paediatrician, whose practice sometimes involves caring for children with the conditions we've been describing this afternoon. Um, the report is very sobering reading of an example of where ideology has been allowed to trump evidence and safeguarding. And I want to bring the Secretary of State to one particular example, which is where um, individuals have thwarted attempts of the CAS report to do research into, into understanding better the outcomes for some children. I'm really pleased to hear they're now cooperating. But we do have a situation where, if you look at the uh, letter at the end of the CAS report, appended to it from John Stevens, Stewart, sorry, the um, National Specific uh, Specialised Commissioning Director. He says that the NHS England wrote to all NHS trusts, chief executive and medical directors, and that yet still this data was not released. The duties of a doctor, as per the GMC, state that doctors should engage with colleagues to maintain and improve quality and safety of care. So, I ask the Secretary of State, who exactly blocked this data research? What, in, what investigation is going to be done to find out who was individually responsible and how will they individually be held accountable yeah, for yeah, their yeah, actions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was it possible in the first place for this de them to do so? And what is she doing to ensure that data cannot be blocked in this way in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm extremely grateful to my honourable friend who brings her clinical expertise and experience into this chamber in this very, very uh, important debate. Um, in terms of the precise questions of who do, did what when, uh, I hope she'll understand it. I've, I've been working uh, at pace over the last few days with this report. I have asked these questions and I will update the House uh, when I'm in a position to do so. But I would draw the House's attention back to the expectation, not just the moral expectation, but the professional expectation for the medical profession now, in light of this review and the evidence it has produced, is that, med that clinicians and medical professionals will act in accordance with these recommendations, which will mean that when regulators look at the conduct of uh, medical professionals, they are doing so against this backdrop and against these expectations, so that if if there are uh, people who are operating under the misguided apprehension that uh, their ideology trumps this evidence, then I wholly and fully expect the regulators to crack down on that. Uh, I am very anxious to make sure that everybody um, can get in, because I know it's an important statement. But we do need to make sure that the, the questions are brief, so the Secretary of State is able to be brief in response. We do have a big debate um, on the Rwanda bill, followed by another debate um, on the hospice movement, and I'm sure that uh, many of those colleagues will be wanting to participate in those as well. So perhaps if we can just bear that in, in mind in thinking of the questions. Uh, Rosie Duffield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for her thoughtful and considered statement on the CAS review, especially in mentioning the journalists such as my friend Hannah Barnes, who blew the whistle on the Tavistock Clinic. As she says, those who've raised this issue over the last few years, desperately concerned about the safeguarding of vulnerable children and young people, too young to make life-changing decisions, are owed a heartfelt apology for being no platformed, ghosted, sidelined and disciplined at the behest of a few extreme groups of activists, some within political parties. Does she agree that academics, politicians, writers, psychologists, psychologists, actors and anyone questioning their workplaces signing up to Stonewall Law have now been vindicated by Dr Cass's expert review and does she agree that they should be apologised to? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I come to the uh, dispatch box with huge admiration for the Honourable Lady, uh, for the, uh, the, the commitment she and others on uh, the Labour backbenchers have shown, even though they were doing so in a, in a culture and an atmosphere where their views were um, 
demeaned, they were sneered at, they were castigated for so doing. Indeed, I hear rumours that uh, there were efforts made to remove certain members from the party itself. This is why, this is the moment now for uh, apologies, for humility, but also for us to have start with a clean page and ensure that when perfectly reasonable questions are asked about the medical treatment of our children, those questions are allowed to be asked in an atmosphere of respect and understanding so that these very, very vulnerable children and young people are looked after in a caring and careful way. Uh, Miriam Cates. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, and I, I warmly welcome the CAS review and its findings and an extraordinarily strong statement from my wrong, uh, right honourable friend. I have no doubt uh, that what happened at JIDS will go down as one of the worst safeguarding and uh, medical scandals of our generation. But I want to pay tribute to the very brave parents, including those in the Bayswater Support Group, who have been raising concerns about this for years, raising concerns about the ethics and the safety of putting vulnerable children on irreversible and unevidenced medical pathways to achieve something that can never be achieved, which is to change yeah, their sex. Yeah, yeah. But those who spoke up for the interests of children and, frankly, for the interests of common sense were labelled bigots, transphobes, transphobes and even fascists. Yeah. And even after those concerns were raised and Dr Cass was commissioned, the Tavistock was allowed to continue to practice, which was a shocking suspension of the precautionary principle. This scandal happened because too many adults put their own desire for social approval mm. above the safety of vulnerable children. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. can we make sure that that does not happen again? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as my honourable friend was asking that question, there were people on the benches opposite tutting her. Yeah. And that shows that whilst some understand the need to keep this debate about the clinical and compassionate needs of these children, there are still people on the bunches opposite who don't get it. Yeah. And, and the idea that the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, for example, would sign a charter in 2020 describing bodies like the Women's Place UK, which campaigns, dare I say it, for single-sex single rape refugees, something that the House knows I have an enormous commitment to, that apparently is trans-exclusionist hate groups. That sort of language is the language that needs to be apologised for so that we can all move on, because we are expecting clinicians, we are expecting medical professionals to do the right thing by this report and by our children and young people. There needs to be some leadership from all of us in, the, in public life to ensure that we are setting the right examples to those people. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, at its heart, the cash report, sadly, um, highlights the lack of care or the, la or the low standard of care uh, for our young people. Yeah. That they were caught yeah. up in a toxic debate, mm -hmm. there were long waiting lists, and indeed that debate seeped into the staffing of the medical profession. So would the, the Secretary of State agree with me now that we have to look at the well-being of our children, look at it holistically, and could she tell us how she's going to overcome the recruitment problems and the staffing problems that have been created by this toxic debate? May, may I thank the Honourable Lady, if I may say so, someone else, actually, who has an exemplary record of campaigning on this. Um, the, this comes down to the uh, very, very careful review that Dr Cass has herself written. It, it, we have to get away from this idea that if a child presents with gender distress, uh, that that is the only part of their health that we care about that we look into? Of course not. We have to look across the board to ensure that we are looking after every single part of them and also not assuming that medical pathways are the only and inevitable uh, pathway for them. I think one of the problems and one of the concerns that have been raised about the, you know, the, the terrible, terrible mental health um, that many children and young people suffer uh, in, in, these, in this report is that that wasn't being looked after. They were just put on these drugs and expected to get on with it, if you like. And that is wrong, and we are determined to change that. Paul Bristow. Deputy Speaker, what was the Secretary of State's reaction to the news that almost all gender clinics refuse to cooperate with the CAS review? And does she agree that this is a too important issue for a circle the wagons attitude? What can she do to ensure that government guidance is followed to the letter 
and in spirit when we tackle a gender ideology that seems to be running rampant through our public institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is not about my emotions, but I can tell the Honourable Gentleman I was disgusted and I was angry. And what is more to me, this is about um, the, our public space our public space being able to have these conversations and if, for example, a, mem- uh, a part of our public institutions, whether it's uh, NHS, schools or whatever, are asked to respond to a very, very thoughtful and careful review such as this, then of course they must do so mm-hmm. because this information doesn't belong to them. It belongs to their patients. It belongs to future patients because we want to shape the services to help them. And it belongs to us uh, as a nation. And so for me, the, uh, the welcome about turn that they were now going to provide this data happened. I'm pleased it's happened, but my goodness me, I wish they'd done it earlier. Uh, Dawn Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Thank you. Speaker. Um, all trans children and young people deserve access to high quality, timely health care and support. Mm. There are around 100 studies that have not been included in this CAS report, and we need to know. Um, why. The the Minister obviously is not concerned about the way the CAS report has been used to uh, perpetuate a broader hostile environment towards trans people in the UK, created in part by the government's delay to the GRA. Misrepresenting the report and this high and mighty attitude from the Minister helps no one. Will the Minister commit to extra funding needed to help young people have a holistic approach to their health care pathway? So I'm not quite clear whether the Honourable Lady supports this report or is castigating it. I, 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 I'm, I have no idea whether she supports it or not. What, what is interesting, however, is that we are trying, with this review, a very thorough review, a very thoughtful review, those are the words of her uh, front bench spokesman, um, that with this review we are trying to use this evidence to help clinicians treat our young people and children in a compassionate, caring way. That I've noticed, and I've had it reported to me uh, by others who have been watching this, that there is, there, uh, certain um, campaigners are trying to build up a head of steam that this report is somehow flawed. It is not. This is superb evidence, and we are asking, and uh, the NHS has assured us, they're going to be acting on it. Uh, Jason McCartney. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The CAS review highlights the deterioration in mental health in young people. Um, It particularly highlights the impact of social media, putting awful pressures on young people. Uh, The mental health crisis is obviously in both boys and girls, but particularly, as she highlighted earlier, in girls and young women. Will the Secretary of State continue to turbocharge and give CAMS crisis teams the resources they desperately need to support our young people. Um, may I thank my friend for his question? Uh, we we want to help not just with crisis support, but to stop our, uh, help prevent our young people from getting into the position of crisis in the first place. And so we are rolling out uh, mental health support teams ahead of our schedule, actually, across schools. That's a really important piece of work that will be helping uh, already, we think, 44% of the, of the student population. We want to, of course, go even further. And we have uh, increased the number of children and young people aged under 18 through NHS funded mental health services uh, from the 12 month period ending the Mar- March 2021 20- to some 758,000 children. Of course we want that support to be there both in the community but also importantly to help clinicians understand that this is just one of uh, several sets of conditions that they should have confidence to work on to look after the child holistically. Sammy Wilson. Given the vile campaigns which are directed towards anyone who disagrees with the the uh, transgender lobby, I think that we should congratulate Dr Cass and her team for having the courage to make the, the, the report which they have made. And also, I've got to say to the Minister today, for her robust defence yeah, of that yeah. report as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, given the, the, in, in light of the report, and given the fact that it seems that the transgender lobby has infiltrated the NHS in England, 
What steps is she taking to purge that lobby from the uh, NHS? And also, what discussions has she had with ministers in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales to ensure that the same policies and practices are not carried out in the public and private sectors there? Mm -hmm. I say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the reason I'm able to be so robust on this is because I believe it. I believe it. And so this, uh, which may be different from others, um, this, uh, the challenge that he rightly puts, though, to uh, NHS England is that we have to ensure that uh, it is acting as an organisation, but also at an individual and local level, to implement the evidence and the reforms that this report recommends. Uh, I, I would, I just want to be, I want to be fair in, you know, to clinicians, medical professionals, managers, and others who very much support this review. And so, I want to help support them bring about the recommendations and um, issues as to what individual clinicians may or may not have done in the past will be a matter for. Both both NHS England but also regulators going forward. The moral and the professional expectation is that in future, clinicians, medical professionals, all of us will respect the evidence and the recommendations of this important report. Angela Richardson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to Dr Hilary Cass for her thoughtful and comprehensive review. Uh, does my right honourable friend agree with me um, that those of us across this House who for the last few years have been calling for a pause to wait for CAS um, because of concerns, not with the L, the G, the B, but the T element of the banning of the conversion therapy. Does she believe that we have been completely vindicated in our call? Yeah. Well, again, may I thank my honourable friend very sincerely uh, for um, her, uh, her help in raising these difficult questions and doing so, as she has just demonstrated, in a very thoughtful and careful manner. I know she shares my concern that the children and young people at the heart of this should be our focus and that we need to build the system around them rather than them being slotted in to the system as has happened in the past. In terms of uh, conversion therapy, and again I'm being very, very um, mindful of the sensitivities of, that, of this, we um, are committed to supporting all victims of conversion practices, uh, but we do want to avoid any unintended consequences and assure that the draft bill takes account of the independent CAS review. And so that is why uh, my uh, Cabinet counterpart, Minister for Women and Equalities, is leading the work in this area and very much considering this very complex issue as part of our approach to this sensitive and important matter. Antonia Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the starting point of all modern medicine must be robust and reliable evidence, in fact, rigorous. Back in 2017, I put in a written question because, at the request of my trans constituent, they were concerned that many, many adults and young people were putting themselves through a process and it wasn't the right one for them. That was 2017, Secretary of State. And we still haven't had much better data, and the data is the most important thing that we know that informs everything. There has been a chilling effect in this chamber, there has been a chilling effect on social media for people that have spoken out, that have asked questions like that, questions you ask for everyday healthcare, and we have denied that, and the government has denied that for the children in our care. So please, Secretary of State, the member for Ilford North has been fantastic. He has shown great maturity and reflection on his comments in the Chamber and in the media. So has the Secretary of State. But please, from one that has been at the other end of this to the Secretary of State, let's absolutely get the tone right of this debate and let's absolutely move forward. The CAS report is a great thing. We have to work with it to deliver the best outcomes for the children in our care. Well, again, I approach the dispatch box with humility because I know the journey and the debates and the questions that she has put forward, not just on behalf of that particular constituent, but on the wider issue of women and the treatment of women within uh, uh, health care, but also um, other parts of public life. Um, I've, I very much want us to view the future as a clean sheet so that we can 
build the, the services around the children, as I say, rather than expecting them to slot in to the convenience of some of the arguments that have been put forward in the past. But there is, and I think we have to acknowledge this, this has been such a long and toxic debate that there will be people who want answers. And I appreciate the fact that the Honourable Gentleman opposite uh, has uh, walked back some of his comments, but I do think it is important we acknowledge the toxicity so that we can move on and achieve exactly what she and I and others around the chamber. And interestingly, the people opposite are, sh are now, big, you know, they're now chanting from a sedentary position. Um, interesting that I, I think we can make a real change, but a little less sniping from the sidelines, a little more constructive work is what is needed. Nick Fletcher. Enough to speak it. I have called out this ideology locally and here in Westminster with colleagues at every opportunity available to me. At last, it appears the world is waking up to this issue. Sadly, we know of at least 9,000 children who have been affected by this scandal, possibly damaged for life. So firstly, I ask the Minister if she will establish a public inquiry into this issue. Secondly, alongside reforms to the NHS, we must re-establish safeguarding in schools. Will the Minister liaise with the education colleagues to fix our statutory safeguarding yeah. guidance, yeah. keeping children safe in education? This currently downplays the risk factor yeah. around a child identifying as trans. It must be addressed. And finally, I believe there are many bad actors who have paddled this nonsense, yeah. clearly knowing what they were doing while destroying our young people's lives. Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe if there is any justice, these individuals should feel the full weight of the law. I hope they are quaking in their boots. They ought to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, may I thank my honourable friend for um, his uh, um, powerful intervention just now and his question. I'm going to deal, if I may, with the point about the public inquiry because I know there are some who are asking whether that would be appropriate. I hope, I, will he take it from me that what I'm trying to do at the moment, bearing in mind that the report landed uh, less than a week ago, I am determined to drive forward the actions that are needed on the ground uh, to help children and young people. <laughs> I think actually we've had a four year review into this. You know, Dr. Cass has gathered a great deal of evidence. It is a very, very thorough review. And so for the moment, I want to concentrate on implementing these recommendations and on ensuring that the services are brought up to the standards he rightly understands. And on his second point, of course I will liaise with my right honourable friend in education. Again, this is about helping all public sector professionals uh, ensure that they are uh, acting on the evidence as set out in the CAS review for the sake of our children and young people. Joanna Cherry. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I warmly welcome this statement? It's not something she will often hear from me. But as she said, the CAS report has vindicated the concerns of many whistleblowers, including feminists and LGB activists, who warned of the consequences for children of unevidenced medical interventions and the ideological capture of the NHS. Now, for doing so, we and because I was part of this, we were defamed and hounded by organisations that many of us had formerly supported, yep. like Stonewall, yep. Mermaids, Pink News, who I had to yes. sue for defamation, and the misnamed Equality Network in Scotland. Now, to their shame, members of this House and members of the other place joined in this bullying and groupthink. So while I hear what she has to say about a public inquiry and about her immediate focus, being on implementing the recommendations. It does seem to me that we do need a public in inquiry yes. into how this institutional capture happened in our public bodies. And as we all know, it's not just the NHS, because we need to make sure that never again do ideologues of any sort or science deniers take hold of our public institutions. So when she's done with implementing the recommendations, or as she's doing that, will she support 
the movement for a public inquiry into these matters. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm conscious um, I've just answered that, but can I also put on record my thanks and uh, my respect for everything that the Honourable Lady has done in this field? She has, at times, had to walk a very, very lonely path, and I find it, Madam Deputy Speaker, extraordinary that parliamentarians elected by our constituents to represent the best interests of our constituents and, indeed, uh, of our uh, countries um, uh, would fa- find themselves under that sort of pressure for simply stating biological fact and so I hope she will be working uh, with me to ensure that the recommendations that are in the CAS review are applied not just in England but in Scotland, in Wales and I know in Northern Ireland as well. Steve Double. Thank you very much Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome this report and uh, also very much welcome the very strong Uh, statement by the Secretary of State in response to it. If there is one thing that should be above party politics, that should be above political ideology, that should be above cultural trends or virtue signalling, it should be the welfare of our young people. And this report lays bare that, sadly, that is exactly what has been happening. But this ideology has not only captured part of our NHS, it is found in many of our public sector institutions. So can I ask the Secretary of State, who has clearly taken a very strong leadership position on this today, if she will ensure that across government that the findings of this report are implemented in education, in local government, in social services, in our police force, to ensure that this can never happen again? thank my honourable friend and, and say to him that I view this, you know, sorry, I'm not using a prop, I apologise, Madam Deputy, but this report sets out the evidence. You know, the evidence was not there before. It has taken four long years of very, very hard work to gather it. It is now there, and I hope uh, and expect certainly that the um, health se- sector will um, take, uh, implement these recommendations, but also actually that we can have a conversation about our wider public space. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased uh, to read over the weekend the article by my ministerial my cabinet colleague, uh, the Minister for Women and Equalities. I do think there is, we have got to depoliticise the public space and ensure that um, these principles, this evidence, is applied across the board for the health of all of our uh, constituents and our country. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you uh, very much. Look, I I welcome any research and this report that moves the debate forward. My reading of Cass is that she says there was a toxic debate on both sides, that there were people particularly nasty and vicious on all sides. I've had posters put outside my house with rude words on them, etc., etc. It has happened on all sides. That's what Cass says, that it is unhelpful. She says it seems to be little evidence that there is large numbers of regret, but there is little evidence on large numbers of success either. There is poor evidence of effectiveness. There needs to be more evidence on the usefulness of social transition. To me, I read it, that there needs to be an awful lot of more evidence. But what she's clear is that young people shouldn't be denied access to health care if they are trans. In fact, they should have more health care and more pathways. So will the minister agree to fund research into this, not just getting the evidence from adult services, but proper research, longitudinal studies that can mean that we are evidence-based? And will the government support an amendment that would be cash compliant to my conversion practices bill that I believe can square this circle? I'm sorry, but uh, there is, I think, a certain amount of disbelief um, in the chamber because I cannot be the only one who remembers the debate of January 2023, where the uh, member opposite not only uh, tried to shout down female colleagues on his side of the house, but felt so exercised about the debate, which was the uh, to do with, I should say, Scottish, the Scottish Gender Recognition Act. He crossed the floor of the house to come and sit on the bench next to my honourable friend for Penistone and Stocksbridge. And I remember just how those of us on this side of the House were genuinely surprised that a Member of Parliament would think it was appropriate to behave in that way when debating something um, that we are are entitled and should feel free to debate. So um, I'm sorry to hear that he has suffered the abuse he describes, but 
setting a good example starts at home. And would I, I hope he won't ever behave as he did in the chamber that day, because that's how we uh, sort out this toxi toxicity of debate. Mm. Uh, Douglas Ross. Deputy Speaker, the response from the Scottish Government to the Cast Review has been one of deafening silence. In fact, SNP ministers have buried their head in the sand and said nothing at all proactively about the review or its conclusions and recommendations. Indeed, the Scottish Conservative request to have a statement in the Scottish Parliament about the Cast Review has so far been refused by the SNP Green Government, so I welcome the opportunity to be able to speak about it here in the UK Parliament. The Minister mentioned in her statement the recent decision by NHS England to end the routine prescription of puberty blockers to children. However, that is still available in Scotland. Can I ask her what discussions she has had, uh, have there been any, with Scottish Government Ministers and the UK Government on this issue, or indeed between officials in NHS Scotland and NHS England? Um, may I thank my honourable friend for his careful and considered uh, question on this. Um, I very much hope that uh, the uh, Scottish National Government will look at the evidence into this very carefully and uh, find the recommendations to their liking. As I say, it is to NHS England's credit that they have acted so promptly, and I would hope and expect that the devolved nations, led by the Scottish National Party and indeed the Labour Party in Wales, will follow with similar speed. I do note, however, and I've had to refer to it because I'm afraid it is in line with the atmosphere uh, in which clinicians are having to operate, this Hate Crime and Public Order Act brought forward by the Scottish National Government, supported by Scottish Labour, cannot help uh, with the uh, considered debate that we wish to have about this very, very complex subject. And I would encourage them to look at that as part of their uh, overall approach to this. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the CAS review and I welcome her recommendations. Mistakes have been made that must never happen again. But the polarised public debate she mentions reflects badly on this house. Yeah, yeah. So does the minister agree that making jokes about trans people yeah. and trans children mm -hmm. is cruel yeah. and cheapens the debate mm -hmm. and moves yeah. the focus away from ensuring that all of our young people yeah. get the help they need when they need it? Yeah. 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 Well, it, it isn't simply... True leadership is not just about being careful about the words we use, and, and I'm not going to recite uh, many of the words that for example, the uh, other members of the uh, Labour Party have used about uh, trans issues um, and the fact they say, for example, that um, I think a cervix is... Uh... No, I'm not mentioning a member, but it's factually inaccurate to say only women had a cervix. I mean, that, that seems um, an extraordinary thing for a member of, uh, of the party opposite that wants to... They don't like hearing their words back at them, Madam Deputy Speaker. They don't like it. But I, I'm going to resist that temptation, and instead I'm going to focus on the application of policy. And when we look at, for example, the uh, treatment of um, trans prisoners, including those who are fully intact and who have been convicted of serious sexual offences, uh, demanding to be held in prisons that match their chosen gender, it is this government me as prisons minister, but many uh, of my predecessors as well, who set clear rules to ensure that the sorts of situations we saw, such as uh, the Karen White scenario, is not repeated. And so it was very, very troubling that uh, members opposite did not appear to have those same concerns when it came to the placing of a trans double racist, uh, rapist, Isla Bryson, uh, in Scotland. I'm being told it's not true. If they want to fact check, uh, apparently it was the deputy leader of the Labour Party who said it doesn't matter. Sir William Cash. Mr Speaker, um, I, I fear that uh, although I would like to believe that many of these problems will be resolved by guidance and by changing administrative rules and things of that kind. I fear that actually the real problem is a much deeper one. This is about the manner in which successively over the last, last generation we have actually brought in legislation which has facilitated these arrangements. And I'm so glad that the government has put through the online safety bill, which deals with platforms where a lot of this stuff has been spuriously put out
by people who have absolutely no moral compass whatsoever. Could I simply say, you will not resolve this, if I may say so, to the Secretary of State, and I want to thank her for what she said this afternoon and the manner in which she's done it. Yeah, not only robust, but extremely effective. But please do not believe that this is going to be resolved yeah. just by changes in rules and administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is about moral compass. It is also about telling the truth. And it's also, at the same time, about making certain that the legislation, whether it's the Equalities Act or whether it is related to human rights or whatever other legislation is required, will need to be changed, including the online safety. Or, order, we really can't... I, I want to get everybody in, but we really can't have sort of mini-speeches. It's questions to the Secretary of State, so the Secretary of State can answer them briefly. Secret Madam Deputy, the brevity of my answer demonstrates my respect for my right honourable friend's uh, observations and experience. I completely agree with him, <coughs> and uh, I will enjoy working with him on this. <laughs> Excellent. Neil Handy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Secretary of State for her very important statement today, and I welcome every word of it, as I do uh, the CAS report, uh, the final report, and I thank Dr Hilary Cass for her outstanding work in lifting the lid on this dangerous ideology and its impact on predominantly young LGB but other gender non-conforming young people. Now, the Secretary of State made a really important point, and that was the insinuation of gender ideology and its impact on the health service. But we know, and other members have made this point, that gender ideology has insinuated itself into many of our public bodies and insinuated itself into debate in this place. And there are uh, pieces of legislation being proposed in this place that would actually legislate to enforce the very conditions uh, in the CAS report where uh, gender non-conforming and other young people are denied proper uh, uh, psychological and psychosocial support to come to a reasonable discussion and uh, end point. Uh, what support will the Secretary of State give to have that conversation to weed out this ideology elsewhere? May I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his advocacy on this issue uh, and uh, I very much hope that all members of the House will be able to use the evidence produced in this review and report in, the fu in future debates about legislation so that we can all make informed and uh, the correct uh, decisions on legislation. Leonici. Speaker. Let's be honest, Secretary of State, what this very excellent uh, review does is actually expose institutionalised grooming and abuse by so-called professional medical people. What is she going to do now to make sure that those people who are pushing this from day one are now going to minimum be on the sex offenders list and actually be taken off being able to practice as medical people? May I thank my honourable friend and, and near neighbour? Um, if I may, I think that, that it, in fact, she's right, and indeed my right honourable friend for uh, Stone is right to emphasise it's not just the debate within the NHS, it's also actually the debate of what happens online as well, uh, because I know that parents uh, of uh, children affected by this are very, very aware of the online, as they describe it, grooming of children uh, with social, on social media. Um, I don't want to trespass for the time being on uh, the regulation. As I say, we have a, we've already had some very constructive conversations with the regulators, but the will of the House is clear that um, we expect the report to be um, followed and for clinicians to act on the basis of that evidence. Uh, Marcia de Cordova. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by saying I welcome CAS Review's findings, making it clear that clinical services must be led by good quality, robust evidence, also highlighting the lack of and poor quality data and the need. We all know the important role that data plays in terms of delivering for patients. So does the Secretary of State agree with me that the, the review of adult gender services should take into account the number of patients with mental health challenges such as depression, anxiety, autism, self-harm, eating disorders and many others? 
and what additional resources will be put in place for mental health provision? And may I thank the Honourable Lady for her thoughtful question because she's right to list just some of the mental health conditions that both Dr Cass but also professionals in this area have um, realised can be part of the complex needs of children and young people asking questions of their identity and, and about their, their path in life. In terms of funding, uh, the um, uh, financial value of the contract last year with the Tavistock was £9.3 million, but for this financial year, NHS England has committed some £17.1 million for the two new hubs for uh, gender services, and of course we, they will keep this under review uh, as we build up the services across the country in the ways envisaged in the report. Uh, Richard Fuller. Much, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I add my thanks to Dr. Hilary Cass for her review and say that, having listened to this Secretary of State today, I am confident that young people in this situation are in safe hands as she implements the recommendations that in the Cass report. But I'd like to ask my uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, about accountability, because what we've seen within the NHS for previous scandals, whether it's contaminated blood or mid-Staffordshire, that accountability is a little slippery about the NHS. Accountability is not just about lessons being learnt. It's about people being held to account for what they have done. So will my right honourable friend advise me, will she be looking at ways in which there is room here for people, if found to be wrong, to be struck off, for managers to be sacked, and in certain circumstances for criminal actions to be taken? May I thank my honourable friend for his question, and I completely understand his desire for accountability. I would, I would just uh, remind all of us that, of course, there are some clinicians who have acted uh, in a, an exemplary, a morally exemplary way, trying to blow the whistle on the practices they observed. What we, he and I and uh, I hope others want to do is to ensure that those clinicians who have not acted in accordance with their professional duties, that they are held to account. As I say, there are ongoing conversations with the independent regulators, but again, I suspect they have very much got the uh, understanding of the, the way in which the House is viewing this and the seriousness with which we view those clinicians that have not abided by their professional duties in this regard. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of the recommendations of the CAS review are to be welcomed. However, there has been some dangerous misinterpretation of some of the recommendations in public discourse and, crucially, in the response by the NHS England to recommendations for transitional services for 17 to 25 year olds. So, will the Minister join me in challenging the NHS specialised commissioning team on the immediate limit of access to support to 17 year olds, including cancellation of appointments for some who have waited years, and calling on them to immediately reinstate access while they review next steps? <coughs> I think the honourable gentle, sorry, the honourable lady. And forgive me if I've um, misunderstood her question. I think she's asking me. Uh, she's referring to the decision that um, we, the NHS England, will prevent under 18s from accessing uh, adult gender, sorry, adult gender services. There is a referral. Uh, there's a consultation open at the moment, and, and uh, oh, sorry, it's just closed. We're looking at the results of that. But I am very, very sensitive to the needs of, uh, as I say, young people within that 17 to 25 cohort who, um, the, for, the, for them, the cliff edge, as it's been described to me, of moving from children's services to adult services may not, in fact, be in their best interests. And so I promise that that is very much the focus of my work in this in the, in the weeks ahead. Julie Moss. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, my experience of speaking with my constituents on this subject has been characterised by fear. Uh, fear often, I have to be honest, from mothers about their daughters, and I have to say that it's fear of what's happening to their children, but also the fear of speaking out because of the groupthink and the toxicity around the debate. Does my right honourable friend agree that Dr Cass's extensive evidence-based report <coughs> should mark an absolute turning point in ensuring that it's children first, non-ideological, that should be spearheading our approach to this debate in all areas, across government, in all government departments, not just the NHS, in education and in our public bodies. May I thank my honourable friend sincerely. And she, again, 
articulates the concerns of many families uh, for whom uh, a, a teenager or young person in the family may be suffering very complex needs uh, and they are asking questions of themselves and their place in society, we must treat uh, not just the child or the young person, but also the family with care, with respect, and try to support them to get to the right place for their child. Chiel Mora. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Constituents have contacted me who see in the CAS report a vindication of their long-held views on sex and gender following years of abuse, sometimes violent. Others have contacted me who fear that the CAS re review represents an attack on their very existence as trans people and fear the abuse to come. Would the Secretary of State set out that she opposes utterly the toxification and politicisation of questions of sex and gender? Will she also set out that she will co collect the evidence, the additional evidence that the CAS review calls for, without which there cannot be an evidence-based approach, and also that she will put in place the resources that our young people need in terms of health care to ensure that they receive the health care appropriate to them. Yeah. Well, may I thank the Honourable Lady actually for giving me the opportunity to make it clear again that this is about treating, this report is about gathering the evidence to help support our children and young people to the best care they can have. For, for a very, very small number, that may well be a medical pathway, but for the overwhelming majority, we know from the Dr Cass report that, in fact, there may be other ways in which they can be best supported and, and looked after. And also, I do not want anyone um, to walk away from this debate thinking that for those adults who have made that decision you know, of their own free will, who are living their lives as freely as we all want them to, that this is somehow a, a report about them. This is not. This is about the, the health care, the, um, uh, the, the emotional care and support that we give to young people, their families, and also the pro professional confidence we give to clinicians to ensure that we get to the right place for each and every individual child. Anna Firth. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State has made a very powerful statement today, which I welcome absolutely, and the CAS report. But we do have to acknowledge that without this government commissioning this report with support from other parties, this would not have happened because so many on that side of the chamber just stayed silent and thought this report was pretty much a waste of time. And to see the lack of any appreciation of that today is shocking and shameful. But the important points I wanted to ask was the timetable for the to enact the wider, wider findings of the CAS report. I'm very grateful for what she said about meeting the GMC over the weekend, but there clearly needs to be some work to be done there. And secondly, and really concerningly, what steps are we putting... Order, 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 order. I'm sure the Honourable Lady doesn't mean secondly, because she's not actually making a speech. She has one question to ask, and I'd be grateful if she would just ask one question, please. The steps, the emotional and psychological support for those who've already undergone this treatment with irrevocable consequences. What are we going to do for them, please? Yes, well, may I thank my honourable friend. Um, in terms of the, uh, her observations about uh, other, side, other parts of the chamber and their response to this uh, are well made, frankly. But in terms of the, um, in terms of the, gosh, I'm being told they're not true. Crikey, they may have just opened up a bit of a Pandora's box on this. Um, the uh, the point she makes about supporting uh, people who have gone through this process and who are trying to detransition, she is absolutely right that um, that they need particular care and I am actively looking into what NHS England needs to provide in order to look after these very, very complex needs that such people have. Ben Bradshaw. Has she seen today's very sad interview with Judge Victoria McLeod, uh, Britain's only senior transgender judge who has been driven from her job because of anti-trans hate, and particularly the trend among some politicians and opinion formers to describe being transgender as an ideology? She has used the term ideology, as have a number of her colleagues, yeah. during this statement. Could she please clarify, for the benefit of this House and trans people, that she does not believe being transgender is an ideology? 
I genuinely thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving me the chance to re-emphasise that. When, we have, when I've talked about ideology, it is the ideology influencing the provision of services, the assumption that uh, any child or young person who is questioning their place, questioning their sexuality, questioning uh, their identity and their, their future path in life, the ideology is that that influenced those services which Dr Cass has set out so very well. But of course, if an adult chooses to live their life uh, in a transgender, you know, as a transgender adult, then they must do so, and they must do so freely. And I would hope also with compassion and understanding from all of us, because I have always said, and by the way, I've been talking about this now for many years, when I was Minister for Women, I uh, uh, talked about this. We must deal with this issue in a caring and careful way, and that is what Dr Cass emphasises in her report. Robin Miller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome this statement. The Cass report highlights the error of prescribing untested and irreversible drugs as puberty blockers to young people, but in Wales, the pathway for young people diagnosed with gender dysphoria includes referral to gender services in England. The Cass report also warns against teachers being forced into making premature and effectively clinical decisions about affirmation, such as social transitioning, and yet this is implicit throughout the Welsh Government's own LGBTQ plus action plan and their compulsory relationships and sexuality education curriculum. Does she agree that these findings then have relevance for the safeguarding of children in England and in Wales? And does she agree that parents, teachers and health workers across England and Wales can expect politicians to take heed of these findings? I, I very much agree with my honourable friend. He has, he's always very, very um, good, if I may say so, at exposing some of the differences in treatment that patients in Wales uh, receive compared to treatment uh, of patients in England. I hope and expect that the Labour Party will uh, be true to its word, given that the leader of the Labour Party has said that Wales is the blueprint for how uh, they would plan to run the NHS in England. I hope and expect that the Labour-run uh, uh, NHS in Wales will be announcing their immediate uh, adoption of these recommendations and the uh, transformation to services that we in England are already undertaking. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of us recognise the value of the CAST report, as my colleague from Brighton set out, in its call for evidence, its call for a thoughtful approach, its recognition that the collapse of CAMS has contributed to the difficulties of children accessing services. But I stand here today with constituents who have contacted me terrified, and they are part of the group who are in the backlog. And I dare say thousands of those children have been watching this debate with their, with their families and are frightened yeah. to hear the heat, not light. Yeah. Now, I know the Secretary of State has a brief in front of her. Can I ask her a very practical question for my constituents who do not understand what this will mean for waiting times and delays? She said earlier she wasn't putting any new money in, it was being reprioritised. In practical terms, what will it mean for those young people trying to navigate what the ha what's happening to them who need our support and care, not our derision in any political movement, next? So I, I've already, I will refer the Honourable Lady to my, the answer I gave earlier about funding. In relation to uh, the waiting list, it is precisely because we are removing the single provider of these services from the Tavistock. We've done that already. We have now set up two sets of services in highly, highly respected, world-respected children's hospitals, and we will add more. But again, this goes back to giving... GPs and other um, uh, practitioners the confidence to look after these children as they would if they were presenting solely with, for example, ADHD symptoms or concerns about mental health conditions. This is about saying this is one part of the patient that they must uh, treat, not isolating it and siloing it in the way that has happened historically. Alexander. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Prescribing hormone blockers to children is wrong. Encouraging and giving cross-sex hormones to children is wrong, and encouraging breastbinding for children is wrong. And I believe we'll look back on this scandal, and this is a scandal in the last few decades in the future, with incredulity of how we did this to our children and especially our girls. We should all be embarrassed that this is the situation that we're in. But it's not just carrying on our hospitals and the medical profession. This sort of 
ideology is going on in our schools. Does the Secretary of State share my concerns and many of my constituent concerns who have raised it with me, but in private, because they cannot go there publicly, that a school in Rother Valley is fundraising for mermaids, a charity that is accused of encouraging young people to transition simply as they do not conform to gender stereotypes, even though they are too young to understand the consequences? Does the Secretary of State share my belief that mermaids and other such charities have no place in our education school and no place to help to hinder our children? Well, I thank my honourable friend, and I'll just, if I may, just set out the practical steps NHS England has already taken, because this is important, and as I say, I hope other parts of the United Kingdom will follow. Uh, NHSE has banned the prescription of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria to children under the age of 18 years old. For cross-sex hormones, they can only be prescribed at the moment with extreme caution for 16-year-olds and older. That is on the advice of Dr Cass, and no cross-sex hormones may be prescribed to under 16 year olds for gender dysphoria. There are, of course, medical caveats to that for other uh, medical conditions, and we need to be very careful of unintended consequences, which is why this is such a complicated piece of work. But we want to ensure that these uh, drugs uh, are prescribed to the right people, if indeed they should be prescribed at all. His point about um, campaigning organisations, again, this is part of, I think, our collective frustration that our public spaces have become um, politicised and that uh, it, there is, I would say, there is no space for that sort of campaign activity in any of our public institutions. Uh, I appreciate, of course, a range of views must be represented. People must be help, helped. Young people must be helped to discover, as I say, their path in life, um, their sexuality, all of the things that is a one, such a wonderful part of growing up. But we have to do so in a way that is fair, that is rigorous, and that does not give way against the evidence into the realms of ideology, which sadly we have seen in some instances. Stephen Ferry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do welcome uh, the CAS review and the recommendations uh, merit uh, proper and full consideration. Dr Cass herself has called for, the tr for trans young people, their families and clinicians to be treated with respect and compassion. And sadly, I don't think we have seen that today in terms of some of the comments and indeed some of the heckles that have been made during this session. Will the Minister commit to challenging the harmful culture of transphobia in the UK, which is growing, and indeed which was challenged in 2022 by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, placing the UK alongside Russia, Hungary and Turkey? If the Honourable Gentleman wants to work constructively with me on ensuring that we deal with this report, we deal with the evidence in a caring and careful way for the benefit of children and young people, but also the wider trans community, I will welcome his support and so do. Zara Sultana. Madam Deputy Speaker, while I welcome Dr Cass's call for all young people, including young trans people, to be, and I quote, treated with compassion and respect, I share concerns about important elements of re the review, particularly given the context in which it was published. Last year, transphobic hate crimes hit a record high. A United Nations report noted deep concern about the increase in harassment, threats and violence against LGBT people in the UK and blamed the toxic debate about sexual orientation and gender identity. So will the Minister join me in condemning the rise in transphobia, in acknowledging that trans rights are human rights and in recognising that we will only deliver high quality health care that everyone deserves when we respect the rights and dignity of all? Yeah. Well, uh, not only do I, have I tried to espouse those principles in every ministerial role that I've held, but it is also the um, guidant, guiding light of this government that we want to ensure that we get the right health care and support to um, patients as quickly as possible. We also want to ensure that we're treating not just the condition but we're treating the patient as a whole. And as some of the complexity of the debates that we've had this afternoon shows, the young people at the very heart of this, and I think this is the final question, Madam Deputy Speaker, so I'm going to end with the young people that we're concerned about. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've got one more go. But the, um, the children and the young people that we... Um, uh, that are the focus of this report have to be uh, the, and will be the focus of our work going forward. We want to get the right services to the right children in the right time. No, no. It's, I, I wouldn't like to say that the, uh, that the Secretary of State would ever be wrong, but on her us judgment, uh, the show is never over. 
until the member for Strangford has spoken. Yeah. 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 Jim yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Derby, for your, your, your most kind, and, 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 and the Secretary of State already knows that, in a way. Um, can I thank the Secretary of State very much for her fortitude, for her determination, and for Dr Cass for all of her endeavours. Both uh, ladies, honourable ladies, I believe, have been in- incredibly uh, impressive and very capable. Now, Dr Cass's report is one that we should be uh, taking on board for Northern Ireland. Indeed, I will make it my business, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, to, to ensure that there, the Minister uh, takes this and I will send him a copy of the report as well. Uh, what help is, and support is available for all of those patients in, in Tavistock from its inception? And importantly, what steps can be taken by government uh, to stop this malpractice, malpractice and what some have described as tantamount, tantamount to abuse of the vulnerable from moving into private funded abuse? And how quickly can protection be put in place? Thank you. My sincere apologies to the honourable gentleman. I am out of practice. I should have known he'd be the last question. Um, can I? Th- I genuinely look forward to work, well, uh, working with uh, my Northern Irish counterparts on this, uh, and uh, as we have worked on other matters already. Um, the the point he makes about uh, private practices. This is one of the areas that I am working on uh, at pace because what we don't want is to have any uh, any. Um, uh, idea forming that somehow uh, people can get round, if you like, the NHS rules, very strict rules that they are setting the system uh, in order to get these drugs to young people and children. Uh, I will come back, I make this promise, I will come back and update the House when I have more news on that, but he is right to identify that, and it shows perhaps the complexity and the um, real need for detail and also a very clear principled approach to this issue in order to help reform our NHS to make it faster, simpler and fairer. Thank you. That does now conclude proceedings on the, uh, on the statement. Point of order, Mr Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I rise to seek your advice on a matter relating to my constituent who, in a short break uh, to Spain, was savagely beaten by a new, now ex-partner, resulting in significant bruising all over her body, several teeth knocked out and a broken jaw. Indeed, it is possible that the only reason she is still here is thanks to the intervention of five Newcastle men who incapacitated the perpetrator. My constituent has received excellent consular service, but that is more than can be said for the Spanish police, who, I am told, have closed the case without taking uh, statements from any of the six witnesses to the attack, allowing the thug to plead not guilty, um, as it, and as it is now a he said, she said, and we all know um, it is usually very difficult for convictions in such cases, meaning he may well now be free back in Scotland to harass and terrorise my constituent. This situation is unacceptable, so can I ask uh, the the Chair to advise me how best to proceed as an MP in this place uh, to raise urgent casework like this with overseas governments? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. I am afraid that there is not very much that I can say from the chair, as it is not a matter for the chair, but may I express my, my own sadness at what has happened. What a dreadful thing for his constituent uh, to have to suffer. Um, I can understand his concern on her behalf about how the matter is being dealt with. I can only advise uh, that the honourable gentleman uh, should write to the Foreign Office Minister who will undoubtedly take the case up. But as the honourable gentleman says, uh, there has been a good service from the consular uh, authorities. That is good news. I think that's really the only route that I can suggest that the honourable gentleman goes down. But he might wish to consult the table office. Certainly, he has brought the matter to the attention of the House, and the whole House uh, will be sorry to hear about what has happened. Thank you. Um, the clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Safety of Rwanda, Asylum and Immigration Bill, consideration of Lord's message. Now, uh, before we move to consideration of the Lord's message, I can confirm that nothing in the Lord's message engages Commons financial privilege. We will begin 
with the government motion to disagree with Lords Amendment 1B, with which we will consider the other government motions as listed on the selection paper. I call the Minister to move the motion to disagree with Lords Amendment 1B. Michael Tomlinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I beg to move that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments. Madam Deputy Speaker, here we are back again debating the same issues and amendments that we have already rejected. We are not quite at the point yet of completing each other's sentences, but we are almost there. The issue before the House is whether the clearly expressed views of this House throughout the entire passage of the Bill should prevail. We simply cannot accept amendments that provide for loopholes which would perpetuate the current cycle of delays and late legal challenges to removal. We have a moral duty to stop the boats. We must bring an end to the dangerous, unnecessary and illegal methods that are being deployed. We must protect our borders and, most importantly, save lives at sea. Our partnership with Rwanda is a key part of our strategy. The message is absolutely clear. If you come to the United Kingdom illegally, you will not be able to stay. You will be detained and swiftly returned to your home country or to a safe third country, Rwanda. I, I won't give way. On the issue of Amendment 1, the use of a Section 19.1b statement does not mean that the Bill is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. There is nothing improper or unprecedented with such a statement. It does not mean that the Bill is unlawful or that the Government will necessarily lose any legal challenge. These statements have been made in the past, including in 2003 under the last Labour government. We have a long-standing tradition of ensuring that rights and liberties are protected domestically and of fulfilling our international obligations, and we remain committed to that position. Our focus is on passing this legislation that will deter people from entering the country dangerously and illegally. Turning to the revised amendments on the implementation uh, of the treaty and the role of the monitoring committee, clause 9 of the bill clearly sets out that the bill provisions come into force when the treaty enters into force, and the treaty enters into force when the parties have completed their internal procedures. Amendment 3b confuses the process for implementing the treaty with what is required for the pr bill provisions to come into force. As I have said before, the treaty enhances the role of the previously established monitoring committee, and the monitoring committee will in ensure obligations to the treaty are adhered to in practice. Madam Deputy Speaker, it was always intended for the monitoring committee to be independent. Maintaining the committee's independence is an integral aspect of the design of the policy, and Amendment 3c risks disturbing that independence and impartiality. The Government will only ratify the treaty once we agree with Rwanda that all necessary implementation is in place for both countries to comply with the obligations under the treaty. That being the case, there is simply no need for this amendment. Despite the refinements made, Amendment 6b is still a wrecking amendment which seeks to reverse the Bill's intent. The purpose of the Bill is to invite Parliament to agree with the assessment that the Supreme Court's concerns have been properly addressed and to enact the measures in the Bill accordingly. This Bill reflects the fact that Parliament is sovereign and can change domestic law as it sees fit. The evidence that we have provided and the commitments made by the Government and the Government of Rwanda through this internationally binding treaty shows that Rwanda is in fact a safe country and enables the Bill to provide for Rwanda to be deemed a safe country. Madam Deputy Speaker, as I am sure those who support and vote for this amendment know, the amendment would render the bill utterly pointless and would not enable us to create the deterrent that we need to stop the boats and get flights off the ground. T turning, to amendment, I won't give way, turning to Amendment 7b, we know assessing age is inherently difficult, but it is important that the Government takes decisive action to deter adults from knowingly claiming to be children. There are obvious safeguarding risks of adults being placed within the care system. It is crucial that we take steps to safeguard children and avoid lengthy legal challenges which prevent the removal of those who have assessed to be adults. 
This amendment re would result in treating those who are to be removed to Rwanda under the Illegal Mig Migration Act differently from those remo removed to another country under the very same Act. There is simply no justification for this differential treatment. I, I won't. I'm going to make some progress. Amendment 9 undermines provisions in existing legislation and is completely unnecessary. It is vital that the Government take steps to reduce or remove incentives for individuals to enter the country illegally. These illegal practices pose an exceptional threat to public order, risk lives and place unprecedented pressure on public services. As I have previously set out, under Article 13 of the Treaty, the Government of Rwanda will have regard to information provided relating to any special needs an individual may have as a result of them being a victim of modern slavery. Rwanda will take all necessary steps to ensure that these needs are accommodated, and to that end, uh, the Government has tabled Amendment A in lieu. This requires the Secretary of State to publish an annual report about the operation of the legislation as it relates to modern slavery and human trafficking provisions. And with that in mind, I would invite the House to reject the Lord's Amendments 9 and agree with the amendment in lieu. In relation to Amendment 10b, as I have previously set out, this Government recognises the commitment and responsibility that comes with combat veterans, whether our own or those who showed courage by serving alongside us. We will not let them down. Once again, I want to reassure Parliament that once the United Kingdom's Special Forces ARAP review has concluded, the Government will consider and revisit how the Illegal Migration Act and removal under existing legislation will apply to those who are eligible as a result of the review, ensuring that these people receive the attention they deserve. This is a commitment that both the noble Lord, Lord Sharp, and I have made on behalf of His Majesty's Government. Madam Deputy Speaker, this the elected House has voted to give the Bill a second and third reading and voted down each of the Lord's amendments. I invite all right honourable and honourable members to stand with the Government in upholding the will of the House of Commons and to support the Government motion. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 1B. Shadow Minister Stephen Kinnock. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, it's just over two years to the day almost since the Rwanda scheme was first announced from that dispatch box. So it would be remiss of us not to take stock of progress to date. Well, hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money have been sent to the Rwandan government. Civil servants, courts, parliamentarians and journalists have spent countless hours, days and weeks discussing and writing about it. And not one, not two, but three Home Secretaries have been flown down to Kigali. But apart from that, I have to say there's not a great deal to report, Madam Deputy Speaker. The boats have kept coming, the backlog has kept growing, and the people smugglers are still laughing all the way to the bank. Two years of headline chasing gimmicks. Two years of pursuing a policy that is fundamentally unworkable, unaffordable and unlawful. Two years of flogging this dead horse. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am an inveterate optimist, so I truly believe that one day the benches opposite will come to understand that hard graft and common sense are always more effective than the sugar rush of a tabloid front page, and they will come to accept that they should have adopted Labour's comprehensive plan to restore order to our border by redirecting the vast amounts of money set aside for the Rwandan government into a new cross-border police unit and a new security partnership with Europol to smash the criminal gangs upstream. Analysis conducted by the National Audit Office has revealed that if the government manages to send 300 asylum seekers to Rwanda, which is just 0.5% of the 60,000 people currently earmarked for the scheme, then it will cost the British taxpayer a truly staggering £2 million per person. Now, it is crystal clear that the scheme is doomed to fail on its own terms because people who are prepared to risk life and limb crossing continents are not going to be deterred by a 0.5% chance of being sent to Rwanda. 
But, Madam Deputy Speaker, the mind-boggling costs of the scheme are quite difficult to grasp. So I've done a bit of homework, a bit of research into what else you could get for £2 million. Now, my honourable friend, the member for Bermondsey, who's not in his place this evening, got the ball rolling on this one by pointing out that during our last debate on this bill, the £2 million will get you five trips to outer space on the Virgin Galactic spacecraft. But I've calculated, Madam Deputy Speaker, you look impressed and suitably so. Um, but I've calculated that you could also, you can live for three decades on one of the most, world's most expensive cruise liners. You could charter the Lady M yacht for a year. That is, of course, the yacht that belongs to the noble Baroness Moans. It's her vessel of choice, as some of those on the opposite benches may be aware. Or, or you could even fly the Prime Minister's favourite helicopter to Australia and back. And speaking of the Prime Minister, I noticed that during the Easter recess he found time to offer his services as a financial advisor to small businesses via Zoom. Well, I don't know about you, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I have to say I do have some concerns that the guy who's happy to pump billions of pounds into a failing fiasco like this Rwanda scheme is offering his services as a financial advisor to unsuspecting members of the public. <laughs> Let's hope the Financial Conduct Authority will intervene as a matter of urgency. Turning, I will take an intervention. Very grateful to the honourable gentleman. He, he's proving to be most entertaining. But as this is, as this is consideration of Lord's amendment, is he going to actually get on to deal with the amendments? Which one? I want him to be in order. No, order, order, order. If the honourable gentleman was not in order, I would not have allowed him to speak. He has been drawing some very interesting facts to the attention of the House. And I, for one, am likely to explore some of them, but not the yacht. <laughs> Mr Kinnock. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I always enjoy taking uh, interventions from a fellow Welshman, but I do feel he was well and truly put into his place by that particular <laughs> riposte from I Madam Deputy Speaker. From a I will take an intervention. <laughs> I, I'm grateful to him. Um, I'm sure that he, like me, will have marvelled uh, at... Uh, the government's ability to legislate for Rwanda to be a safe country. Uh, and this, is, of course, is in respect of Lord's Amendment 2, Madam Deputy Speaker. So will my honourable friend join me in urging the government to use this amazing power that it has to legislate that CO2 emissions will no longer cause global warming and that sugar, <laughs> fat and alcohol will no longer damage human health? Well, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. I'm, I'm sure the benches opposite would be delighted to oblige, and perhaps we could also legislate that the sky is green and the grass is blue, or perhaps that the Welsh rugby team actually won the last six nations. I would love to pass a law uh, to secure that objective. Turning now to the amendments that are before us today, let's be clear, not one of these amendments prevents flights from Rwanda taking off. On the contrary, they simply seek to place on the face of the bill what ministers have previously promised, namely that the bill is lawful, that the government will protect the most vulnerable, and that we will stand by those brave Afghans who have supported military efforts. Addressing each amendment directly, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to first focus on Lord, Lord's Amendment 10B in the name of the noble Lord Brown. Now, we have spoken a lot about the unworkability and the unaffordability of this policy, but we should also talk about the unethical and, frankly, un-British nature of deporting Afghans who have supported Britain's defence and diplomatic efforts halfway across the world to Rwanda. Yeah. That is not Operation Warm Welcome, Madam Deputy Speaker. That is Operation Cold Shoulder. And we should have seen it coming. Given the Prime Minister halted flights from neighbouring Pakistan for an entire year for Afghans who had already been granted resettlement rights in the, in the UK under Arab, and only restarted them when the Pakistani government threatened to send those Afghans back across the border to meet their fate in the hands of the Taliban. We owe a debt of honour 
to the loyal to Britain Afghans who put their lives on the line. And of course, our moral duty is most strongly felt by British Armed Forces personnel who worked alongside them. In fact, this weekend, 13 senior military figures signed a letter to the Sunday Telegraph warning that any brave men and women who have fought alongside our armed forces or served the UK government overseas must be exempt from removal to Rwanda. The signatories included former chiefs of defence staff, as well as a former Secretary General of NATO and a former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe. They warn that if this exemption is not granted, it will do grave damage, I quote, do grave damage to our ability to recruit local allies in future military operations. And they explain, and I quote again, that they have seen firsthand the enormous courage and dedication shown by those who have fought alongside our armed forces and served British interests abroad, often at huge personal risk. And we take personally Britain's obligation to honour the debt we owe to that cohort. Powerful words indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yep. And I would therefore urge the benches opposite to join us in supporting Lord's Amendment 10B this evening, which seeks to prevent this travesty. Kevin Foster. Chairman. Minister, for giving way. Uh, the key issue, as he and I will know, is not about Arab people coming via small boats, but unbunging uh, the resettlement programme. In that sense, and given the remarks he's just made, how many spaces does he envisage ensuring are available for resettlement under that scheme? Well, we know that a number of those who served the British defence development and diplomatic efforts have been identified for resettlement. So I, what I would say to him is that those people should be being resettled in the United Kingdom. Let's get that bit of this scheme unblocked before we get into speculation about the quantum, because the key point here is they have already been accepted into the resettlement programmes, but they are being left high and dry in Pakistan. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, uh, my honourable friend was accused of levity earlier, but this House has so many things to discuss. Um, there are good policies and sensible, workable policies to deal with unchecked migration. He knows that, I know that. But this, the Rwanda scheme, reminds me, and he's probably too young to remember, the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. This scheme is a dead parrot, and the sooner this government wakes up that it's dead, the better. Well, I thank my honourable friend uh, for that point, and, and he is right that um, there are so many practical, pragmatic and sensible measures that could be taken to deal with uh, the crisis in the channel, the Tory small boats chaos. But instead of focusing on those sensible, pragmatic measures, we are dealing with this uh, white elephant of a programme that is never going to get anywhere and is costing millions of pounds of taxpayers' money and absorbing huge amounts of our time. I agree with him absolutely on that. Now, Lord's Amendment 9b, in the name of the noble Baroness Butler Sloss, is also based on a moral imperative, as it would prevent the removal of potential victims of modern slavery to Rwanda until the individual's process under the national referral mechanism is complete. Now, it should go without saying that modern slavery victims should not be being sent to Rwanda, and we are disappointed that the government's amendment in lieu on this one is a profoundly unserious attempt to reassure the House, not least because we've been here before, and we know that these promised reports are rarely worth the paper they're written on. We on these benches are also deeply concerned about unaccompanied children being inadvertently sent to Rwanda. We therefore support the noble Baroness Lister's Lord Amendment 7b, which recognises the government's reasoning for rejecting her previous amendment, by this time proposing that an age-disputed person who is appealing their decision can only be removed to Rwanda if a local authority has agreed and stated that this person is not a child. Now, the other Lord's Amendments all relate to the rule of law, and we support all of these amendments, which simply articulate principles with which ministers have said from that dispatch box that they agree. The simple question is, Madam Deputy Speaker, if ministers believe that Rwanda is a safe country, then why is the government refusing to support these amendments? They say that this bill abides by international law. So why not just make that clear on the face of the bill? They say 
that Rwanda is capable of meeting its obligations under international law. So let's see the evidence and let's agree a trust but verify mechanism as set out in these amendments. I thank my friend for giving way. Uh, would he agree that this bill is not only just inhumane, costly and unworkable, but despite the best efforts uh, to amend the bill, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, legislation, the Tories uh, seem resolute in pursuing it rather than getting to grips with our broken asylum system. Just another indication to the country that this government is unfit to govern. Well, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention, and I, I think there's a, there's a very clear choice between the common sense and hard graft and uh, positive international cooperation that is set out in Labour's plan to deal with this issue and the headline-chasing gimmicks and empty gestures that are symbolised by this Rwanda policy. Politics is about choices. The government's taken its choice and we have taken ours. So in this spirit, Lord's Amendment 1B is a Labour front bench amendment which places a responsibility on the government to have due regard for its current obligations under domestic and international law. Lord's Amendments 3B and 3C, in the name of the noble Lord Hope, together state that Rwanda may only be considered to be a safe country if and when the measures set out in the Rwanda Treaty have been fully implemented and when the Monitoring Committee has established that this is the case. The Government claims that the measures in the Treaty address concerns in the Supreme Court's recent unanimous ruling, so there is absolutely no reason why Ministers should refuse to accept Lord Hope's amendments. Finally, Lord's Amendment 6b, in the name of the noble Baroness Chakrabarti, allows government ministers, officials and courts to consider whether Rwanda is safe on a case-by-case -case basis. Given that the government has accepted that some appeals will be allowed, we see no reason for the government to reject this amendment. Madam Deputy Speaker, I hope that colleagues across this House will join me and these benches in voting to support all of these amendments this evening. But of course, these amendments are no more than an exercise in damage limitation, because the fundamental problem is that this harebrained Rwanda policy is breaking all records for being the most unworkable and the worst value for money policy in the history of the Home Office. But there is an alternative, Madam Deputy Speaker. In addition to our policy to go after the criminal smuggler gangs, we will also deliver our backlog clearance plan to get asylum seekers out of expensive asylum hotels by surging decision makers and case workers to the Home Office and by creating a new returns and enforcement unit with 1,000 dedicated staff focused on the faster removal of those with no right to be here, including failed asylum seekers and foreign criminals. Madam Deputy Speaker, the benches opposite are failing on all fronts. Despite their misleading boasts about progress, the Immigration Minister today admitted that there are still almost 300 asylum hotels in operation. They are returning 44% fewer failed asylum seekers compared to the last Labour government leaving office in 2010, and 27% fewer foreign criminals. The number of small boats crossings has gone up again year on year, January to March, and they have no plan for the 99% who cannot be sent to Rwanda. So we need Labour's plans to smash the criminal smuggler gangs, save lives in the Channel and strengthen our border security. We need Labour's plan for faster processing, the end of hotel use and the removal of people who have no right to stay in the UK. And we need a Labour government to deliver a firm, fair and well-managed asylum system that works for Britain. Thank you. Sir William Cash. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I don't really feel that there's anything terribly useful I can say at this stage. I've heard all this, be uh, I've heard all, I've heard all this before. The, the Honourable Member who speaks from the front bench is simply repeating what he said before. And not only that, it's perfectly apparent that these amendments are just wrecking amendments. And thirdly, the fact is that he doesn't even address the arguments about international law when he knows perfectly well, because he can't answer my questions on this, that we have a dualist system and if we decide to legislate in our own legislative way, in our own courts, in our, in our own parliament, the courts themselves will implement that legislation. So the real question now is let, let's get this bill done, let's get the House of Lords uh, to calm down a bit. Let us also at the same time 
wait for what is inevitably going to be another claim and then see what the judgment of the Supreme Court is on the wording, providing it is clear and unambiguous, of this bill. That's all I need to say. I may come back again, however, if there is another insistence by the Lords on these ridiculous amendments. <clears throat> SNP spokesman Alison Thewlis. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, here we are again uh, debating this uh, outrageous and unworkable bill. We're no further forward, uh, and the government will fail to get any further forward, really, because this is uh, a complete waste of time and money. It is a, uh, a, a ruse uh, only to get tabloid headlines. And I'm not even sure at this stage if they have any intention that this plan will actually work. Uh, at all, given uh, the incompetence that they've showed so far. Uh, they are scrabbling around this week trying to find airlines because not one single air responsible air carrier wants to be associated with the government's state-sponsored people trafficking plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been trying to find other countries that they can try and send PSEs yeah. to as well. Armenia and the Ivory Coast and Costa Rica or Botswana might be interested, but far, far more countries rather sensibly told them to go and get raffled. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not convinced that even Rwanda believes that this plan will work or that people will be sent because they've gone and sold off the housing that they built that the former Home Secretary so admired. Yes. So, in fact, if they do send people, there's not even going to be the facilities to put them in uh, unless the government intends to stack them high, as they do often in hotels uh, in this country. Treating people as human cargo that they can so easily dispose of it is absolutely despicable. And so far they've sent Home Secretaries, they've sent civil servants, even the Joint Committee on Human Rights has gone to Rwanda, um, along with some hand-picked journalists, and yet no asylum seekers, and nor is there much prospect uh, of them going. And yet, while all of this has gone on, uh, dozens of Rwandans have actually submitted asylum claims here in the UK, uh, and in Rwanda itself. Uh, there is still concern over Rwanda's sponsoring of the M23 rebels who are engaged with their, in conflict with their neighbours, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, last month, uh, wounding UN peacekeepers in the DRC uh, and uh, controlling roads uh, at the mining sites in the DRC, displacing 1.7 million people. And Vava Tampa in The Guardian last week has questioned uh, international support for the Kagame regime. Uh, Vava Tampa says, uh, the UN Human Rights Watch and Amnesty are clear that without Rwanda's backing, the M23 couldn't have killed, raped, tortured and displaced as many as it has. So I would ask the government why it wants to pursue um, deals with uh, such a regime. It is quite worrying indeed. Moving to the Lord's amendments, and I will go through them in turn. And uh, The first of the Lord amendments uh, asks that the government have a have um, due regard for international, for, for domestic and international law. Well, yes, that should be a basic of any legislation that this House wishes to pass, due regard to domestic and international law. Now, this waters down slightly the previous amendment about uh, maintaining full compliance with domestic and international law. Too, clearly too hard an ask for the government, even to having due regard to domestic and international law is too much for this government, clearly. Obligations like the ECHR, which is tied up in the, with the Good Friday Agreement, with the devolution settlements in this country. International law, the Refugee Convention, the UN Convention Against Torture, the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Now, why would the government not want to abide by these international agreements? I thank my friend for giving me the wrong points that she's making. Isn't it a concern that if the UK government thinks it can just ignore all of these international commitments to which it has already been signed up, in fact, which it already helped to found, such as the ECHR, how on earth can it then turn around to other international how, how on earth can it turn around to other countries who might be breaching their international obligations under international law and say that they should comply with these treaties? Hypocrisy goes even yet further than just that. They expect Rwanda to, up, to uphold all of its agreements internationally and domestically, and its laws internationally and domestically, while specifically setting out to breach its own laws here and its own obligations here in this legislation. It is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, moving to um, the next of the Lord Amendments 3B and 3C, they ask um, that. Rwanda will be a safe country when the arrangements provided for in the Rwanda Treaty have been fully implemented and for so long as they continue to be so. And I think this question of how long they continue to be so is just as critical as whether they meet the measures just now, because what this government is legislating is that Rwanda is safe 
forever, in perpetuity, in this legislation. Nobody can say that of any country in the world at any point. So to legislate specifically that this country uniquely should be safe forever and ever uh, is really quite bizarre uh, in this legislation. And I think it's quite reasonable, really, of the Lords to say um, that the Rwanda Treaty will cease to be treated as fully implemented if Parliament decides in the advice of the Monitoring Committee that the provisions of the Treaty are no longer being adhered to in practice. And there should be a check on that. that should, the Government should not fear that. If it believes truly and deeply that the, that the agreement will be adhered to, surely there is no harm in scrutinising that agreement. But yet the House of Lords International Agreements Committee has said that the Treaty is unlikely to result in fundamental change in the short term. And the UK Supreme Court pointed out in its judgment at paragraph 87, I believe, that Rwanda uh, refouled at least six people while the treaty was under negotiation. Now, if this does not raise alarm bells to the government about uh, the ability of Rwanda to adhere uh, to this treaty, uh, I really, I don't think anything will. Moving further to uh, 6B, uh, and I think this really is when it comes to actually some of the domestic law. And it's not about international courts and uh, foreign courts and foreign judges as if that was a bad thing and we don't actually send people to sit on that court ourselves. Um, it's about the integrity of our own courts and tribunals and of UK-based judges and decision makers that the Home Office employs to do their job, which this uh, legislation undermines. And the, the amendment says that... Um, uh, Section 2 does not prevent the Secretary of State or an immigration officer from deciding whether the Republic of Rwanda is a safe country for the person in question or for groups of persons to which the person belongs. And I think that is quite reasonable. We should look at the evidence before coming to decisions. And this is asking for the courts and tribunals to be able to do their job, not to ignore the evidence, not to engage, as others have described, in a legal fantasy, uh, that they uh, cannot look at the evidence, they cannot see, that they cannot hear, that they cannot speak out about what they know to be true. And I think that is quite unreasonable. And if he thinks that our own domestic judges uh, should not be allowed to make uh, decisions on this, I'd be very interested to hear his point. I may, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that um, if you look at Section 57 of the Immigration Bill, uh, the Immigration Act to which he refers, 2023, um, and what it does say is a perfectly reasonable point, which is that the, the courts must take account of the facts. That is the key question. I didn't hear her say that because that is something which is indisputable and, in my opinion, unassailable. If, with regard to the question of age or any other matter which falls within the framework of this particular amendment, uh, it was a, it was a, there was a question of fact, then surely it must be the case that the courts should be entitled to deal with facts, but not to deal with the questions that the Honourable Lady has just been referring to. Well, this legislation inhibits the ability to look at facts, and I think that's really quite a dangerous road to go down, and I don't think that is really what the government ought to be doing in, in any circumstance, no matter how much uh, they might uh, wish their will upon the courts, they should not be doing this uh, in legislation, it is completely wrong. Turning to uh, 7b on the age assessment of unaccompanied children, and this again asks quite reasonably that um, there should be, that, that a relevant authority, a local authority, uh, should uh, have an expert uh, assess uh, carry out an age assessment on people that they consider to be children. And the Children's Society have repeatedly said that they see unaccompanied children being incorrectly assessed by immigration officials to be adults on arrival in the UK. So I think calling for a proper assessment here is perfectly reasonable, rather than sending uh, children off to Rwanda and then trying to retrieve them later. The harm that that could cause is really quite significant. And in the government's own figures, in the first th six months, of 2023, 485 children were wrongly assessed to be adults. And the Home Office gets this wrong quite regularly. The Heaven Bambers Foundation has found that over an 18 month period, 1,300 children were as wrongly assessed to be adults, the majority being incorrectly assessed. So the government really needs to admit that it does get this wrong and that it shouldn't be uh, sending children to Rwanda uh, and then trying to retrieve them at some stage later if, oops, somehow we got it wrong. Do it properly, do the assessment at the beginning, rather than causing young people who have already suffered a huge amount of trauma yet more pain. Uh, moving to uh, Lord's Amendment uh, 
uh, 9b and their insistence uh, that 9b be uh, considered uh, again on the removal of victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And again, this is hugely significant. This goes against our obligations uh, on, on human trafficking, uh, and we should not uh, have a government sending people who have been trafficked away with a significant risk that they may be re-trafficked uh, going through yet further trauma and the impact that, that will have on their physical, mental and health and safety. Uh, and I think that is something that the government really ought to be considering. Why wouldn't you want to consider the risks of people who have been trafficked? Uh, and the, the Modern Slavery uh, and Human Rights Policy the Evans Centre from the, uh, the Bingham Centre uh, for Rule of Law have done significant work on this. And I would ask the House to consider their evidence on this, about the, the breach of our obligations that the government is, is embarking upon. I think it is absolutely wrong that they should seek to do this to people who have been already through so much. And finally, uh, moving to... Of good points because vulnerable people are already being targeted by the government on a voluntary basis. But I had a, a young man in my constituency recently with severe health problems who, was, who, the, who the Home Office tried to persuade to voluntarily go to Rwanda, severely traumatising for them. That for somebody who suffered uh, uh, previously in coming to the UK, from what the experiences they've had in their home country, to then have that degree of what they perceive as pressure, possibly bribery as well happening in that, in that sense, uh, is extremely traumatising. If this is the way the government is going, then these amendments are essential. With many of my constituents and with, with other people who have been victims, as he, uh, as he sets out, this is devastating for them. It's already difficult enough to escape from your traffickers. It's already difficult enough to speak out about this, to, to have your case believed by anybody. Um, but Article 13 of the Rwanda Treaty, which will allow the UK to never conclusively determine whether a potential victim of modern slavery is indeed even a victim, would put the UK uh, in breach of its Article 4 HCHR and Article 10 ECAT obligations to uh, identify and assist potential victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, and by tying up with the immigration system and the way that they have, again, that undermines people's rights uh, and undermines our obligations uh, as the UK to do this. And I absolutely pay tribute uh, to uh, the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Policy and Evidence Centre uh, um, center for the evidence that they have sent to members. If it's in your inbox, please read that before you vote on this bill and on this particular amendment. Uh, and moving lastly to um, the exemption for allies, agents and employees of the UK overseas. Now it remains the case that many Afghans have come here on small boats because the UK government schemes have failed. They have failed to protect people, they have failed to bring people who served alongside British forces in Afghanistan, people to whom they put their trust in the UK to protect them and their families, they put their trust uh, in the UK-US project in Afghanistan, and that trust has been thoroughly breached. And I get emails from people quite regularly who feel as though they have been deeply let down by the UK government. That, that trust has gone. Uh, and by putting in this exemption to the bill, that at least gives some prospect of there being some degree of trust in future. Because at the moment, if I was uh, in some country that the UK became involved in, the last thing I would want to be doing now is getting involved with UK forces. Because as soon as the UK ships out, you're on your own. Too bad, tough. It is a death sentence for those people that put themselves forward to help and support UK objectives uh, overseas. And it is disgraceful the way in which this government has treated those people and their families. And as I've said many times before in this place, during the fall uh, of Afghanistan, I had many families uh, who, have, uh, who live in my constituency who had relatives in Afghanistan. Uh, very, very few of them ever got out. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know if they're dead or if they're alive, and some of their families may not even know that either. But they have been let down by this UK government. The schemes that the government minister talked about have failed. They are not bringing people to safety. They have failed on the terms that were promised. Uh, whether they will ever meet the number of people that were supposed to come over and get safety here, uh, I seriously doubt at this stage. Um, so at the very least, the government could have a recognition in this bill. At the very least, they could accept such an amendment uh, as this, because they must know that because Afghans are coming in small boats, their schemes, their supposed safe and legal routes 
have failed. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm not convinced that this bill will be any kind of deterrent. Already, uh, more than, than almost three and a half people, three and a half thousand people have crossed in small boats this year so far. Um, it has not deterred a single solitary one of them. But what it has done, and what it has made incredibly difficult, is those people that are now considered uh, inadmissible to the system. And I ask the Minister uh, what is going to happen to those, because we know that the very small, tiniest, tiniest proportion pe of people, if the government even actually ends up sending them to Rwanda, will be the, uh, the tip of a massive iceberg of people who are just swimming around in the system now with no rights. And I have constituents coming to my surgeries now who say that they are waiting, that they cannot be dealt with, that they cannot have their asylum claim processed because this government has deemed that they are inadmissible. What happens to them? Where do they live? How do they continue uh, to exist uh, in this country if the government will not process uh, their applications will not listen to their claims, whether that is through uh, human trafficking or modern slavery, whether that is people who have been uh, victims of torture, whether that is people that have, I'm just coming to the end of my remarks, but the government will not even listen to these people's stories. So what will happen to them and where will they live? Because this government seems to have no consideration for the trauma that people have gone through and now they leave them in immigration limbo forever in this uh, ridiculous, expensive, unworkable system. The asylum system is broken. We know who broke it. We know that an independent Scotland would treat people far more humanely than this government ever will. Here, here, here. David Simmons. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm uh, very grateful to uh, the Minister in his opening remarks for setting out um, in detail the uh, changes and amendments that the government has made, both in terms of uh, what is on the order paper and what is uh, a matter of approach um, in response to the concerns that have been raised by many uh, and the points that have been made by many in earlier stages of this debate. So I'd like, Madam Deputy Speaker, in particular to address um, the points made around Lords Amendments 1B and 7B, and then just to briefly touch on a couple of other points which have arisen in the debate, which, certainly from my experience in the world of local government, continue to have a relevance and which will need to be addressed um, in due course if this is going to take effect in the way that we wish to see it take effect. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm a great uh, enthusiast for the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think it is important to acknowledge in the context of this debate that since this House previously considered and debated um, this particular piece of legislation, there has been uh, further development in respect of the Rule 39 interim orders. In fact, the various bodies that are concerned with the operation of that convention, including the Court, have recognised the concerns that were caused to the UK Government and other Member States of the ECHR by the way in which those judgments had been handed down, and have confirmed that they will be updating their procedures to ensure that the operation in future is different, and in a way that reflects the concerns which were expressed by many in this House. And I see that as evidence both that the ECHR remains a living document, but also that the concerns which the UK Government has expressed are being taken seriously. I think many members will have been um, slightly alarmed, I think, by the recent judgment that was handed down in respect of environmental legislation. And I note that the British judge, Tim Icke, whose commentary on that particular uh, judgment, which was a dissenting commentary, has been publicised very widely. And he set out in a great deal of detail why many of the issues that have been raised by members of this House in respect of this particular piece of legislation were also relevant in that context, that the, the risk of perceived overreach of developing a living document to the point where it went beyond the level of consent which the original contracting parties had in mind, that that remained something which the Court needed to be alive to. And I'm very conscious that because of the way the Convention operates in practice, that it is an accountable process, accountable to the Parliamentary Assembly, to the Congress, to the Council of Ministers, ultimately to the Member States, that the, uh, of course. Minister and the former Home Secretary and various others on his benches to continually refer to the European Court of Human Rights as a foreign court. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know the Prime Minister has, has made the point that given that the court is based in Strasbourg, certainly in a technical sense it can be described as that. But from my perspective, having served on, having served on the Congress, I'm very much aware that it is a court to which 
the UK, um, partly through its role in the creation of the Treaty of London, which set up the Convention in the first place, has always been an enormous supporter. And we need to ensure through the input that members of this House, amongst others, have through the Parliamentary Assembly and the Council of Ministers and other parts of the British political family through things like the Congress have, that we continue to play a part in ensuring it develops in the way that we would wish to see it develop. Of course. Well, I'm a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and I'm not aware that I'm a foreigner, um, but it has, many, it has many difficulties. But I think we're missing the essential point. What concerns me is that in the absence, and I support this bill for what it's worth, but in the absence of these people who land here being detained, uh, if they are threatened with being deported to Rwanda at some state in the future, they're simply going to bugger off into the community. I, I, perhaps the honourable gentleman means they might disappear into the community. I, I think that would be preferable. I'm using rather colourful uh, phraseology just to make my point, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I take your, your, okay. my ticking I'll, off. I'll, 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 I'll forgive the right honourable gentleman on this yeah. occasion. They will disappear into the community. Mr Simmons. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam <laughs> Deputy Speaker. I, I'm grateful for my, uh, my old friend for, for highlighting that in a way that I'm sure many of our constituents would, would choose to highlight it as well. But just in order to, uh, to finish Madam Speaker, the, the point around um, the Convention itself and Amendment 1B, um, I think it is absolutely clear, as the Minister said at the dispatch box, that when we cannot be certain of a uh, future potential legal challenge, that it is appropriate that the statement is made as it has been made in respect of, of this. But it remains uh, my view, and I think the view of many others, that we have many channels of influence, both diplomatic and political, that this is a living convention. We know that it is embedded in many different parts of uh, our constitution, not just the Good Friday Agreement, but our withdrawal agreement from the European Union, and therefore our adherence to it remains incredibly important. But that because it is a living document, it is able to flex and evolve to recognise that the world that we see today, the world of asylum and the international context of that, is different from how that existed when the Treaty of London was first very strongly championed by Winston Churchill in the 1950s. And therefore, I am very much persuaded that the Minister is correct in the way that he seeks to reject these amendments, but to acknowledge the spirit and the tone of what is being said behind them. Um, Madam Dixon, I'd like to move on to address some of the issues that arise in Amendment 7b. And again, I, I am um, persuaded by what the Minister has said about that. But I do think that there is an issue which is a long-standing one, in respect of the way in which unaccompanied children are treated. The Children Act 1989 sets up the legal framework and that sets out in some detail that a child who is not accompanied by a person who has parental responsibility for them, by operation of law becomes the responsibility of a local authority. And whether that local authority goes through any process at all to bring that child into the care system formally, for example, by seeking a care order or not, it remains the responsibility of the local authority where that child arises to take care of them. And if they return later on in early adulthood and are able to make a case that they have been present in that local authority as a child, then they are also entitled to care leaving uh, responsibilities from that local authority under the Leaving Care Act 2000. And the reason why that is significant is that it does set up a potential conflict between the impact of immigration legislation and the impact of Department for Education Children Act uh, legislation. Now, we know that this has been an issue, and I know um, uh, there's uh, at least one other member who represents the, the same local authority which sits in a substantial part of my constituency, where Heathrow Airport means that a single local authority has had very large numbers, the London Borough of Hillingdon, of unaccompanied children coming in over the years, has been responsible for carrying out age assessments, and often challenged by those young people and their advocates in a way that can result both in judicial reviews going in one way or another, with significant cost implications to the public purse and safeguarding risks both to children and to others that they might be with where um, those may arise. So I'd simply urge the Minister to make sure that when pressing the point that it remains uh, the Home Office that is the decision maker as to whether a person is a child or not, 
that as far as the law is concerned, it is a Merton compliant, so-called Merton compliant age assessment that is the gold standard for determining whether a young person is an adult or not. And whilst we've had a, a lot of suggestion that we could use scientific methods such as x-rays, the fact remains that those provide a very wide age range for a young person that for the purposes of determining whether they were just under or just over 18, which is the relevant issue for the Children Act responsibilities, are useless. And that is why it is the Merton compliant age assessment process that is so important. So whilst I support the Minister in saying we need to reject that amendment, we do need to ensure that the process that we have in place in particular does not put local authorities in an impossible position where they are judicially reviewed for their failure to provide services which they are obliged to under the 1989 Children Act or the Leaving Care Act to an individual who has been removed or subject to other immigration control by a decision of the Home Office. Because we could certainly open up um, the prospect of what is in effect proxy judicial reviews to challenge the government's immigration position by using the Children Act or the Leaving Care Act legislation. Um, finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I just wanted to uh, address two other points um, which um, arise. One in respect directly of the amendment and the other in response to the point that was made by I think, the member for Glasgow Central about what in practice happens to people. Um, it is, in my view, very welcome that the government has brought forward um, what it has to say about the treatment of people who are victims of modern slavery. And again, many of us will have had individuals in our constituencies who have been affected by that, um, both the impact it has on our local public services, our police forces, our local authorities, our housing authorities of identifying people and providing appropriate support, but also very keen to, sure, to ensure that given the progress that we've made in this House on that issue, that we do not fall back through the impact of other legislation. And I think we'll be watching closely to ensure that the report that's proposed as a, an alternative to uh, the Lord's Amendment on that is going to work in practice as well as the Minister has set out it will. But just finally, the, the point has been raised about what happens in practice by a number of members. And I think many of us will be conscious that this has, again, a very significant impact on local authorities. Going back to the 1948 National Assistance Act, which says that a local authority must provide support to someone within its area who is destitute, regardless of any other considerations about their status. Now, in practice, that is the reason why local authorities will be required to step in and provide emergency temporary accommodation to families with children in particular, where their asylum claim has been refused, but they remain here in the United Kingdom. And that means that the local authority, whilst it is not ever going to be housing those people in social housing because those individuals have no entitlement to it, they will be accommodated in hotels, in hostels and other types of accommodation, which in turn creates additional housing pressure locally. So it is incredibly important that we make sure, as the government has set out, that this system not just works well at making the decisions early on, but it ensures that there are effective processes so that those who should not be in the United Kingdom are removed in order that that accommodation and that those other services are available for those with an entitlement to be here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Order. It will be obvious to the House that we have um, um, just over an hour left uh, for the remainder of this debate. And I hope that we don't have to have a time limit, but if speeches were around seven minutes or so, then everyone will have an opportunity uh, to make their points. Uh, we, the speeches so far have not been too long. They've been perfectly reasonable. But I'd like to keep to that. Around seven minutes, please. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we are now on the final stages of the legislative journey of the Rwanda scheme announced, as the honourable friend on the front bench said, uh, two years ago. What we do know is that £370 million is already committed to the Rwanda scheme. No individuals have yet been sent to Rwanda, and the Rwandan government are reportedly wanting to pause the scheme after the first tranche of removals. So the question of how this policy will meet the government's objective of deterring small boat crossings remains pertinent, especially 
As we've heard, a record number of individuals have made the dangerous channel crossing during the first three months of this year. So I want to turn to each of the Lord's amendments. Um, I also just want to say to the Honourable Member for Stone, who's not in his place, that when I went along to the other place to hear the debate uh, on the Rwanda Bill, the Safety of Rwanda Bill, I was very impressed with the uh, debate, with the points that were being raised by um, the other place. And I think to say that the uh, House of Lords needs to calm down a bit and these are ridiculous amendments is really uh, doing a huge disservice to what the revising chamber uh, can provide for this part of Parliament in ensuring that when they think we've made mistakes, uh, when they think things need to be looked at again, that we, they give that opportunity to us. So turning to Lord's Amendment 1B, um, this is a modified version of the original Lord's Amendment 1, and the original added a requirement to maintain full compliance with domestic and international law. So while Amendment 1, 1B, uh, which the other place have proposed in lieu, now sets out a requirement to have due regard for domestic and international law. And moving uh, 1B on the 20th of March, the noble Lord Coker said, we've put this forward because the bill that your lordships are discussing now explicitly disapplies aspects of domestic law and disapplies aspects of international law. As I made plain in the previous debate on the Lord's Amendments, if the Government is so confident that the Rwanda scheme will be fully compliant with domestic and international law, it should really have no objection uh, to this amendment. And turning to Lord's Amendments 3B and 3C, which are around treaty implementation and monitoring committees, Lord's Amendment 3B and C are modified versions of the original Lord's Amendments 2 and 3 respectively. Amendment 3B, like the original Lord's Amendment 2, states that the Rwanda will be a safe country when the arrangements provided for in the Rwanda Treaty have been fully implemented and for so long as they continue to be so. The wording has changed slightly and there is no longer a reference to the arrangements in the Treaty being adhered to in practice, but the effect is the same. Lord's Amendment 3C, like the original Lord's Amendment 3, sets out what full implementation would look like and gives the Independent Monitoring Committee a significant role. Unlike the original Lord's Amendment, there is no requirement on the Secretary of State to consult the Monitoring Committee every three months. Instead, Amendment 3C states that the treaty will cease to be fully implemented if Parliament decides, on the advice of the Monitoring Committee, that the provisions of the treaty are no longer being adhered to in practice. So in moving Amendment 3C, the noble Lord Hope of Craighead said it was an attempt to respond to a point made by the Right Honourable Member for Kenilworth in the Commons debate on the 18th of March, and he said that my Amendment 3C in lieu does my best to make it clear that the authority lies with Parliament and not with the Committee. Now the Home Affairs Select Committee has argued that the House of Commons be given an opportunity to debate the treaty prior to ratif ratification in light of how critical its implementation is to the Rwanda policy. Given that this opportunity to scrutinise the treaty was denied, Amendment 3B would at least provide some reassurance to members that its provisions will be implemented and apl applicable to anyone relocated to Rwanda, while Lord's Amendment 3C would enable Parliament to review the treaty's implementation and respond to facts on the ground if and as they change. These are Lord's Amendments speak to the practicalities of implementing the Rwanda policy and how too often, sadly, the government have sought to skate over them. So take the issue of an airline. For this policy to function, the government has got to be able to transport people to Rwanda, yet ministers have still not confirmed they have secured an airline, with Rwanda's own state-owned airline reportedly declining a request to use their planes. Then there's the issue of where migrants will live if they're deported to Rwanda, if they're sent to Rwanda. Recent reports suggest the majority of homes on a new Rwandan housing estate, initially earmarked for migrants relocated from the UK, have been sold to local buyers. And these are not moot points, these are the kind of practical details that will determine whether the scheme works and whether it works safely. So in the absence of prior scrutiny of the treaty, the House of Commons, I think, must be allowed to assess its implementation and act on the findings. Now just turning to Lord's Amendment 6b around legal challenge, this is a modified version of the original Lord's Amendment 6 and like the original it deletes clause 4 of the bill allowing much wider grounds for legal challenge. 
By the original amendment, it says that a court or tribunal may prevent or delay the removal of a person to Rwanda, but unlike in the original, it adds, providing such prevention or delay is for no longer than strictly necessary for the fair and expeditious determination of the case. The Home Affairs Select Committee has always recognised that the opportunity for appropriate legal challenge is a necessary part of an effective and fair asylum system, which is why I believe this amendment has significant merit. Turning to Lords Amendment 7b, this is a modified version of the original Lords Amendment 7. The original amendment disapplied Section 57 of the Illegal Migration Act in its entirety, meaning that people claiming to be children could appeal against a decision that they are over 18. Lords Amendment 7b instead inserts into Section 57 of the Illegal Migration Act a new subsection. And in moving Amendment 7b, the noble Baroness Lister explained, the amendment in lieu is much more modest and in effect meets the Commons formal objection to the original amendment. It would permit an age disputed child to be removed to Rwanda with it, sorry, it would permit an age disputed child to be removed to Rwanda with a pending challenge on a limited basis, but only if a proper age assessment has first been carried out by a local authority. During its Channel Crossings inquiry, the Home Affairs Select Committee heard examples of safeguarding processes failing across various parts of the asylum system, including cases of children being mistaken for adults, for which is why I believe that the Government must look again at this amendment. Lord's Amendment 9, um, on modern slavery, adds a new clause to the Bill to create an exception relating to the removal of victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. The new clause states that a person with a positive reasonable gr grounds decision from the National Referral Mechanism must not be removed to Rwanda until they have received a conclusive grounds decision, and that a person with a positive conclusive grounds decision must not be removed without the decision maker considering the effect on their physical or mental health or safety. The Government have proposed Amendment A in lieu of Lords Amendment 9, and it would require the Secretary of State to publish an annual report about the operation of the Act as it relates to modern slavery and human trafficking provisions in Article 13 of the Rwanda Treaty. So again, the Home Affairs Select Committee's recent report on human trafficking expresses our concerns that the government is prioritising irregular migration issues at the expense of tackling human trafficking. Human trafficking is not an immigration offence, it is an exploitation offence, mm -hmm. and the two must not be conflated. Lords Amendment 9 would provide a vital safeguard for victims of human trafficking and I hope again the Government will look at that. Finally, Lords Amendment 10b. Um, this is a modified version of Lords Amendment 10 and like the original amendment it provides an exemption for people who supported our armed forces overseas or who have otherwise been agents or allies of the UK overseas. Lords Amendment 10b includes a new subsection which states that a person who intends to rely on this exemption must give the Secretary of State notice as soon as reasonably practicable to allow prompt verification of available records. In moving Amendment 10b, the noble Lord Brown said, we are told that men who brave death, courted injury and are forced into exile as a result of assisting our armed forces in fighting the Taliban are now to be published for arriving here by irregular routes even where, owing to wrongful refusals on our part or possible malfeasance on the part of the Special Forces, they have been compelled to take these routes in the first place. And we know that currently families from Afghanistan who helped our armed forces and subsequently fled to Pakistan are at imminent risk of deportation back to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. This is despite ministerial reassurances that a route for eligible separated Afghan families to come to the UK would be established. It seems to me and many others that the UK has a moral duty to offer sanctuary to those brave Afghans who put their lives on the line to support our troops and who are now, and now face persecution as a consequence. The idea that we would attempt to outsource this duty is frankly shameful. The Lord's Amendment before us today would go some way to providing safeguards and assurances that the UK will uphold its moral and legal obligations in the implementation of the Rwanda policy. Sir Robert Buckland. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I will try and beat the record, the extraordinary record of my honourable friend, the Member for Stone, who spoke yeah, for yeah. princely two minutes uh, today. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful to him for setting that new record, uh, his personal best, I think. Um, but um, I will um, 
in dealing uh, with the amendments in turn. First of all, return to a theme that I have warmed to in the past about Clause 1 of this Bill, which I think is an abomination. Uh, it's exactly the worst sort of legislative drafting that we should be discouraging, because it, it, it at best is declaratory legislation, which I think is never helpful, and at worst uh, sets up all sorts of potential legal arguments. I think the attempt by the Lords to amend it further probably makes the situation even worse, which is why I will not be supporting uh, Amendment uh, 1. Um, having said that, in I will give way to, to the hon my honourable friend. That's especially to hear my right honourable friend, and I was delighted to hear what he just said. At last, he's seen the light. I, I, I've always walked in sunlight, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is others, perhaps, who have walked through a veil of shadows. Um, but uh, we will draw a veil uh, uh, over that. What I would say to my honourable friend, in, in the spirit of his uh, helpful intervention, is that uh, on a previous occasion I mentioned to him how I thought that uh, Clause 5 of this Bill uh, was unnecessary. It's even more necessary now because the reforms that I referred to in a previous speech on this Bill about uh, Rule 39 have now, of course, been clarified by practice direction. And the threshold that the European Court will apply will be, a, again, a much higher one. And I think, therefore, the occasions where we could see it invoked in the Rwanda case will be vanishingly small, because, in fact, non-existent, because it seems to me that any harm that might be judged to have been caused is clearly revocable uh, in, in the form of a return of those individuals from Rwanda in the first place. That, frankly, should have been the position last time round. I think that the reforms of the European Court make it even clearer. But that makes, I think, a very powerful general point which supports the excellent arguments made by my honourable friend from Rise of Northwood about uh, the direction of travel of the court. And I agree with him strongly about the recent climate change decision. I think it was a wrong turn. I think we should be going back very much to fundamental human rights, not talking about socio-economic rights or trying to create everything into some form of right. Uh, surely it is better to legislate in the form of statutory duty and obligation by public bodies rather than creating nebulous rights that then become the province of the courts. But herein lies the difficulty I think we still encounter in uh, the second b b batch of amendments, namely uh, uh, the amendments that now form in, in the form of the Lord's Message, uh, Amendments uh, 3, uh, B and C, which I am still minded to support. Whether we like it or not, the uh, Supreme Court uh, was in a position where it assessed evidence and substituted its own view for that of the decision makers. Now, the noble Lord, Lord Howard of Limpney, made a very powerful speech in the other place about the, uh, the wisdom or otherwise of going down that road. Uh, I agree with a lot of what the noble Lord said. Uh, I do not like it when I see uh, uh, courts of higher record, in effect, uh, relitigating matters of evidence, which is what the Supreme Court did. But that is the situation that we, we live in. Uh, that is why this bill has come forward. And my abiding concern about a deeming provision, although it is not unprecedented, I accept, is that it should be matched by reality. And that is why I do press my right honourable friend to answer some of the points made in the other place about the progress being made by the government of Rwanda to legislate not only the, its treaty obligations, I know it's a modest system, so the treaty is already in force, but to carry out the uh, obligations that it agreed to in the treaty, namely the reform of its appeal system, uh, the use of trained uh, advisers, all the measures that will go a huge way, not just to reassure me, but to reassure any court that might be seized of this matter uh, in the near future, that indeed all is proceeding well. And indeed, uh, I have to say that uh, the, 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 the noble uh, Lord, the, the, the Lord Advocate, the, the Scottish Lord Advocate, seem to concede the point in the other place about there needing to be full treaty implementation um, or, 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 before the treaty itself is ratified. And if that is the case, then I really think we're arguing over very little at all here, which is why I still commend uh, those particular amendments. Now, now dealing uh, then with... Um, 
the, uh, the, the next questions, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, which uh, relates to um, uh, the, uh, uh, the arguments, I think, again, very trenchantly put by my honourable friend from Rysnook Northwood. Um, I agree with him about the danger of proxy judicial reviews based upon the Children Act and, and care legislation. I do think we need to take very great care about that, but I, like him, am not persuaded that there is merit in supporting the Lord's amendments o o on that particular issue. And I am also encouraged though still concerned uh, about the modern-day slavery position. I'm encouraged that the government here, uh, and, uh, alone amongst its response to the other Lords' amendments, has come up with an amendment in lieu, which I am prepared to support, bearing in mind the very sensitive and important nature of this legislation, the need to avoid us riding a coach and horses through the progress that we've made in terms of uh, this country's leadership on modern day slavery. But I am prepared to give him the benefit of that doubt and su to support it. But latterly, I still have concerns about a class of people who served our country, who endured great danger uh, in Afghanistan, who still find themselves in danger in, in a third country, namely Pakistan, and who may well fall foul of, uh, I think, a, an entirely unintended consequence, but one that could occur as a result of this legislation, however well-intentioned it may be. And my abiding concern about those people who uh, have made a sacrifice for our country, I'm afraid, remains, which is why I'm still not persuaded on uh, uh, 10B. I do think the government has moved. This is the iterative process that we are in. Uh, with the Lord's messages, uh, and I agree with my, uh, the Honourable uh, Lady, the Member for Hull North, in, in reminding us of the invaluable role that the Deliberative Chamber has in making sure that legislation is tested uh, and that it, it is up to the level of events. And, and I don't think we should uh, uh, ignore uh, what was said in the Lords about the evidential situ situation in Rwanda. That is the reality. And that is why I think that when we pass legislation here, we should do everything we can to avoid legislative fiction. It's not good uh, law. It, it creates a, a glass jaw, frankly, that can be broken by litigation and by judicial challenge. And once again, the courts are back in a position where I don't think any of us least of all conservative constitutionalists want to see them put. Let's legislate uh, it, 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 with care on this matter and let's get it right. Thank you. Just to um, order, just to remind the House that uh, due to the pressure of time, uh, the debate on hospices um, is now not taking place tonight and I know that there's a lot of interest in that so we will hope that that will be reprogrammed as soon as possible. Uh, and also uh, that, uh, just to remind everybody that we're, not tr we're trying not to put a time limit on, but Madam Deputy Speaker did encourage seven minute contributions, no more, so please could you tailor your speeches accordingly. Beth Winter. Uh, speaker. I rise in support of the Lord's Amendments, which I will be voting to retain this evening, and I will keep my comments brief. And in particular, I want to express the need for the House to support Lord's Amendment 6B. It has already been discussed how, under the Government's preferred wording of Clause 4, a court still cannot consider the risk of refoulement by Rwanda in contravention of any of its international obligations, even though this was the very risk highlighted by the UK Supreme Court. Lord's Amendment 6B reinstates the protection that the Government wishes to remove. The Amendment 6B would omit Clause 4 and replaces it with a clause which seeks to restore the ability of decision makers to consider whether Rwanda is a safe country and restores jurisdiction of domestic courts and tribunals to grant interim <coughs> relief a temporary injunction preventing a removal. I wanted to note in particular, during the most recent Lord's stage, the previous version of the amendment rejected by this House was changed. It now adds the stipulation that any interim relief be for, and I quote, no longer than strictly necessary for the fair and expeditious determination of the case. The lead member on this in the amendment in the other House, Baroness Chakrabarti, said this is a significant concession 
and that it is a genuine legislative olive branch to the executive. Mr Deputy Speaker, the executive of the government should accept that it is an improvement to the bill, and rather than neutering the powers of decision makers or the courts, it will allow for better decision making in the asylum process. Mr Deputy Speaker, it remains my firm view that the Rwanda Bill is an affront to international law, human rights and the rule of law more widely, and it really does set a dangerous precedent to other nations <coughs> who wish to ignore the law, cause harm, demonise and exploit vulnerable people who are in need, desperate need of our... Yes, I would be right. I thank my friend for giving way. She will be aware that there are many people all over Europe, particularly in the Council of Europe, that have expressed grave concern about this piece of legislation, which in effect is outsourcing our international obligations under all aspects of humanitarian law. And if we pass this legislation into law, many others will follow and Europe will be turning its back on yeah. refugee problems it has often helped to create. Yeah. Yes, I fully agree that this does really set a dangerous precedent. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to add that I'm pleased to say that the disgracefulness of this piece of legislation is recognised in Wales by the Welsh Government, who have withheld legislative consent on similar draconian pieces of legislation and describes this bill as cruel, inhumane, unworkable and unethical and really does set a significantly horrific precedent for other countries to follow and I am so proud that in Wales we are looking to establish a nation of sanctuary where we welcome, understand and celebrate the unique contribution that asylum seekers fleeing horrific situations can contribute to um, our country of Cymru. So this bill is an assault on our checks and balances, on our scrutiny of those powers and, quite frankly, is unamendable and should be thrown out yeah. wholesale. But given that that is unlikely to happen, in a true attempt to make a bad bill less bad, I will support Amendment 6B and the other amendments before the House this evening. Dear Thank you very much, Dr. Farham. The Deputy Speaker, uh, I rise to support the amendments um, that the government is seeking to overturn from the uh, the other place this evening. Uh, the, the issue of mass migration of people, uh, refugees, people uh, fleeing from the consequences of climate change, people maybe seeking just a better life for themselves, people fleeing from war <coughs> and persecution is a huge and serious global problem, and this bill is a deeply unserious response to it. Uh, the Rwanda bill has become, if you like, a byword for conservative incompetence, for waste of public money and indeed at times deep and unpleasant uh, cruelty. Um, the minister um, didn't take any interventions as his entire right to, to do, I think basically because he was suggesting he'd heard all this before and in, in more detail, more explicitly, the right honourable member for Stone said uh, this was just a debate all about repetition. Too right it's all about repetition. If the government keeps coming back here with ridiculous legislation, we'll keep opposing it. And, and the Lords are well within their rights. As somebody who passionately believes in democratisation of the House of Lords, nevertheless, this is a piece of legislation that was not in the government's manifesto uh, at the last general election and which the House of Lords has every right to seek to amend and to scrutinise. And the amendments that we're looking at are hardly deeply radical and shocking. I mean, so Amendment 1B, for instance, asks that the government and this legislation should have due regard for international and domestic law. That's colossally uh, revolutionary. No, it isn't. No, the, the fact that the government has, no, has somehow got a problem with any uh, having due regard for international or domestic law is deeply problematic to me, and should be deeply problematic to most people who would consider themselves to be uh, conservative. Um, we think about the issue of safety. There are a variety of uh, amendments here in front of us, 3B, 3C, 6B, which allude to this and which are all important, and I would seek to support all of them. As has been said by others, it is nonsense for this government or any government to seek to try and make something so just by saying it that it is 
And we've had many other colourful examples as to what, the, what other things we could just will to be the case. I, 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 I declare Blackburn Rovers back in the Premier League and Chris Sutton and Alan Shearer both back in their 20s. Um, and th th this, this is not how the world works. And, and we, we must recognise that if the government now believes it has evidence to suggest that Rwanda is a safe place, fair enough. Present the evidence to the court. That's what you do if you're behaving like a normal, constitutional, conservative, or indeed a constitutional uh, Democrat of any other uh, kind. Um, with regard to uh, Amendment 9B, which talks about the uh, issue of protecting uh, victims and potential victims of modern slavery, the former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, is rightly proud, and this government should retain some pride in the modern slavery legislation. This is an amendment that would not actually prevent the Rwanda programme uh, taking place. It would just prevent those people who are potentially at risk of modern slavery from being part of the uh, of that deportation. There is no reasonable justification for any reasonable government to object to Amendment 9b and 10b. Like other people, in, in other uh, honourable and right honourable members in this place and outside of it at this moment, I have spoken to people who escaped Afghanistan, who had been helping uh, the, um, the, 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 the police uh, against the, uh, the Taliban and indeed helping UK armed forces against the Taliban ban but were left behind and the only way they could seek safety was to buy irregular routes and eventually to cross the channel and end up in the United Kingdom. 10B allows the individual I'm thinking of that I met in Barrow uh, a few w uh, months ago, who by the way is being well served by uh, my uh, honourable friend and neighbour, uh, his uh, member, uh, it, it would allow him the right to be here and not to be removed. It's about Britain doing the right thing and maintaining its obligations to people who put their lives on the line to protect us and to protect our forces. But I said this is a, a deeply unserious, unserious bill to deal with a massively serious problem. The least serious thing that was said today by the Minister was that this bill constitutes any form of deterrence. The simple fact is that one in every 200, if the government gets its own way and everything goes absolutely perfectly, one in every 200 asylum seekers here might just get sent to Rwanda. What nonsense. The idea that someone has a, 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 a fled the, the murderous tyrant Isaias Afwerki in Eritrea, uh, left that country because they were going to be conscripted to murder their own people. They've crossed the hellhole that is Libya. They've been across uh, the Mediterranean, for pity's sake. They've gone across the rest of Europe. They're faced with what? A, 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 a relatively small body of water to cross to get to the United Kingdom and a 0.5% chance of being sent to Rwanda. That that deters anyone. Who is the minister trying to kid? This is a ridiculous waste of money. The money spent on Rwanda so far could have done many things, one of which would have been employed more than 6,000 caseworkers to help re remove those people who are not genuine asylum seekers. That would actually be a deterrent. Instead, we have this nonsense. We, I, I, I better not, because I'm, I'm taking up much time. I'll simply finish with this. I, I'm sure I'm going to agree with whatever the honourable gentleman would have said. I simply want to say this, that this is a bill uh, riddled with pretense. The pretense above all that this would be a deterrent to anybody, a ridiculous waste of taxpayers' money, deeply uncruel. If Rwanda is a safe place, it will deter no one from coming here and then being sent there. If it is an unsafe place, no decent government would ever propose to send anyone to it. You cannot have it both ways. You have it neither. Speaker. This bill casts a shadow over the reputation of this place and over our country as one where the rule of law is valued and respected. It is a matter of grave concern that the government seems determined to ignore the many legal experts and human rights organisations that have voiced serious and fundamental concerns about this bill. As Lord Macdonald of Salford, a crossbench peer and former permanent secretary at the Foreign Office, set out clearly in the press over the weekend, the bill declares as fact that Rwanda is safe enough to provide shelter for vulnerable people fleeing for persecution in their home countries, and that not only must British courts accept that Rwanda is safe, they cannot question that assertion, even in the light of new evidence that Rwanda may no longer be safe. Surely all of us in this place know how quickly political change can arise in any state. 
It is nonsensical for the government to make such a declaration about the safety of Rwanda, but to, do, but to do so when the impact on vulnerable people has the potential to be so severe and affect their fundamental human rights and their safety is irresponsible and reckless. Yeah. Amnesty International UK are among those urging the government to drop this divisive and dangerous piece of legislation. They have called the bill an affront to international law, human rights and the rule of law more widely. And they have warned that, if passed, it will leave the UK in serious conflict with its international human rights obligations, send a dangerous signal that other nations are free to show similar disdain for their obligations under international law, and harm people who are powerless, vulnerable to demonisation, and readily and cruelly exploited. The Law Society has described the bill as flawed, and that it undermines the important British... It undermines important British values such as the rule of law and protection for victims, damages the UK's constitutional balance and will ultimately prove unworkable while costing the UK taxpayer a great deal of money. They have also highlighted research which suggests that 61% of people think the government should either accept some amendments to the Rwanda policy or scrap it altogether. Liberty has described this bill as a constitutionally extraordinary piece of legislation, yeah. adding that in several places its provisions advance into some potentially dangerous positions. For a government to get to this point, to try to put through legislation that human rights experts describe as potentially dangerous is truly shocking. Yeah. Why is it that the government thinks that it can ride roughshod over international law and human rights? Yeah. The amendments that we are considering today would, among other things, require the government to give due regard to domestic and international law, a most important principle that no one could dispute, allow ministers, officials and courts to consider whether Rwanda is safe on a case-by-case -case basis and remove the risk of unaccompanied children being inadvertently sent to Rwanda. Amendment 6b, for example, would allow the Court or Tribunal to grant an interim remedy that prevents or delays, or that has the effect of preventing or delaying, the removal of the person to the Republic of Rwanda, providing such prevention or delays of no longer, is for no longer than strictly necessary for the fair and expeditious determination of the case. Surely any reasonable government would want to ensure it had the power to do this. There is still time for the government to drop this horrendous bill and I urge them to do so and I also urge all members across this house who care about the rule of law our international reputation and the seriousness with which we should address our international responsibilities to support the amendments from the other place and vote against the government's motions tonight yeah, yeah. Right, Webb. thank you mr. deputy speaker the dangers to any nation whose government seeks to put itself above the law and the courts are clear and the late Tony Benn put it well when he said that how governments treat refugees is an indication how they would treat their own citizens yeah. if they thought they could get away with it. This government's contempt for the people of the UK is revealed by the assault on the rule of law that this bill represents. It is also self-evident that a country does not become safe it does not become a safe destination just because a government declares it so. Human Rights Watch latest analysis of Rwanda is clear that repression of free speech, arbitrary detention, illegal treatment and torture <laughs> remain widespread. The noble Baroness Shakabati's amendment is an attempt to remove one of the most damaging aspects of this bill and restore the primacy of law above the whims and ambitions of politicians in asylum applications and to prevent the government simply declaring blanket fashion that Rwanda is safe because they wish it to be and want to deport those fleeing terrible dangers who reach our shores, including, let's not forget, children. By denying access to a court to challenge the safety of the Rwanda Bill as not being compatible with the UK's international obligation is to shame our country. As I have said before, the only real solution to this malignant and discriminatory bill is actually to scrap it altogether. But at the very least, its worst aspects must be mitigated, and that includes the need to restore the jurisdiction of the domestic courts as to the safety of Rwanda 
and the power to grant interim injunctions and, at the very least, to look at matters on a case-by-case -case basis. I therefore support Amendment 6B and all other amendments from the other place, and I urge all honourable and right honourable members in this House to do the same. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yeah. And following John Macdonald, with Leader of the House, the Minister will respond. John Macdonald. I only want to make four brief points, really, and it's based upon um, my experience in my own constituency. I think um, at the height of the number of asylum seekers being placed in hotels, I think I had the largest number, to, and I think I still have. I had two and a half thousand asylum seekers in my constituency, um, and I welcome them. I welcome them. I welcome them into our, our community, and our community is, as um, I think, as always in Hayes and Harlington, they've risen to support people in need. So I was proud of the local community. And the lessons I've got from dealing with those asylum seekers, touring around the hotels, dealing with casework, in fact, one of the hotels is actually next to my constituency office. Um, four points, really. One is the point that the Honourable Member for Westmoreland and Lonsdale made, is that these are desperate people. They are desperate people, and they will not be deterred to co coming here but, uh, having experienced what they have experienced back in their home country and also in the way in which they've travelled here and the desperate circumstances that they're in in both instances, they will not be deterred by this legislation. And it, it, it just, for them, they, they know the same as we do, that this is a political stunt rather than anything else, certainly. I thank my friend for giving way on this point. It's been my privilege to visit Calais on a number of occasions over the past few years. I've had many conversations with people there. They're desperate, they're poor, they're hungry, they're homeless, they're victims of war and human rights abuses, and they're being treated as though they're enemies of the whole community here. They're not. They're people trying to survive in a very difficult world, and our message seems to be the opposite of all the humanitarian law that's been passed into common parlance over the past 70 years. Uh, sort of follow what my friend has said. The other lesson I've learned from meeting the, this wide range of asylum seekers is what skills they can bring to our country and how desperate they are to make a contribution. And all they want is for their case to be processed because the vast majority of them, even those detained in the two detention centres in my constituency, the majority will actually win their cases and then be received into the community. The problem that they have is the processing situation means that they have to t travel here not through the normal processing. And secondly, when they get here, they're waiting anything up to two years just to have their case heard. So I don't think the, in any way this will deter desperate people from coming in that way. The second point I make relates to the amendment with, with regard to uh, the assessment of children. The honourable member for Ryslip Pinner and Northland is, is not here, and he made reference to both of us because we're both members of Parliament representing the London Borough of Hillingdon that has accepted more unaccompanied children than any other um, borough itself um, because of the, the proximity of Heathrow within our constituencies. Um, We've had a problem with age assessments, and the problem has not been the one that the media hone in upon, which is elderly people being assessed as children. It's the other way around. Children being forced through the process of all of this, which actually can be really demeaning and can impact upon their mental health, and then eventually being found to be children, as all the statistics demonstrate. So it's a brutal system, and all this amendment is doing is making sure that assessment is done by those who are experienced in that assessment process, which is local authorities. The third point I want to make, because of my experience with asylum seekers in my constituency, is with regard to Afghans who have come here, who have worked alongside the military within Afghan, our own military within Afghanistan, and then again, I believe, have been dramatically let down by our own government, left there with their families in desperate plight, often 
having to go from house to house hiding and recognizing when they go to house to hide in accommodation in Afghanistan they're putting that family at risk and then some of them the advice that they were given is get to the nearest border and so they get to the nearest border one of which is Iran then they get sent back or Pakistan and then they get sent back again and if they can break through that system and get here then what happens is, is they're treated almost like criminals even though they've often put their lives at risk in supporting this country. Now the Minister has said today he'll be reviewed, there's a review of the Arab scheme going on and that will be taken into account and that seems the solution. All I can say is that review needs to be undertaken immediately but whilst it's going on can I urge the government to exempt those people who've served us in Afghanistan from this process at least whilst that review is taking place. Otherwise, we'll be finding, we'll be sending people back, to, but sending to, to people to Rwanda who I think we deserve some loyalty to, but also who have experienced quite traumatic um, dangers to their lives in, in serving, serving us. Final point I make is this. I heard one person on the radio this morning, a Conservative MP, justifying this overriding of domestic law and the courts themselves as though this was some rebalancing between the executive and the courts. Um, it's not a rebalancing, it's riding roughshed over the system of law that we have in this country of respect for the decisions of the courts themselves. And I just, I just say, I give a warning to the, uh, the government and uh, the party opposite. This actually places an awful lot of power, sets a precedent of placing an awful lot of power in the hands of the executive. Just think what a government with a huge majority could do in using that precedent in the future. And you know that unbalancing that's happening at the moment is one in which it places the ultimate decisions between f what is reality and unreality in the hands of a government. I think people will live to regret setting that precedent if we're not very, very careful. This bill is a rubbish bill. It should be thrown out. And I congratulate those members in the House of Lords and the other place that are doing their best to at least some, bring some sense towards it. Regrettably, we won't be able to throw this bill out, but at least what we can do tonight is vote for these amendments and send a message back to the other place is keep fighting on this bill because at least they have some sense of reality of what these people who seek an asylum in this country are experiencing. Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with leave of the House, um, I would like to remind the House that I opened by saying that we were not quite at the point of completing each other's sentences, but perhaps, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are there now. My honourable friend, the member for Stone, hinted that I might be in danger of repeating myself, and so I'll make sure that I keep my remarks to the point. Can I thank honourable and right honourable members for their contributions? I thank, as always, the honourable member for Aberavon um, for the way that he conducts himself. He reminds us that he is an inveterate optimist, um, as perhaps you have to be sitting on the Labour benches. But um, it's right to say that it has been a good nature debate, despite some uncharacteristic heckling from the Shadow um, Secretary of State, and I had some gentle chiding from the Honourable Member for Westmoreland and Lonsdale, who gently chided me um, for not giving way. But I was pleased that I didn't give way to the Honourable Member for Brent North, not least because he said his intervention was in relation to Amendment 2, which doesn't appear on the order paper, it's not on the list, and it's not being debated. Um, the Honourable Member for Glasgow Central, I thank her, as always, for her contributions. She'll be pleased to know um, that we disagree again. That will, be, that will reassure her, um, but I'm sure her campaign will continue. My honourable friend, the member for Ryslip, Norwood and Pinner, as always, uh, made some serious points. Uh, just on his point in relation to the two local authorities, and it's, it's also relevant to the right honourable gentleman, the member for Hayes and Harlington's point, I met recently with the leader of Hillingdon Council, Councillor Ian Edwards, and I discussed um, some of these issues and some of these pressures. I'm very grateful um, to my honourable friend, the member for Ryslip, Norwood and Pinner for his contributions. Um, he tempted me to go down a certain path that's unnecessary, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in relation to the ECHR and a recent judgment. And indeed, my right honourable learned friend, the member for Sw South Swindon, 
also tempted me uh, to go down that certain path, but I'm going to resist uh, that temptation for the time being. The Right Honourable Lady, the uh, Chairman of the Select Committee, she mentioned a desire to debate the treaty, but Mr Deputy Speaker, it's, uh, may I just gently suggest to her that we've had ample opportunity to debate the treaty, not least as part of the proceedings on relation to this bill. But may I respond to my right honourable learned friend's points um, in this way? Um, he mentioned a temptation um, for amendments, and a liking indeed, for amendments 3, uh, B and C. And he asks me what progress has been made. Can I re reassure him that progress has been made? And can I reassure him once again that the government will only ratify the treaty once we agree with Rwanda that all necessary implementation is in place for both countries to comply with their obligations under the treaty. He also rightly asked, as did other members, uh, honourable and right honourable, from across the House about Amendment 10b. And I merely repeat the point that this government recognises the commitment and responsibility that comes with combat veterans, whether our own or those who showed courage by serving alongside us. We will not let them down. Mr Deputy Speaker, I invite all right honourable, uh, honourable members to join us in the government lobbies. This will allow us to get flights off the ground to disrupt the business model of the people smugglers who are exploiting vulnerable people. I beg to move. Thank you very much. Uh, I am expecting uh, several divisions. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 1B, as may that opinion say, aye. aye. On the contrary, no. No! Vision, clear the lobby. Uh, the question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 1B. Is Mayor that opinion say aye? Aye. Or the contrary, no? No. Tell us for the ayes, Mike Wood, Amanda Soloway, tell us for the noes, Andrew Weston, Tonya and Tonyazzi.
The eyes to the right, 315. The nose to the left, 250. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 315. The nose to the left, 250. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. We now come to Lord's Amendments 3B and 3C. Minister, to move the motion to disagree formally. To move. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments 3B and 3C. As many of that have been say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. 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 Order. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments 3B and 3C. So may that have been say aye. Aye. And three no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Amanda Soloway, Mike Wood. Tell us for the noes, Tonya Antoniazzi and Andrew Weston.
Oder, oder. The eyes to the right, 317. The nose to the left, 246. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 317. The nose to the left, 246. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Order. Order. Under the programme order of the 18th of March, I must now put the questions necessary to bring to a conclusion proceedings on the Lord's message. We now come to Lord's Amendment 6B, Minister, to move the motion to disagree formally. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 6B. As Mel Abbott say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. No! Vision, clear the lobby. Order. Order. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 6B. Is now that we say aye? Aye. On the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes. Mike Wood and Amanda Soloway. Tell us for the noes. Andrew Weston and Tonya Antoniazzi.
The eyes to the right, 319. The nose to the left, 249. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 319. The nose to the left, 249. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. We now come to Lord's Amendment 7B. Minister to move motion to disagree formally. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 7B. We know that up here say aye. aye. Uh, the contrary, no. no. Vision, clear the lobby. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 7B. Is Mr. Anna say aye? Aye. Contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Amanda Soloway, Mike Wood. Tell us for the noes, Tony Antoniazzi and Andrew Weston.
Order. Order. The eyes to the right, 319. The nose to the left, 249. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 319. The nose to the left, 249. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Two more to go. We now come to Lords Amendment 9, and I call the Minister to move the motion. To move. The question is that this House insists on its disagreement with the Lords in their Amendment 9, but proposes Amendment A in lieu. As many of that have been say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Clear the vision, clear the lobby. Order. The question is that this House insists on its disagreement with the Lords in their Amendment 9, but proposes Amendment A in lieu. As many of them may say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Mike Wood, Amanda Soloway. Tell us for the noes, Andrew Weston, Antonia Antoniazzi.
oder oder the eyes to the right 320 the nose to the left 246 thank you the eyes to the right 320 the nose to the left, 246. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it unlocked. And finally, we now come to Lord's Amendment 10B. Minister to move motion to disagree. Paul. I beg to move. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 10B. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Vision. Clear the lobby. Order. Members could resume their seats, please. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 10B. As many have been say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the eyes, Amanda Solomy, Mike Wood. Tell us for the nose, Tony Antoniazzi and Andrew Western.
Order, order. The eyes to the right, 312. The nose to the left, 253. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 312. The nose to the left, 253. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. <coughs> Minister to move that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons. I beg to move that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to certain of their amendments. That Michael Tomlinson, Scott Mann, Kieran Mullen, <coughs> James Sunderland, Stephen Kinnock, Colleen Fletcher and Alison Thewlis be members of the committee, that Michael Tomlinson be chair of the committee, yeah, yeah. that three be the quorum of the committee, that the committee do withdraw immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to their amendments 1B, 3B, 3C, 6B, 7B and 10B, that Michael Tomlinson, Scott Mann, Kieran Mullen, James Sunderland, Stephen Kinnock, Colleen Fletcher, Alison Thewlis be members of the committee. That Michael Tomlinson be the chair of the committee. That three be the quorum of the committee, and that the committee do withdraw immediately. As many other people say aye. 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 No. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes consideration of the Lord's message relating to the safety of Rwanda asylum and immigration bill. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Neil Hanley. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this debate, uh, the subject of this debate, has been thrust into the spotlight in recent weeks. On the 4th of March, Michael Salenberger's WPATH file, support by Mia Hughes, was published, swiftly followed last week by Dr Hilary Cass's eponymous report. Both make this clear. Gender identity and sex are completely different things, but ideological capture has blurred the lines. Early in the 90s, uh, I was asked a question by a relative who was volunteering for the Samaritans, and she was speaking to a transvestite male who was struggling with his mental health, and did I, as a gay man, have any advice? And I was bemused by the question because the only advice I could muster was that I had absolutely no insight whatsoever into cross-dressing behaviours as most transvestites were heterosexual males. The notion that there is such a thing as an LGBT person is ludicrous. Homosexuality is an innate sexual orientation centred on one's natal sex. I am neither lesbian, bisexual or trans. I'm a gay male. Working with others who are same-sex attracted on shared LGB rights has always made sense to me. As I've illustrated, there was a time in the not-too-distant past when heterosexual cross-dressers were confused with what it meant to be a gay male. There is little evidence of any T in the LGB. As they were then, what we now call gender identity and sex remain completely unconnected concepts and they must not be confused. I started working in the NHS when I was 19 years old. And since then, I have had a continuing re responsibility for child safeguarding, uh, which continues to this day. In 2019, I assumed that professional knowledge and academic experience would have been of value to my then political party, the SNP, as it attempted to grapple with gender recognition reform legislation. But I was wrong. Uh, I was an SNP candidate and the chair of Fife Pride back then, when I then met my then friend Shirley Ann Somerville for a coffee to discuss my safeguarding concerns over gender recognition reform. In addition to her cabinet secretary role, uh, she was also covering the equalities brief. This was someone who I had known for years, someone who knew my family. I covered all the bases, emphasising exemplar cases like local sex offender Lennon Dolotowski, also known as Katie, who had been accused of sex offences in Miss Somerville's constituency and convicted of, a sex of sexually assaulting a 10-year-old girl in the constituency Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath, which I was contesting. Despite assuring me throughout that conversation that she fully understood the concerns I raised, she concluded telling me in no uncertain terms... This was Nicola's priority. 
so I should just have, I would have to keep my views to myself. In other words, I was being told to be silent on safeguarding. I told her that's not something I would be able to do. I couldn't be silent on the matter of safeguarding children. Soon after that meeting, the attacks from the gender radical wings of the SNP, the Greens, Labour and the Lib Dems began. Since 2019, and indeed before that, people who have had concerns about LGB rights and safeguarding of children and young people have been systematically silenced, and not just by the SNP. As recognised by the Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, and again today in the Chamber by the Secretary of State for Health, there has been a deep-rooted capture within our institutions, with senior leaders ignoring the actual law and ideologically captured groups like Stonewall who misrepresent it. I will give. I will give way. Can I commend all the work of Caldy and Cowdenbeat for bringing this forward? And it is a, an issue we touched upon in a, a statement earlier on today. Does the honourable member not agree that we have a duty, I believe, to protect children of all backgrounds from the lobbying groups who abuse the system to promote a harmful ideology? And that multinational companies like Starbucks is an example who have supported charities such as Mermaids. It is time that the, the, these and those types of charities advocating for those as young as 14 years of old should rethink their charitable endeavours and they should so instead into charities that help protect our children and they must be left alone to let kids be kids. I, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for that uh, intervention and I, I made this point earlier uh, today uh, during the statement, but the tentacles and influence of Stonewall need to be rooted out of every institution across these islands. It has been my long-held view that the agenda Stonewall have pushed has seen queer, queer theory-based policies insinuate their way into every public body, into policing, education... Or, or order. We just have to go through the choreography, I'm afraid, because we've hit 10 o'clock. Can you move the agenda? I beg to move this House to now adjourn. The question is that this House to now adjourn. Please uh, <laughs> carry on. I wonder why the mics were uh, cutting out, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I, so I'll go back a, 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 a step. So uh, some will have pushed uh, queer theory-based policies into every public body, including policing, education, health, and even onto the floor of the House of Commons, where straight women tell gay men to get back in their closet. The decision by Stonewall to add the T and incorporate cross-dressing heterosexual males under the wide banner of trans, or the more recently added Q+, was directly responsible for the elevation of concern amongst LGB people, women and transsexuals. The damage done by Stonewall has been immeasurable. LGB people, women, transsexuals have all been subjected to vitriolic attacks from queer theory activists who hide their vicious and vindictive mob behaviour behind hashtags like Be Kind. I could give a roll call of those who have stood up to this mob or been dragged through the media and the courts for vexatious purposes, but would, I would be on my feet all week. I also want to put it on record that the Labour Party leadership need to come out of hiding on this issue. The Shadow Health Secretary's recent Damascene moment of realisation doesn't mask the continued silence from the Leader of the Opposition or quell the ideological contingent of the Parliamentary Labour Party. That's not good enough in a general election year. People across these islands need to know this nightmare is coming to an end before they cast their votes. I'm encouraged by the emergence of uh, sex, equality and equity networks known as SCENES uh, across the public sector who now challenge this harmful ideological capture. Silence won't cut it. This indoctrination is causing very real and lasting damage. But the impact on those of us who spoke up has been nothing in comparison to the evil of medical malpractice visited on many vulnerable young people. Many of them were just lesbian, gay or bisexual, or young people dealing with trauma, mental health issues, neurodivergence and those in the care system. As Sex Matters, now a recognised human rights charity, have highlighted, and I quote, a false global consensus around a gender-affirming approach has emerged because of ideological actors putting their individual belief systems ahead of the protection of distressed young people, many of whom are lesbian, gay and bisexual. The WPATH files 
uh, shone a light on the lack of evidence to support so-called gender-affirming care and the ideo ideological bias of documents masquerading as clinical standards. Tragically, for children in the UK, WPATH standards of care have been extremely influential in shaping NHS protocols since 2011. Young people and many others have been so badly failed. The CAST review must be the final nail in the coffin for gender-affirming model of care for gender-distressed children. Dr CAS builds on the concerns set out in the WPATH files report which lifted the lid on the culture inside the World Professional Association of Transgender Healthcare. The CAS report also criticises WPATH guidelines as lacking in evidence, developmental rigour and emphasises the vital need for fully informed consent, especially for young people with mental health conditions or other diagnosable comorbidities. I would ask the Minister to discuss with colleagues in health to consider an urgent package of investment in child and adolescent mental health services as a starting point. That WPATH's unscientific standards of care guidelines have repeatedly been lauded by governments as international best practice is another issue of deep concern and I ask the Minister if they will commit to look into the reasons why this was allowed to happen. Dr Cass dismisses any notion that puberty blockers or hormones have any part in standard treatment for under 18s. The report explicitly states that medical, the medical pathway will not be right for most young people with gender distress and I quote, the focus on the use of puberty blockers for managing gender related distress has overshadowed the possibility that evidence based treatments, other evidence based treatments may be more effective. Clinicians have told us they are unable to determine with any certainty which children and young people will go on to have an enduring trans identity. She decisively refutes the idea that suicide prevention is a reason for medicalising gender distress in youth, saying it has been suggested that hormone treatment reduces the elevated risk of death by suicide in this population, but the evidence found did not support this conclusion. Gender distress has been treated within the NHS in a way that is different from other sorts of distress to the detriment of vulnerable children. The CAS review uh, definitively shows that young people with gender distress have been badly let down by those that claimed to be protecting them. It substantiates what so many, including Hannah Barnes and Helen Joyce, have argued, that gender-affirming care is not underpinned by a credible or developed evidence base. It leads to suboptimal outcomes and the diagnostic overshadowing of complex underlying health and social issues. Dr. Cass emphasises that there has been undue ideological influence on healthcare decision making, specifically noting a suppression of evidence and a rush to medicalise vulnerable young people. This has been facilitated close to home in Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath constituency too. Carolyn Brown, a retired Deputy Principal Educational Psychologist for Fife Council, said in the Sunday Post this weekend, and I quote, The same harmful ideologies identified in the CASH report have been happening across Scotland for years now, as senior officials in health, education and social work failed to listen to concerned voices and adopted the three wise monkeys attitude while vulnerable children were harmed. Many children going through, through puberty do question their gender, their identity and their bodies. That's just part of growing up. The danger comes when officials affirm those questionings and tell a child they can change their gender. This is ethically and morally irresponsible as well as psychologically harmful and more likely to compound the mental health issues the child already has uh, and reinforce the child's self-perception that he or she is really trans. According to queer theory extremists, these children were born in the wrong body. Once again, I commend the bravery and strength of those who have detransitioned and have had the courage to tell their stories. Kira Bell, Richie Heron, Sinead Watson, and also to those yet to find their voice. It's a double scandal that we do not know how many other young people have been affected and lives irreversibly altered by medical malpractice. 
These young people were exceptionalised and subject to life-altering treatments without due regard for safeguarding and denied the necessary follow-up expected in every other sphere of clinical practice. The cohort of GIDS patients were disproportionately made up of girls. Prior to the publication of CAS, Tavistock whistleblower Dr David Bell spoke of young LGB people, especially lesbians, having their sexuality transed away. Yet it's women's voices that have been sidelined the most, and no more so than the voice of lesbians. It won't have escaped the few people left in the chamber that I am not and never can be a lesbian. So I turn to lesbian activists in Scotland to give the, their perspective on the impact Stonewall's queer theory practices have had on their lives. These are their words. It has become very difficult to exclude men from lesbian spaces, especially if those spaces, events or groups are advertised publicly. Males are demanding access to lesbians for dating and to shame, bully or threaten lesbians who refuse. This has had the effect of driving lesbian culture underground, which means it's very difficult for young or isol isolated lesbians to make connections. They go on. Young lesbians tell us they are under a great deal of pressure to accept men in their spaces or as romantic partners. Some of the lesbians in the group have been pressured to dent identify as trans because of their same-sex attraction. The campaigns around gender ideology legislation has emboldened homophobes who make lesbians feel that there is something shameful or bigoted about our sexual orientation. Lesbians who assert their sexual boundaries are described as being obsessed with genitals or having a fetish or kink. This is undeniable and unacceptable homophobia. In Scotland, the Sandyford Clinic is continuing with these discredited uh, hormone treatments. And to date, the Scottish Government have persisted with the claims that this amounts to international best practice, a claim we now know to be manifestly false and worthless. As highlighted by the LGB Alliance, Dr Cass found that 89% of girls and 81% of boys referred to gays were ultimately not trans but were either homosexual or bisexual. This indicates an alarming pattern of misdiagnosis and inappropriate, unnecessary and irreversible medical and surgical interventions and confirms what many have feared that the NHS GIDS adoption of gender affirmation as a model of care has led to them, whether inadvertent or not, practising medical and surgical gay conversion therapy. It is incoherent to put sexual orientation and gender identity under the same conversion therapy umbrella. Parliament should not legislate in this area until sound clinical evidence on the best model of care has been properly developed and validated. In a letter to First Minister Humza Yusuf raising my concerns about so-called trans-inclusive conversion therapy, which we, which we now know is gay conversion therapy, I made the following point. Legislating to compel belief in gender ideology runs counter to the provisions in the Equality Act 2010, put beyond doubt by the Maya Fostater and versus CGD uh, Europe and others ruling. Forcing an ideology or belief on others would transform the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service into a pseudo-theocratic enforcement agency and would thus preclude any notion of receiving a fair trial. The Scottish Government, under Nicola Sturgeon and Humza Yusuf, have abandoned any pretense they are upholding their public sector equality duty, putting women, children and LGB people at risk. They have been warned repeatedly they called such concerns invalid and went ahead anyway. This place must not do the same. Both First Minister Hamza Youssef and Ms Somerville have defended the introduction of non-statutory schools guidance, enabling non-expert teachers to affirm and enable so-called social transitioning of minors in absence of parental involvement or concern. But in a landmark legal opinion, Human rights barrister Karen Monaghan concludes that schools and councils using such an approach are very likely to be in breach of equality and human rights legislation and at risk of being sued by excluded parents. And as my learned and honourable friend from Edinburgh South West noted recently, both the Equality Act 2010 and Human Rights Act 1998 are reserved matters, so the same risk of litigation should hold true in Scotland. 
There is little personal or professional protection for an activist teacher given this guidance is non-statutory, so the personal repercussions could be significant if they are pursued directly by excluded parents. All of these warnings were stated long before CAS was published, but the virulent opposition to reason fostered and facilitated by Stonewall's ideological capture across our public sphere has kept too many si silent about the unfolding tragedy. Last week, I wrote to the Clerk of the House setting out in detail the legal and political incongruence and substantial risk of harm from ropey, ideologically driven legislation. Therefore, I am seeking confirmation from the Minister that any such legislation will be excluded from the up-and-coming Criminal Justice Bill, name, namely New Clause 37, given the weight of evidence Dr Cass published about the dangers of embedding such practice in statute. Uh, when I read the Cash report and contrast its findings with the meticulous follow-up so carefully developed and provided to the children and young people I cared for during their cancer journey, it makes me furious and ashamed that clinicians could ever behave in such a cavalier manner. The LGB and other vulnerable young people who went to GIDS were subjected to life-altering treatments only to be cast aside without follow-up. This must never be allowed to happen again. It is unethical, unprofessional, and the damage inflicted frustratingly unknown. The evidence contained in the CAS report and the WPATH files is incontrovertible. In over 80% of cases, gender-affirming care is gay conversion therapy. Ending the routine prescribing of hormone-suppressing treatments is very much to be welcomed, but I wish to press the Minister further on the steps the Government will take to ensure that clinicians operating in private clinical practice and online pharmacies adhere to the NHS clinical guidelines issued by NHS England. This is a matter for health, justice and equalities to work in concert on. What further steps will the Government take to ensure that private clinics and online pharmacies are not able to circumvent these clinical guidelines and what sanctions and enforcement measures will be put in place? And will the Minister also make it clear that never again will services for children and young people be exceptionalised in this way uh, that, we, that they have been and that Dr Cass's recommendations will be implemented in full where healthcare, clinical practice and equalities will be based on evidence, the best interests of every child and young person and clinical expertise. And in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I agree with Dr Cass and that LGB and gender non-conforming young people deserve very much better. But members of this House no longer have any excuse to look the other way or indeed to hide. Thank you very much. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I begin by um, thanking the Honourable Gentleman for securing this important debate. He's raised a number of very serious issues, um, and he will probably understand that uh, a lot of these have, we are still considering. So I may not be able to go into too much detail right at this moment, but I would be more than happy to write to him and um, give him each of the uh, progresses. Let me say as well at the beginning, uh, you know, I completely agree with him on, uh, you know, the need for us always to think about the safeguarding of children and young people, regardless of whether they're LGBT. You know, we need to make sure that we have our obligations to that. And of course, um, there is much that we have seen in the CAS report that we welcome. This is a comprehensive report. Uh, and as my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, um, commit, uh, mentioned to the House earlier today, there's a lot that we'll be um, considering and responding to in, in due course. Um, but I think much of what he is saying is that we need evidence-based decisions, and that is clearly going to be incredibly important. Let me, and I think also I have mentioned at this dispatch box a number of times that. Sometimes this debate gets so toxic, and that doesn't help anybody. Um, and there are strong views on all sides in this debate. But for me, what's really important is that we have that debate based on evidence and that we actually make sure that we are careful in the way that we articulate our arguments. Because there are people out there, particularly young people, who will listen to some of those words and will feel very affected and pressurised 
in whatever direction that may be. Uh, and that is why both myself and the government, we are absolutely committed to improving the outcomes of young people, especially recognising that LGBT young people in particular can face very specific challenges. And they may include things like bullying at school, and increased risk of mental health issues, as he alluded to, difficult family environments, uh, and uh, you know, occasionally even homelessness as a result of their sexuality. And so I'd like to assure him that both myself and other Equality Hub ministers, we regularly engage with our counterparts uh, across governments uh, departments uh, on, on these really very important uh, issues. Um, and to help uh, achieve the goal of improving the outcomes for LGBT people, we have ensured that spending for children and young people uh, on their mental health service has increased. He was right to raise that. I think it is important. We've increased that from £841 million in 1920 to just over a billion pounds, but I will ensure that I write to my colleagues in the Department for Health and Social Care, raising the points that he's raised with me this evening. Now give way. Or the intervention. He's really raised uh, something that is uh, extremely important to me around the support of mental health uh, care for young people, and particularly child and adolescent mental health services. And I would uh, reflect back on the statement this afternoon from the Secretary of State for Health and some of the comments that came from the opposition benches which were decrying the uh, long waiting lists for good services. I, I, would, uh, I, I would just like to make this point, and I hope you will agree with me, that those waiting lists, given the, the uh, attrition rate of upwards of 80% where young people who waited a long time actually worked out that they were just lesbian, gay or bisexual and they didn't go through and complete the, the surgical medical treatments. Does he not agree that, that you know, uh, those long waiting lists have actually may have saved some young people from the harm that has been inflicted on others and that really the focus now needs to be on CAMS funding to make sure that young people get the mental health support before they make irreversible, irrevocable decisions? And I think this is exactly why the CAS report has been so important, because it's, it, it's, been, um, it's been a very carefully considered report, and of course we've got to take time now to consider that for, for the government response. But he is right that uh, we, you know, when, when young people are, um, uh, if you like, want, deciding to come out or, you know, are understanding that their sexuality uh, may be um, lesbian or gay, they should have the support that they need to, to do that. And we recognise that for some, they may not have the family support that uh, I was fortunate enough to enjoy. Uh, I'm blessed to have an amazing family who were very supportive of me. But I do recognise that for, for many others, that isn't the case. Uh, and so he has raised some important points. And as I committed to a moment ago, I will ensure that I write to my uh, colleagues within the Department for Health to raise the points. Uh, the questions that he raises. Um, I think it's also important to point out that we do work in partnership with the Department for Education as well, because um, we've, uh, it's really important that we make sure that there's plenty of work going on on the anti-bullying side of things. And he, he alluded to some of the pressures that people he has spoken to have felt. Um, and that is why we have um, allocated a further three million pounds of funding that's divided um, between five anti-bullying organisations to tackle bullying in school, but also that uh, that is on top of the four million that's already been spent in this area since 2016. And this does include uh, projects that specifically target anti-LGBT hate-related bullying. Uh, and in October of 22, we launched a victim support service for anyone affected by um, or at risk of conversion practices regardless of the sexual orientation, sex or transgender identity, and the helpline is there to provide uh, support and uh, information to anyone over the age of 13. And as I've said on many occasions, conversion practices are not a one-way street. Uh, conversion practices, changing somebody from what they believe they are to something else, in my view, is, is abhorrent and is... Um, 
you know, is, is clearly wrong. Uh, and that, it, as I say, it can go either way. So it's really important that we do um, acknowledge that. Um, I, the other area that I've, you know, I've done a lot of work with is on the issue of homelessness because I've seen so many uh, instances where young people finding themselves in these challenging uh, areas end up, because of that lack of perhaps family support or because of the mental health issues, end themselves uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in a homelessness situation. And so that's why last year both myself and the Minister for Homelessness, uh, we convened a round table for local authorities and for charitable organisations uh, to ensure that we are trying to do a very tailored support for those people who are LGBT, and we do take those issues incredibly seriously. Um, I also want to point out, he mentioned the issues in Scotland. Well, of course, it wouldn't be responsible for me to answer on behalf of the Scottish Government. I don't want to do that. Um, but in terms of what we're doing uh, here, of course, we want to ensure that children uh, are prepared for life in, in modern Britain and they need to understand the world in which they're growing up in. And that's why the statutory guidance states that all pupils should receive teaching on LGBT contact during their school years, uh, both and in, in secondary schools. I can see he wants to, me to give way, so I have to do so. Uh, it's a good sport, uh, as always. I, I, just to clarify on the issue with Scotland, I think the, the fundamental question is about the uh, implementation and observation of responsibilities within the Equality Act and upholding the... Uh, human Rights Act, which are both preserved matters, and particularly the pub public sector equality duty, which has been an issue across a whole range of public bodies, uh, and not least uh, the Scottish Government, who seem to have their own uh, perhaps, perhaps stonewall view of how that should be interpreted. And I think it's really uh, incumbent on, uh, uh, on all of us to refocus on the fundamental principles contained within that duty. Absolutely right to raise the issues of the of the Equality Act, and and you know I'm be, again happy to because it's it's quite a, it can get quite complex, and I would be terrified of saying the, the wrong words at the dispatch box. Um, but if he will allow me, I will write to him with a few more uh, details uh, uh, on those important points. And I was talking about the you know the processes within the statutory guidance, of course. Uh, our colleagues in the Department for uh, Education is currently reviewing the statutory guidance that we have uh, and we expect that to go out to public consultation later this year. The review has been informed by independent expert panel which brought together input uh, from health curriculum and safeguarding. So we hope that that will be uh, you know, a good piece of work that will provide um, uh, updates on the guidance there. With regard to gender questioning students' guidance, as he will be aware, the Department for Education published a comprehensive draft guidance for, how, uh, for teachers on how best to support pupils um, and questioning their gender in schools. Parents, teachers and school leaders were encouraged to respond to that 12-week consultation, which closed on the 12th of March. A range of views will be considered and I look forward to the publication of the consultation response as we continue to work in this sensitive uh, area but it is important that we get that absolutely right and that uh, parents are obviously involved in that, that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I, he, he, um, I, I, I feel like I haven't given him a million answers at this stage but I hope he will understand that we are we, you know, we've just had the report from CAS. It's important we take time to consider that. We are going through the review of the guidances uh, that I mentioned, and it's important that we have those proper processes taking place. But on the other issues that he's raised, I, as I've committed to, I will write to my colleagues within the Department for Health, uh, and I will update him when I've had a response from them. And in the meantime, can I thank you for bringing this important area of work? I think. I, my view is that we all want to help people live their lives as they wish, um, without prejudice or without, um, without pressure. Uh, and I think there is a responsibility on all of us in this House to do that in a way that is humane and is compassionate. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to outline what we're doing as a government to support that.
The question is that this house do you know a journalist. May I let me say aye? Aye. Do you know? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order. Order. And sound House of Commons sound